Okay, what do we got? Seltzer? Root beer? <sighs> I gotta clean this friggin' thing up. Okay, root beer it is. I used to really like Halloween. When you're a kid, the holiday absolutely slaps. Costumes, candy, parties, cartoon specials, it's a damn fun time. You know, then you grow up, or you live in bum New York like I do. Back in the magical year of 2012, I was running this show on my Windows XP potato. Amnesia got popular due to a Swedish man screaming at it. <sighs> I picked it up, have fun, mod it to heck, life's good. Then 2014 rolls around, Five Nights at Freddy's shows up. I'm horribly confused, yet the internet seems to be on fire over it. 2017 rolls in, I'm in college, I've stopped playing horror games mostly due to school. A game comes across my Steam recommended. A little title called Case Animatronics. I watched the trailer, I think it looks interesting, downloaded the demo, and then forgot about it for five years. Fast forward to 2022, at some point between now and then the game went on sale for like, a dollar. I had a demo downloaded on my current PC, but still had not actually played it yet. I'm working full time and have a YouTube channel with like, one good video, so what better time to play this game than now? Case Animatronics was originally published to the now-defunct Steam Greenlight service in 2015. After being approved, it was released on August 3rd, 2016 onto PC, developed by Russian developers Last Level and Walnut. Yeah, the dev is literally just called Walnut. As far as I can tell, Case is Walnut's first game. A sequel that is still in ongoing development was released two years later to the day. The game did get some fairly positive reception if Steam is anything to go by. However, because the game features animatronics, comparisons to Five Nights at Freddy's were fast. Seriously, it's right there on the store page with quotes from Green and Red PewDiePie. And if you go to the Steam reviews, scroll down like hell, and do Control F FNAF, you get hundreds of hits. The comparisons are extremely obvious from the get-go, mainly from the use of animatronic robots and the game's camera system. But apart from that, the game still looks very much different from the game it's being compared to, and while it has a few things in common, I didn't think it was a fair comparison. However, after playing it and doing some looking into the game itself, as well as its story, I can understand why. Allow me to demonstrate. Yeah, uh, this is the first Steam game I've done for the channel, so I'm, I'm not quite sure what to do here. Um... Hey! The game opens in a police station in Aurora, Colorado. You take the role of a police officer, affectionately known as main character, waking up at his desk after falling asleep for a little while. What is it? Strange. No one else should be here. I'll go check. This acts as the game's tutorial as you're introduced to the two main tools, the flashlight and the tablet. A character makes fun of the tablet only to immediately contradict himself within the next minute. Ah, uh, yes, the tablet. The department relies too much on this new monitoring system. At this rate, they'll soon give us a joystick and a lightsaber. What a comfortable gadget. 
10 years, these are gonna be everywhere. I will say now, so far, everything the, and I quote, main character has said right now is weirdly phrased and delivered. Normally, I'd take the piss out of it, but since this is an indie game by a small team, presumably in Russia, I'm gonna go easy on it. As far as writing goes, I'll be focusing primarily on the actual story of the game within itself. Right click controls the flashlight, left click turns the tablet on and off. Pressing tab allows you to open the cameras and view the police station at your discretion, provided you're able to see and have access to the cameras themselves. The tablet itself has a limited battery power, as does the flashlight, so you have to be careful in terms of how often you use both and make sure the tablet stays charged. But this wasn't a constant issue, at least from my experience. The scary music arrives, and the power suddenly goes out. Hell, what is it? You're then tasked with navigating the section of the station that you're in to turn on the power switch. In this section, you have no robots and camera, just you, your flashlight, and a map of the station on the wall. While you have no active enemy at this time, you are able to go up the hall and see a caricature of me after a few beers. Once you find B7 and flick the breaker, you're forced into the first of many jump scares. You are dead, the animatronics ate you. Try to hide better? To recap what just happened, Nosferatu turned off the lights, I flipped the switch, got killed instantly, and the game told me to get good. I was left bewildered wondering how I was even supposed to proceed, but apparently that was a glitch because that's not supposed to happen. The game loaded normally the second time I went through it. You know, after going through the entire fucking tutorial all over again. We get eaten the second time, sit through 30 seconds of loading despite this game being on my SSD, and wake up at our desk. It's similar to before, up until the phone rings. Night call. Let's hope nothing serious. Hello, Bishop. Marvelous night, isn't it? I'm sure you don't remember me. A lot of time has passed since our last meeting. How do you like the new surveillance system? One day, you took everything I had, and now it's time to pay. The caller appears to have some history with our character, who we now know simply as Bishop, holding a type of vendetta against him for reasons yet to be known. We're once again tasked with returning power, similar to before. One jump scare later. We get the code from the clunker up the hall, plug it in, and power's back on. Bishop makes mention of a second breaker switch, and if we check our camera, we can see that only half the station has power now. If we go back to where the robot was, we can answer the phone on the desk, getting another call from the man from earlier. This is the first of three robots we have to deal with, this one being the wolf. The most basic enemy in the game, it wanders around the area looking for the player, giving chase if he sees you. He's not too much of a nuisance to deal with, as he's the only active robot right now, and it's here where we get properly introduced to the game's hiding mechanics. Scattered around the police station are desks, cabinets, and lockers that you can hide in or under. Understanding how these work is very crucial to survival, but that's for later. Upon being met with the now active Wolfbot, you can see a door to the locker room suddenly open. Hide inside the locker next to the police chief's dirty socks, and watch the freak wander by. We're now properly given our second task, powering the second half of the station. I will be honest, I had to look up a walkthrough for this one. The game doesn't leave much information on how to proceed, apart from hints that occasionally appear at the top of the screen, but it's not impossibly cryptic. I do have my criticisms about it though, which I will discuss later. Viewing the tablet, the game will mark a specific room you need to go to with the green icon. There's no indicator on the map for where you are, so it's up to you to make an educated guess as to where you are in the station based on what you see in the cameras and your own surroundings. In the second half of the building, we can find another animatronic, this one themed after a cat, based on the phrase meow meow mother f carved into its chest. There's also this giant crate here with god knows what inside. I thought this contained another animatronic, but I turned out to be wrong. When I got to the end of the game, the box was still intact and jumping. I looked online, and there was a fourth animatronic in the form of a bear at one point, and it could be seen in an early version of the game through a trailer on Steam Greenlight, but that was ultimately scrapped. What needs to be done is that we have to find a keycard to this specific door so we can turn on the power to the other side of the building. Now me, in my infinite wisdom, started wandering around the entire station running from the robot like I'm in a Scooby-Doo chase looking for this keycard. What I failed to notice was the showers themselves. At first, this room seems like it's just there to fill out the station, but in reality, this this is where you find that keycard. It's also the only place you find that keycard. I explored the majority of the station trying to find it, but only realized it's in the showers upon checking a walkthrough. Look around on the floor, find the card, get insta-killed looking at the tablet with no noise to tell you you're in danger.
flick the power on, check the tablet to find our next adversary, the cat robot. It's functionally identical to the wolf robot, with the only added exception that it can climb through vents. I know what you're thinking. And I'm not gonna say it. The tablet will start to die and your next goal is to get the battery charged. Without the camera system to help you as much, all you can really do now is to try to find where Ben's room is to get the power to the tablet. Once the cat robot is out and about, you have to go to a safe that was in the evidence room to get a lockpick. Bolt into a cabinet and get a glimpse of the cat robot doing a funny dance underneath one of the vents. After finding the office, you get a Bethesda level lockpicking minigame followed by stopping a computer virus on the computer inside to turn on the charger. It's an extremely simple matching game and can be finished quickly. Charge the tablet, swipe another key card from the file cabinets inside, go back to where the second power switch is, and open the attached office with said key card. You'll get some dialogue from Bishop covering his first call as a police officer. What do you want me to remember? You said that I took everything from you. My first call. I remember it. A complete failure, even for a rookie like me who had just graduated from the academy. Scott DJ. His wife and child were killed, and Scott ended up in intensive care. Why did he refuse to speak with me? Is it because I didn't catch the killer? To further build on what he's talking about here, the caller, now known as Scott DJ, previously mentioned clues in the past being scattered around the station. In this building, there are some echoes of the past. Try to collect them so we can see who you really are. Throughout the station are these notes that you can collect which serve as background lore, detailing the origin of the animatronics as well as Scott himself. One note describes an undated news article detailing an incident in which a gunman forced his way into a home around 1am, with police being called by neighbors. A struggle ensued, resulting in three casualties. Two of them, a woman and child respectively, who died at the scene, and the third, Scott himself, who would survive, but not without injury. Bishop, the cop called to the scene, tried to get answers from Scott regarding the incident while he was at the hospital, but was unsuccessful as Scott refused to speak to him and he was forcibly removed from his ward. This is explained across notes 1, 2, and 3. Notes 0, 4, and 5 detail the animatronics themselves, explaining they were fitted with abilities that allow them to be used as part of a security system, making use of police databases and facial recognition, and were originally created by Scott himself. Note Zero specifically mentions that the animatronics operating system freezes after several hours of use. This piece of information becomes relevant later. It's mentioned that they attempted to attack people, with at least one person being killed and another sent to the hospital. It's also mentioned that a pizza place made use of these, with the owner of one such restaurant almost being killed because of them. Additionally, five children went missing with a security guard suspected to have committed the crime, despite the abilities of the animatronics themselves. To anyone even slightly familiar with FNAF's timeline of events, one might find that last line about kids vanishing familiar, but then again I had to do a fair amount of research on that one to be sure. The remaining notes date from June of 1977 to 1987, detailing how Scott got the idea to give the animatronics the ability to move, how they were constructed, forming a relationship with his now late wife Emma, and eventually proposing to her. Scott blames Bishop for the death of his wife and child, and the use of the animatronics in the police station are his means of conducting revenge against him. Coming back to the game, one will hear the cat crawling through the vents, prompting it to hide under the desk in the same room. Bishop will yell at the cat to leave. Well, get out of here already! Which only left me with the belief that if this were a horror movie, Bishop would be dead before the opening credits finished rolling. Pick up the phone for another call from Scott, where you're now given the task of surviving for a set amount of time while the ventilation system is turned off. What this means is that the longer you stay in a room, the worse your vision is going to get, making it difficult to navigate. The idea here is the game forces you to move around from room to room, rather than sit in one spot. It is possible to turn the ventilation system back on, though I never did so in my first run. You'll know when you can get the key when Bishop says this line for a second time. I must hold on until 3am. I need that key! <laughs> Now, you can play the cat and mouse game as Scott suggests, or you can be a massive bitch like me and hide in the lockers to run up the clock. You know, provided one of the robots doesn't decide to peek inside. That's one thing I want to mention. The hiding spots are not foolproof. On occasion, the animatronics will check the inside of certain hiding spots if you sit inside them for too long. Additionally, if you run to a hiding spot while being chased and you're still in direct sight of a robot, they will rip it open and kill you. However, my theory is that this can be cheesed if you immediately leave a hiding spot and then go right back in. 
survive long enough to get another key card to open the interrogation room and pick up the phone when it rings. It seems you have met another one of my creations. Your luck surprises me. Okay, that's it. No more playing around. Toys went on a hunt. Turn around. Surprise! The third and final robot we're introduced to is the Owl. It functions very differently compared to the two other robots in that it only moves when you actively turn away from it. This robot won't outright chase you, but obviously you shouldn't walk too close to it. To deal with this robot, what you need to do is back away and out of sight until it leaves your vision. Get enough distance and then re-enter the room it's inside. This robot is fairly infamous for being unfair if the Steam reviews are anything to go by, as it doesn't walk around like any other animatronic, it only teleports, meaning there's a very realistic chance it can blink to a room you just happen to be in and kill you instantly. You need to get to the locked cell in the second half of the building, but the other robots are constantly patrolling that area. Get the battery from the room the owl was originally standing in, and then make your way to the radio in the hallway. Turning on the radio will draw their attention, quickly run to this hiding spot once they're distracted, get the hell out of there, and use the lockpick on the cell door. You'll enter a room full of files and a computer showing the back of an animatronic with a keycard on it. You'll then get one last phone call from Scott who seems to be rambling a bit more than before. The game dragged on, Bishop, and you played by the rules. I can't let you get away with the files. You know, this reminds me of Emma. I miss her. I made that bastard scream and cry, but it didn't make me calm. And then I realized that I must punish you for what you've done. It's a pity that my toys aren't good enough. Though, we might be able to increase the power a bit. Goodbye, Bishop. It was fun playing with you. It's possible this could be related to translation issues, but I'm honestly not certain. The cat will drop out of the vents, chase you briefly, and then stop. This is where that key piece of information about the animatronics freezing comes in. In this phase of the game, the animatronics will periodically pause, allowing you to grab the keycard off the back of one of them. Find the first keycard, find out it doesn't work, do it again, and then make it to the front door. One more cutscene will play with Bishop entering his cruiser and then getting kidnapped by Scott. Hello, Bishop. The game boots you back to the main menu, and that's it. Game over, you win. The story for Case is very simple, and the game can be finished pretty much in an afternoon. Much like the game is compared to, it's not enormous, and the deeper lore is there if you dig a little more into it. The game controls are alright, and there's nothing weird about the control scheme. It's fairly easy to grasp. Nothing really to talk about at this moment. It's perfectly fine. Let's move on to looks and sound. Visually, the game is nothing special. If anything, it's a run-of-the-mill Unity game with realistic visuals. It's not too stylized and doesn't look bad. The robots seem to share the same basic design with the wolf and cat sharing the same body shape. The owl seems to be the outlier to this, having a more visually distinct appearance in contrast to the previously mentioned wolf and cat. There isn't much to speak for for most things in this game. It's fine for an indie game made in Unity. It looks serviceable, and honestly, I like this type of setting that isn't going out of its way to be a typical horror setup. If you look at horror games that came throughout the 2010s, like Slender, Amnesia, and Outlast, which have Dark Forest, 18th Century Castle, and Psych Ward as their settings in that order, all of them could be an easy target for a horror story. Here, it's just a police station. Nothing out of the ordinary apart from the animatronics hunting you. If you really look around, it's very standard apart from like one or two things. Paperwork, computers, donuts, offices, wanted posters of criminals. It's not like the walls are being caked in blood or flesh or anything like that. As far as Bishop was concerned, it was a typical night at the station right up until he got that phone call. I honestly think it helps the atmosphere of the game a little bit. It's not going out of its way to be scary most of the time, leaving the player to essentially scare themselves by building paranoia through the unassuming environment and sounds. Speaking of sound, I personally think the ambient noise is alright.
footsteps, deep booming noise while wandering around, turn off the lights, close the doors and blinds, and it's an okay experience. I haven't got much to complain about apart from volume. When I started up the game, the main menu theme was unreasonably loud, and I thought it was my own settings, but based on the experiences of others, that doesn't seem to be the case. Each robot makes this loud clanking noise as they walk around, which does a pretty good job at indicating that you need to watch your back and where you go. If you can't pinpoint where the clanking is coming from, and you start hearing it getting louder and faster, you better hope you can get into a hiding spot in time. The death noises can be a bit loud, especially if you're trying to stay absorbed in the game's setting. The ability to suspend disbelief and get absorbed in the game's world is important here, and after hearing the same speaker blasting scream a lot, it can really take you out of it. After a certain point, I started paying close attention to this particular death noise. And after listening to it a few more times after playing the game, it started sounding a lot like the noise made in that meme of the sad emoji turning to dust. You know, this one. The voice acting is odd, but I don't want to be that hard on it on account of it being from Russia and from an indie team. I think whoever was voicing Scott did a much better job compared to the voice actor for Bishop. Scott is written as if he's supposed to come off as unhinged, and I think the voice actor did an okay job at presenting that with the lines he was given. How do you like my gift? Like it? Like it? A lot of time has passed since our last meeting. One day, you took everything I had. And now, it's time to pay. Toys went on a hunt! Turn around! Surprise! As for Bishop... Well... Battery drains out very quickly. Help! What is it? It's weird that the charger is off. Let's see what's on a computer screen. What do you want me to remember? You said that I took everything from you. Sick bastard! A giant cat! What else can you think of? My first call. I remember it. A complete failure. The lines from later in the game seem to come off better than the lines from the very beginning of the game. It's very weird. I feel like the VA had a little better understanding at that time than he did in the very beginning. I feel like they probably could have done a couple more takes with these lines because the deliveries just feel very, very jarring and off. Not to say that this is bad or anything like that. It gives it a cheesy charm that reminds me of the Resident Evil 1 cutscenes. Stop it! Don't open that door! But Chris is... What is it? All in all, the audio is okay. Apart from some weirdness, it's serviceable and not god-awful, and really, that's all it needs to be. In a horror game, the only noise you really gotta focus on is the ambient tracks and the sounds played when the player is in danger to help the experience. And Case does decently enough in that regard, but enough about Case for itself for now. Let's start comparing things. I decided to do something similar to the Men in Black video, but this time played two games from the similar time period completely blind. The original Five Nights at Freddy's and Outlast. I will also briefly bring up Resident Evil 1 again, though not much. I'll be explaining these games primarily from a gameplay stance, as well as to illustrate how the horror settings and mechanics in each game function in comparison to Case. I'll start with a question. What is a traditional horror game? When I think of a traditional horror game, I think of a game that's like this. You have your protagonist or multiple protagonists, you have one or more monsters, and your options to deal with them. You have run and hide, and run or fight. An example of the latter is Resident Evil 1. I already discussed this game in the Men in Black video, so I'll make this brief. You have zombies and other creatures around the mansion, and the ability to fight back against them through means of melee weapons and firearms, but you also have the option of getting away from them to protect yourself instead. This is primarily to make the player consider their limited resources when it comes to combat, healing, and saving the game. This type of game is typically called survival horror, and is a much better example of such, unlike a certain game about aliens and secret government agencies. You were supposed to neuralize him! How the f- How could you mess this up? You I did! I, idiot. I swear to I hate fucking God! Get out! Let's move over to Outlast now. From the very beginning, Outlast tells you that this is not a game where you can fight back, outright telling you to run away, hide, or die trying to do both. Setting-wise, you're in Mount Massive Mental Asylum, a typical setting for just about any piece of horror fiction. Movement is fairly standard, and everything is from a first-person perspective. Most of your time spent in Outlast is exploring the asylum, learning about the experiments that took place here and recording the world as you go. 
The only tool you have on hand to help you is the camcorder and the night vision filter. The attached light is fed by batteries, which are scattered around the world. The closest comparison to this that I can personally think of is the lamp oil from Amnesia to Dark Descent, but instead of being able to gradually add to your charge, you simply reload the camera as if it were the magazine of a gun, swapping to a new battery upon doing so while discarding the old one. When encountering an enemy, the music will change and they'll immediately give chase. If they hit you, you'll be hurt, but you will survive provided you manage to get some distance and successfully hide from them. You also have the ability to slow down your foes by closing doors on them. This is a feature I also recall being present in Amnesia. A small thing I like to have is it buys you time and gives you a chance to hide. This is something I do want to criticize Case for, as while the animatronics can be outrun, they can't be slowed down no matter how many doors you close on them. Given the space of the police station is already kind of limited, I imagine this was to tip the balance in the favor of the animatronics. The puzzles in Outlast didn't feel that cryptic at all. I didn't feel the need to rely on a walkthrough to figure out what I needed to do next. The game is straightforward with you on what you need to do, but it doesn't explicitly hold your hand on proceeding, nor does it hide information from you to force you to figure things out for yourself. You progress naturally as you move through the asylum, connecting the dots on what needs to be done, gradually moving further towards your goal only to be set back by something or someone, pushing you into the next steps to escape. Contrast with Case, where it seems to be all over the spectrum from giving no context to leaving small hints to outright telling me what to do. So we have Outlast as our traditional horror game, and Resident Evil as our survival horror game. FNAF is not something I would consider to fit either category. I picked the original game as I wanted to experience it in its purest form. If you're unfamiliar with Five Nights and its mechanics, essentially you're locked in a room with door switches and a camera system. Your job is to not only keep an eye on them, but to make sure the animatronics don't reach you at your desk, running out the clock until 6am comes and not running out of power before then. What FNAF does differently to a typical horror game is that you're not given any options to directly defend yourself by fighting back or escaping your situation. You can only delay the inevitable until time runs out. You can't leave the room because the animatronics will just grab you immediately. You can't fight back because you have no means of doing so in your setting to begin with. The camera system lets you view various angles in the pizzeria to keep track of your adversaries in the form of rabbit, bird, bear, and fox. The first three wander around the building at random points and gradually get more aggressive in their movement as the game goes on. Foxy operates in a red light green light fashion where if you don't keep an eye on him, he'll barrel down the hallway and get to you if you're not quick to close the door and stop him. Neglect to monitor a doorway by closing doors and checking lights to see if one is getting too close and you're going home in a box. You can't slow them down, nor hide from them directly. You can only shut the door on them when they reach their goal. On top of all this, you have the battery power system. Everything you do uses power. Closing the doors, turning on the lights, and using the camera. You can't use everything all at once, because that will erase any power you have and give you a game over if you're not conservative enough. So you have to find the right balance of camera and door usage to run off the clock and win the game. Visually speaking, Five Nights is very obviously stylized, having a slightly cartoonish vibe to it with its roots in 80s and 90s pizza arcades like Chuck E. Cheese and Showbiz Pizza. FNAF also takes the atypical horror setting approach, placing you in a pizza restaurant, but it tries to lean more into the creep factor by locking you in a security room you can't leave, with your only glimpses of the outside being this black and white camera system. With all of that in mind, Look at Case now. With how each game functions, the comparisons make sense, but I would argue it's what the result of Outlast and FNAF having a baby would be like from a gameplay perspective. You have an open area to explore with roaming enemies, your only tools are lights and a camera system that you can use to keep track of them, all while searching for items to progress the game. Story-wise, it does take some more inspiration from FNAF, at least when talking about Scott. His backstory feels like it was just FNAF copied and changed a little bit. In terms of graphical style, the final product is very much different, but watching the Steam Greenlight trailer again, it looks like the earlier versions of the game leaned more into that. The minimap for the security system looks lifted straight from FNAF in terms of placement and style. Oh, and, and that bear robot I mentioned earlier? The dev team got a DMCA from Cawthon's lawyer about it. I couldn't make this up if I wanted to. Now, if we're talking scares and horror, the quality of them is entirely down to whoever's playing and what they feel works, so this one's my personal opinion. What someone finds scary is subjective. Take this with a grain of salt. I personally feel that both games do things well when it comes to their horror, but both suffer from the same problem. To start with the good in FNAF, I already mentioned FNAF locks the player in the room with no way to leave, and from the time I spent with it, I felt that Five Nights at Freddy's gets its horror from three things. Paranoia, urgency, and surprise. Firstly, the vast majority of the horror in this game comes from the player trying their damnedest to keep track of everyone and prevent anyone from slipping into the room by accident. If the player is peeking around the cameras and having trouble finding a certain animatronic or notices they're in a room that's alarmingly close, they can get worried they might get in at any moment. Or, better yet, find out they're standing right next to the door. Secondly, to add on to this, how Foxy operates as a whole. I stated that if you neglect to keep an eye on him, he'll leave his area and sprint to your room. This will leave you with a tiny window to get the camera down and shut the door. The more Foxy creeps out of his area, the more it can make the player think they're not checking often enough, diverting their attention away from everyone else and potentially wasting power as well. This brings me to my next point. 
urgency. As with any game, the further you go, the more difficult it gets. Freddy and his crew will gradually get more and more aggressive as each day passes and you get further into each night. This will in turn make players move more frantically, rapidly checking cameras and doors to make sure they got eyes everywhere, not to mention periodic glances at power supply and time until 6am. Which brings me to my final point. Surprise. This game, and franchise as a whole, loves its jump scares, even with the most recent release. For someone playing this for the first time, the jump scares do a decent job the first few times, however the jump scares, being what they are, devolve into a basic startle and lose their novelty fast. I will say that as someone who's never played this game proper prior to planning for this video, the game did do a good job of getting me early on. You see me frantically clicking on this door? That's me not realizing I messed up and thinking the game glitched. I was jumping from camera to camera trying to figure out where Bonnie was because I genuinely had no clue. Found him. Looking at Case, to me, it relies on two things. Sound and atmosphere. There is some element of surprise in a few of the jump scares in this game, but much like FNAF, they wear off fast and I don't think it's worth rediscussing. I'll start with sound. If there's one thing Case has going for it in my opinion, it's the audio. While there is some general horror music throughout, the clanking of the robots can be a bit unnerving if you get decently absorbed into this game. For a good while, you can hear pretty much nothing other than the ambient music the game uses, but as soon as the clanking comes in, it can send you into being alert almost instantly. However, there are some issues with the game's audio, namely in terms of volume. This game is loud. It's loud on the main menu screen, and more importantly, the noise made during the jump scare deaths can be a bit loud too. The editor, once again, doesn't sell it too well, but play the game for yourself if you want an excuse to explode your speakers. The sound of the robots getting louder as they get closer and I was trying to hide, I will admit, did manage to do a decent job of scaring me a little bit. Usually when I play a horror game like this, I try to do so in as dark a room as possible with decent headphones on. I'd argue this is the one thing Case has over FNAF, as from what I recall in FNAF, the audio felt more like general sound rather than the audio you had to pinpoint to fully tell where everything is. Granted, in the room where the camera feed is broken, you have to really listen to know for sure if anyone is in there, but that's the fullest extent from what I can tell. The vast majority of information in FNAF 1 is visual. I don't count the information from the guy in the phone as for the first few nights, it feels more like exposition than anything. As far as atmosphere goes, Case keeps the vast majority of its areas as normal as possible and as previously stated, not going out of its way to be messed up or covered in gore. Almost taking a horror movie type approach, where the main bad guy is only speaking to you via phones like a crappy version of Saw. This puzzle is very simple. Just plug in the Galaxy Note 7. A lot of the areas are sparingly lit, requiring you to either find the light switches associated with those areas or rely on your flashlight to help you be able to see. During the quiet moments where there are no robots around, I think is where the game is at its best, especially when you get absorbed into the setting. Just the player exploring the area as they try to navigate around and reach their next goal, only for the clanking to be heard in the distance, making you instinctively check your cameras to try to find out how close the robots really are. At the same time, there are some things that just absolutely shatter immersion. I already brought up the voice acting is a bit weak, not to mention some of the things said by Bishop during the game feel... Kinda brain dead, such as when he's under the desk shouting at the cat robot. Horror Movie 101, don't yell at the thing trying to kill you. As for the bad, they both suffer from one thing, and that's called repetition. FNAF doesn't really change up the gameplay apart from the difficulty. All the animatronics are present in earlier nights, but Freddy doesn't start getting opportunities to move until at least the third night. And even then, he functions similarly to everyone else, having random opportunities to move as the night goes on. Tech Rules has a video that explains the game's AI far more in depth than I'm willing to go right now, so if you want to take a look at that, click on the card in the corner. The jump scares, as mentioned, wear off quickly. They're startling the first few times, but after a certain point you're kinda just expecting them to happen. Same thing happens in case, while more animatronics get thrown into the mix, you're still doing the exact same thing each time, playing this convoluted game of hide and seek to open the door or answer the phone. There were a few moments where I started hearing robots running towards me, and knowing I was in an area that had little no chance to escape from, I just waited for the thing to kill me right there. If you've seen one jump scare, you've seen all of them. Once you know they're gonna happen, they lose their touch. I've had just about enough of discussing horror, so how about something a little more lighthearted? The segment is going to touch on some of the weirdness I experienced while playing this game. One thing I will note is that the game does have some oddness that can be a bit amusing within itself, but it doesn't exactly detract from the game. There's donuts you're allowed to eat scattered about. Not sure why, but it's a fun detail. It ultimately has zero impact on anything, but I love small things like that in a game. On a less amusing note, during the early game there's this jump scare featuring a ghostly looking woman. 
Barring the fact that I'm genuinely mad this actually managed to get a scare out of me the first time, what baffles me is that it doesn't fit the aesthetic of the game in any capacity. If you look at literally everywhere else in this game, just about everything is fully grounded in reality. You, you know, as grounded in reality as killer animatronic robots can get. But I'm still playing a game about robots that eat people. Why am I being shown the ShopRite brand version of the girl from the ring? The robots have a tendency to teleport at random points when watching them on camera. This makes it difficult to keep track of them going from room to room, because for all you know, the robot might have just teleported into an area adjacent to you, leaving you not a lot of time to react. Speaking of, the player does not have any third-person model, so if you happen to be in the same room as an animatronic and watch yourself die in the camera, it looks like the robot is going into a corner specifically to scream. Personally, it's more funny that it is immersion-breaking. The game features subtitles to go along with the game's voice acting. Some of these lines don't match up with what is being said and can lead to some strange statements. The most glaring example is during the last phone call, where Emma is known to be Scott's wife, but for some reason she's referred to as his cat. I want to say this sounds silly, but I feel like anyone who loves their cat dearly would flip shit if someone hurt them. Probably not to the level of locking a cop in their station with killer robots, but they would flip shit. The game is largely glitch-free. I found nothing game-breaking overall, and the only things that are really odd are cosmetic, if anything. Let's wrap this up. Yeah, I can't dance around this anymore. I wanted to go into this thinking, there's no reason for people to consider this a FNAF clone or ripoff, but with my own experiences and what I found just researching, it's pretty goddamn blatant. To my understanding, Cawthon is usually fairly laid back when it comes to fan games or stuff inspired by his work. People still make fan games even to this day, and some with far better quality than they have any right to be. However, when you make something that leans a bit too much into the inspiration end of things for a profit and it gets enough attention to warrant a DMCA, that's kind of an issue. At the end of the day, I feel Case does have some potential to stand on its own. After all, it did seem to do well enough from the developer's perspective to warrant a sequel two years later. The comparisons, I feel, are apt, and while the games are primarily different from a gameplay perspective, Case Bar was a bit too much from one of its main inspirations for its own good. It's also extremely overpriced for its length, with the normal price being $10 American, while the game itself can be finished pretty much within a couple of hours. I think that's partly why its sequel is at a lower price point. In a gun to my head, pick one situation, I'd go with FNAF. Both games are on my backlog and I'm happy to have played them finally, but I'd rather go back to Five Nights at Freddy's before coming back here. This game I wouldn't call a bad experience, but it's not the greatest. It has a few problems. The AI can be unfair at times, such as the robots teleporting around and the potential to get instantly killed at random points. The game is cryptic in some spots and sometimes holds your hand, while there are some nods as to where you need to be or what to do, which I won't complain about, I like having some idea of what to do versus no idea what to do, sometimes the game will straight up tell you what to do with the hints. The game will also set you back at random points, such as randomly killing off the battery of the tablet or the flashlight as previously mentioned. Even if you barely use the tablet and are at 90%, at certain points the game will force the battery to go near death. Additionally, there's no battery indicator for the flashlight itself. Speaking of the flashlight though, the only purpose it seems to serve is to give you the ability to see in the dark. Abuse the flashlight and it will die. Wait for some time, it comes back. This game is extremely dark, which can make it difficult to see if you didn't turn on any lights beforehand, and if that flashlight dies, you're essentially crippled and have to rely on the memory of your room layout. It doesn't give you a way or make it easier for the AI to spot you. It doesn't matter if you shine the flashlight in the robot's face or stand completely still in the corner of a dark room. If you even begin to enter the line of sight of any of the roaming robots, you're already dead. I know this because I chilled out in an office with the lights off and one of them opened the door while I was in there and went for the kill. This can be problematic if you have muscle memory from playing other horror games where the concept of hiding around the environment alongside dedicated hiding spots are present. Coming back to Outlast, during one of the early segments I was being chased by one of the variants. I ran into a room and hid behind a shelf rather than go into a dedicated hiding spot. The variant looked around the room a little bit before wandering off. If this were case, the robot would have homed into where I was standing and killed me. To close this off, I don't think Case was that bad of a game, but it has a few things that hold it back from being anywhere close to good. Maybe the devs did a better job on Case 2, however I have yet to play that as of this recording. Maybe next year. Now, how would I rate this game compared to what I've played up until now? Honestly, hard to say. Looking at what I've reviewed so far, worse than Bugdom, but better than Men in Black. Also because while this game wasn't amazing, it didn't make me want to stand between two trains about to collide head on. It's one of those finish and uninstall it games to me. Not a game to return to, and honestly, I'll probably forget about it as soon as I upload this video. I didn't miss anything not playing it, and now that I think about it, I didn't gain anything from playing it either. It's not a game I would recommend. There's far better and frankly far more entertaining games out there compared to this.
let's get straight to the point. I have to do the bare minimum to complete Super Mario Sunshine without taking a single hit. To spare myself complete agony, I do have a way of making things a little more bearable. If I take a hit, I have to close the game immediately and start it back up. I don't have to restart the playthrough, but I must abort whatever I am doing at that moment and reopen the game from the Switch home screen. Life loss is considered any action that reduces my normal health meter, enemy contact, environmental hazards, and fall damage. Additionally, if I end up in an instant kill situation such as falling off a stage into the void, the same turn off the game rule applies. The oxygen meter from being underwater does not count towards this as it is considered its own separate meter from health, and including this would lock me out of certain shines. But if I'm hit by an enemy underwater, that does count and is considered a legal hit. When I originally wrote this script, I was under the impression a certain amount of shines was needed to beat the game. Yes and no ended up being the answer to that, and will be explained with time. For this playthrough, I will be joined by Nintendo Did Something Stupid news article Mario to keep track of how many times I absolutely goofed it during this run. I'll preface this by saying I won't be going over every single time I failed for the sake of time, but I will tell you that this run was an unholy mess of bad research, wasted time, tedium, and frustration, and the counter on the screen will hopefully reflect that. Let's a go. The adventure began when Mario and company almost die horribly in a plane crash because some idiot spilled Trix yogurt all over the runway. Toadsworth, the useless assistant to the princess that he is, tasks me with going to look for help. With some wandering around, I introduce myself to Flood and the controls. Hello, Mario. I spray the lump in the airport, revealing my first boss. This thing. It becomes kind enough to hammer up the dent it left behind and reveals the first shine sprite. The police arrest Mario for being a decent person, and the judge ignores the testimony of the literal princess in the courtroom. Sometime later, Flood gives me a pep talk in prison, and I am released. I got to work cleaning up the town square and the respective townsfolk. During the cleanup, I somehow managed to take my first hit, and was forced to do the entire goddamn intro all over again, cutscenes and all. As I've played the game a few times back on the GameCube, to say the least, I tried to skip these cutscenes, but unfortunately, Nintendo, even in 2002, is physically incapable of implementing any basic quality of life features. I pressed everything on the controller and nothing worked. Started cleanup again and revealed the brown goop monster. A statue appeared with Totally Not Mario and Princess Kidnap got peached. I got hurt again and was really getting tired of having to wait through the courtroom scenes. Among us. I made the big brain move to actually save in the town square to save myself the headache, and was more successful in actually getting Shadow Mario this time. Next stop was Bianco Hills to give the first mission the hypothetical finger and go straight to Petey Piranha. Fun fact, the Pinta at the windmill actually has special dialogue if you go there first. I fell to my death and dealt with Petey, getting shine number two. Went to the secret on the hill, died, and did the game as intended. I will note that I will try to skip as much as I can as this is a 20 hour playthrough and I can only repeat myself so many times. You'll see the death counter jump a lot. I spent a good while in Bianco Hills getting some shine sprites, found a bird shitting everywhere, sent Petey back to hell, and continuously screwed up the Dirty Lake mission. Back in the plaza, I cleaned up the raccoon hut and went up against Gooper Blooper. Now, the last time I played this game, I found out that if you time yourself right, you don't even need to get his tentacles. You can go right up to his face, pull his nose, and progress the fight. However, I forgot that I'm doing a no-hits run, so naturally I kept taking damage every other time I tried to do this. With due time, I banished him to the sea and got my seventh shine. Some comedian thought it would be funny to replace the lighthouse with a puddle of oil, and I went back to Rico Harbor in frustration. Did some racing, climbed some girders, forgot what the controls were to use the grates, and began the secret of Rico Tower. It went well right up until I bonked my head, fell on my ass, and landed in the drink. Now, I don't know if it's a combination of old GameCube to Switch port jank or the fact that my controller is pushing 20, but it felt like this game just didn't register button presses on occasion. During this level in particular, I had a moment where I tried to jump and I swear I pressed the button and it didn't go. Maybe my timing is just bad. Meanwhile, Gooper Blooper came back and I fell into a boat. He was sent packing, and I went back to Bianco to try the Dirty Lake secret one more time. That didn't go well, so I cleaned up the lighthouse, cleaned up Toad, and went to the beach. A sand castle appeared after watering some plants, I got juggled by those stupid blue duck things, got my swag stolen again, and cleared the sand castle stage with no issue. Some ugly ass boat docked in the harbor, and Toad informed me that someone took Peach again. You see this cutscene? You like it? I had to watch it. A lot. More times than any human being should. In fact, I think during this entire playthrough, I watched this cutscene more times than most people do their entire lives. Because I had to enter the fifth circle of hell, more commonly known among the religious on Isle Delfino as Pina Park. 
I hope you like giant robots and or Bowser because you're going to be seeing him a lot. Mecha Bowser Returns is not an easy mission. In any other playthrough, you could do this feasibly in one shot, however trying to do it without taking hits is another story. This is one of the very few times in the game where everything has to be absolutely perfect between your aim, your timing, and your speed in which you do it all. I spent a good long while on this mission, pushing my death count higher and higher each time complete with non-skippable cutscenes! With my death count pushing into the 40s, I gave up. Keep in mind at this point I was still under the impression I needed 50 shines to finish the game, so I was thinking, is it possible to beat this game legitimately without ever going into Peanut Park? Back in the beach, I cleaned up the mirror, killed a giant worm, rode some sand, and tried the watermelon level, but didn't get very far. And by this point, I hit 50 deaths total. I battled Shadow Mario in Rico Harbor, went back to the Dirty Lake again, and again, and proceeded to waste oodles of time. Once I was in the 60s, I found myself in Noki Bay, opened a cork, and began the Ancient Ruins thing. What looks like a platforming challenge becomes meaningless once you realize you have a hover ability. And guess who won't stay dead? This is when the blooper really started to annoy me. I spent more time than I care to admit on this level in particular, especially when I would sometimes get my ass blasted by the local fish out of the gate. Nearly 20 deaths later, I finally sent Blooper Boy into the cliffside permanently and stole the Noki people's prized possession. Mario was stored in a jar for safekeeping, and I played Amateur Dentist. The eel was a bit annoying, mostly due to placement and the lack of air, but was beatable nonetheless. I tried to escape the game, broke my legs trying to race the pink guy, the secret of the shell is that the level is a joke, beat the Shadow Mario again, and went to get a fish made of money, but found out that chasing a coin that moves around like 5 year old me using the spray can tool in Microsoft Paint is a pain in the ass. We're at 28 shines by this point, and if my editor is correct, we're only at 7 hours into this playthrough, and I think this is like 8 of 14 recordings. My ongoing war against the Dirty Lake continued mostly because I have no idea how to play video games. I had the lily pads figured out, but the actual level itself proved to be a constant problem for me. At 97 deaths, I caved in and decided to go back to Peanut Park one more time. Once again, timing and speed failed me. However, at 102, I finally got the perfect lineup and was able to take out Mega Bowser. Bowser Jr. revealed himself and yoinked Peach off to the unfortunately named in hindsight mountain. Thanks 2020. Let me tell you, getting that shine was like taking shoes off after walking all day. I continued to collect shines in Peanut Park, killed a hamster, fell to my doom, collected coins, and fought not Yoshi. Speaking of, I was now able to get the Yoshi egg from Shadow Mario, but decided that the Ferris wheel was more important. Gotta have my priorities in order after all. That didn't work. Back in Rico Harbor, I wasted some time on the godforsaken fruit level. Despite all odds, luck was on my side and I managed to score three durians in a row. However, because someone at Nintendo in 2001 hated their job and wanted to make an extremely annoying stage, I never got very far. I spent an hour on this level, by the way. My next goal was to save the Yoshi Egg and open up Serena Beach. Now, if you've played this game, you likely know about Serena Beach Mission 1. To the uninitiated, this is the Manta Ray level. As a kid, I hated this level. This thing was horrifying, and now I have to do it without getting hurt. I failed a couple of times before going back to the plaza. After harassing Shadow Mario to get the rocket nozzle, I ended up in Pinta Village to do the missions there. All seemed to go well right up until the Goopy Inferno where I started running into issues, namely with where the hell I was supposed to go, and these ghost things. In certain parts and levels in this game, there are these ghosts that will spawn that circle you for a short time before homing in on you for attack. If you're fast enough with Flood, you can make them disappear, or you can jump out of the way if you time it right. I'll touch more on these things later, as we have to go back to Bianco f***ing Hills. That predictably failed, so it was off to Serena Beach to deal with the Manta Ray again. Shockingly, no pun intended, this level actually wasn't too bad on a no-hits run. I managed to clear it just fine. However, my inability to platform properly affected my chances inside the hotel secret level, and I got spooked inside a storage closet. Once I was safely riding a wild animal inside the hotel, as you do, I got my hands on shine number 37. I partook in some gambling, mirroring my fruitless attempts to win the recent Powerball jackpot, and played my favorite game of try not to jump off a bridge while doing this water puzzle. Meanwhile, in Pinta Village, I tried the Goopy Inferno yet again to limited success. I spent more time than I'm willing to admit here despite the fact that you're clearly seeing each moment I took damage on screen right now. After a reasonable amount of failures, I finally figured out the timing to jump out of the way of the ghosts so I don't get slapped out of the sky. My next problem was finding the right path to the mirror. It's more or less a small maze down there, so if you end up on the wrong path, you can end up like me and find yourself in an area fully surrounded by goop with no exit because of these one-way sliding grates. Granted the there's no escape, die type of level hazard is nothing new to Nintendo. I played the Japanese Mario 2 and I haven't forgotten the warp pipe that sends you back to World 1 but also has a death pit. 
With that shine in my grasp, I questioned why the Pintas have creatures that catch fire in their residential areas, and then was tasked with dealing with the Chuckster level. To those unfamiliar, this level is full of Pintas that throw you, and where they throw you is entirely dependent on the angle that you talk to them. If you're even slightly off, 2002 GameCube physics will take over and throw you into the trash. When I wasn't too busy getting stuck in areas and further decreasing the world's Yoshi population, I was in a totally different area. Here's a hint, it rhymes with Bianco Kills. Not to shamelessly plug my Twitter, but if you follow me there, you probably recognize this clip. Ever since I started playing this game, I have never seen this happen. I'm still mad about it. un real. At 148, I finally finished this godforsaken level, got Shadow Mario, and after wasting a lot of time, I washed the beach, got stuck in Pinta Village again, and by this point, I was at 49 shines. Note that I still believe in the 50 shine requirement. So, in my eyes, if I was gonna get a victory... I was going to earn it. I was going to get the watermelon level finished one way or another. GameCube physics struck again as trying to move the watermelon was a task and a half. Sometime during it all, I saw a coin clip into the floor and managed to get the watermelon onto the walkway along the cliff. Using the power of sheer will to get it to the docks only for some Noki couple to ruin the whole damn thing by existing. I crushed their skulls as revenge and tried again. With enough time, I was safely on the boardwalk. The judge rigged the contest in my favor, and I blended Mario into a fine paste. It was at this point where I realized I should do some more research, and after checking the player's guide for Super Mario Sunshine Online, I needed to do all the Shadow Mario missions to trigger the end game. I did the watermelon level for nothing. Can you imagine how I felt? I checked my shine counts, and thankfully I didn't have much left to do. I went back to Pinta Village to do the Chuckster level, only to screw up the last guy by dolphin diving through his fat ass. I collected myself on the title screen over what just happened, and was more successful on the second attempt. And finally got around to clearing Shadow Mario in both Pinta Village and Serena Beach. And with that final shine collected, Delfino Plaza got flooded, and I was finally able to begin the path to the final boss in Unrelated to Disease Mountain. Pay close attention to that fault counter, because I can describe my experience in this place with one word. Dead, 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 dead. I'm going to spoil it now, the final boss of this game accounts for nearly a third of every fault in this entire run. It didn't matter if it was the fire, it didn't matter if it was the spikes, whether I got a mouthful of Bowser's bathwater or crashed the lava-resistant boat, any possible way I could have failed during this part of the game, I managed to do it. I got some short relief when I got to the save point by the rocket nozzle, but keep in mind, I also have to deal with Bowser and his son. No prize for guessing that it's not easy. You have Bowser's fire, which you can change where he uses it at will, sometimes forcing you to land right on top of it. You have the bullet bills, which can screw you over if you change direction. You have Bowser's little ground pound if you stay on the edge too long, which will launch his bathwater in your way and is sometimes unavoidable. And on a few occasions, the rocket nozzle just straight up refused to function properly. By the time I was deep into the 200s territory, I could do the first half of this level like it's no big deal. Keep in mind this is a section which is one of the hardest parts of the game. I was doing it so quickly my brother actually got anxiety watching me go through it so fast. I had seen the cutscene that plays before the fight so many times, I could recite it from memory. Thankfully, with due time, I started learning some tricks on how to proceed, like noting how the ground pound not only shatters Mario's pelvis, but also knocks the bullet bills out of the sky, making liberal use of the rocket nozzle to traverse my way around the tub, and even going over Bowser's fire. If there were a word to describe this entire section of the game, it would be tedious. There is no checkpoint once you get to Bowser. Do all of the Lava Lake section, the cloud jumps, and then get to him. If you want an idea of what I went through, the last recording I have for this game is two and a half hours long, and all of it is this level. But thankfully, after two days worth of recording, 256 failures over the course of 20 hours, I was finally able to land the last ground pound and finish the boss. The tub spilled, and the final cutscene played. Flood broke, the population of Delfino Island cloned itself in celebration, Bowser told his son the truth, Flood unbroke, the credits rolled, and I beat Super Mario Sunshine without taking any damage. Do I recommend doing this? No, play the game normally, I hated this.
I'm telling you, man, people these days love weird nonsense in their video games. Uh, listen, I played through those stupid things you guys made back in 06. It's a fun idea, but nobody does that anymore. Look, I'm sure there's someone in there with some kind of pull with BK Corporate. You get some suit to pull a few strings, partner with a studio, you got yourself a modern game with the king. Like, I, I can't think of who wouldn't want that kind of thing these days. Sir, it is the day before Christmas Eve, and I was supposed to be home two hours ago. Now, are you going to order something, or do I have to call the police? Whopper and onion rings, please. Burger King. Since they got farted out in the world back in 1954, they've been a restaurant commonly known as one of the major burger joints in the U.S. alongside Wendy's and McDonald's, typically associated with its signature Whopper sandwich first introduced in 1957 and still sold to this day. Throughout the 80s, a small little period called the Burger Wars would kick in, where Burger King and McDonald's would basically be indirectly fighting each other via advertising in effort to see who can convince the average American that they had the better puddle of grease. Around this time in the magical land of North America, video games were half dead, but also kinda coming back, the NES caught the US on fire and console gaming got popular again. McDonald's looked at that and basically threw out video games left and right to show burgers to children by means of clown. They would put out and slap their name on a handful of games throughout the 80s and 90s. Advertising to kids was common during this time period as the effects of a lot of fast food on someone's health wasn't nearly as understood as it is today, so getting children to shout at mom to pick up McNuggets on the way home was crucial for profit. Surprisingly, Burger King didn't dig too deep into this form of advertising like McDonald's did. They often focused more on selling to children through commercial campaigns by means of magical kingdoms and accidental suffocation. However, this doesn't mean they haven't done something out of the ordinary here and there. Enter... The King. The King has been around as early as 1955 as this lovable cartoon idiot. Fast forward to the late 60s and early 70s and we get a new Burger King, also a cartoon. The late 70s and 80s also brought us these terrifying things, including one featuring a tree that reminds me way too much of that stupid meme that's been floating around. After 1989, The King kinda just vanished entirely and wouldn't be seen for a while. Then in 2004, Burger King airs a commercial that would reintroduce the king to the world in the form of this. A human actor in a large plastic mask that resembles the previous king. This variant of the king would often appear in people's homes and various random places to offer them food. I watched a lot of commercials to prepare for this video, and my favorite one is the one where he gets chased by the police and gets absolutely wrecked by a taxi. Hey, hey. Now you're probably thinking, shut the f*** up and get to the games already. Well, in the early to mid 2000s, Burger King was on a viral marketing kick which brought us the aforementioned King. Part of this kick included three video games for the Xbox 360. During the 2006 holiday season, Burger King would sell these games for five weeks, starting on November 19th and ending at Christmas Eve 2006. The games were sold at four bucks apiece alongside the purchase of a value meal and were cross-compatible with the original Xbox and Xbox 360. Despite the small window for sale, it's actually extremely easy to find copies of the game online still in their plastic. My copies arrived that way. As a nice little wrap-up for the year, I wanted to look at Sneak King in particular. Of the three games in this collection, this is arguably the most well-known in the set. I never played the game myself back in the day. Hell, going to Burger King in general is a relatively recent thing for me. I was a Wendy's kid. I do have the other two games, so if you want me to look at those another time, be sure to let me know. This video is also an overdue thank you to my friend Chris. He's the reason I'm even able to record these things for this video and has been a huge help to the channel in general. You know him from such classic roles like unnamed Fox agent and depressed drive through employee. If you want to check out some of the stuff that he does, you can follow him on his Twitch channel, which is linked in the description below. Before we begin, some of you eagle-eyed people may have noticed I'm not in my house. I visited a local Burger King for this video. Now, they may lock the doors and windows, but no sound of locks can hold back my holiday spirit. Or a two-ton crossover SUV. But enough about my reckless driving habits, let's play some goddamn video games. So the game opens up with a live-action title screen of the king sneaking around someone's home, presumably for a break-in, only to present us with the game's title on a tray. Starting a new game brings us to our first location, a lumberyard. 
odd choice for the opening to a Burger King game, but hey, I didn't make it. We're presented with an area we can run around freely with these newspapers scattered about. If we walk up to one, we're presented with our first mission prompt, which acts as our tutorial for the game. Your main goal in Sneak King is to more or less reenact the commercials they're based off of. Go around the world and surprise people with hamburgers. That's basically it, really. I could end the segment right here if I wanted to. The game is extremely simple, and most missions follow the same formula. You're typically tasked with delivering burgers to people without being seen or heard. Stealth is a large component of this game, and the vast majority of missions require you to be stealthy in order to get the highest score possible, which is determined by the following. The method by which you deliver the food, your flourish, how hungry the person is, how close you are to said person, and the delivery chain. There's a set amount of people in each area, and whoever is hungry at the time is determined at completely random intervals depending on the mission. You can easily identify a hungry person by this burger appearing over their head in one of five states. Green, yellow, orange, red, and flashing red, with green being the least hungry and flashing red being the most hungry. Of course, hunger has a time limit which can be long or short depending on the mission you're doing at the time. The longer you wait, the more you're rewarded in your multiplier. Wait too long and the people, I shit you not, will slump over from starvation. Sneak King is a game where people starve to the point of going into a coma because they didn't get any Burger King in time. These people need help. Range is pretty self-explanatory as just mentioned. The closer you are to the person, the better the multiplier. If you're behind them by a couple of feet, you won't get a high multiplier, but if you can practically smell the detergent they wash their clothes with, the game will reward you handsomely. Flourish is determined by a meter that appears whenever you deliver food. Press A at the right time for the highest possible multiplier, the king will do a little dance and deliver the food in question. Burgers, sandwiches, fries, onion rings, coffee, all are on this plate and occasionally defying gravity. Typically you want to be as close to someone as possible while they're at their hungriest to maximize the points that you get. You can also drastically increase the amount of points you get out of the gate based on how you deliver the food. Simply walking up to someone and being a massive creep nets you a base score of 100 points on top of whatever multipliers you get in the delivery. However, if you hide in locations such as dumpster, trash, dirt pile, people's homes, and actual porta potty, you get a base score of 500 points. Combine this with the right multipliers and you can get tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of points in a single delivery. Though I question the taste of someone who eats food handed to them by someone who just exited a bathroom. Where did that come from exactly, and where have you been keeping it? Control-wise, it's fairly simple. Interact with the world with Y, deliver food and determine flourish with A, left stick to move, hold right trigger to sprint, and press left stick to do this. Chain is determined by how many times you successfully do a delivery without being seen. This is where points really get made because the more back-to-back -back deliveries you get, the higher this number gets. Combine this with a well-timed hiding spot delivery and you're raking in points. Building on interaction, different locations also have different spots to interact with to not only draw people towards you, but also change their pathways and even open up new paths for you to take. Some areas allow you to go to different sections of the map, such as walking through a building or jumping down into the sewer. The strength of the king is also unmatched, as he can move giant concrete pipes and knock down entire trees with ease as demonstrated here. The people themselves have eyesight and hearing ability. Every NPC that walks around the map has this little cone of vision in front of them to dictate where they're able to see. Staying out of this cone is important as touching it breaks your chain and in some missions causes you to fail if it's a pure stealth mission. It doesn't matter if you're in direct line of sight of an NPC or literally smelling their hair, as long as you're not in that cone or making any noise, you are perfectly safe to do your delivery. If you've ever played that old Flash game, The Classroom, the rules in Sneak King work similarly to that. This meter on the minimap shows how loud you are being at any given time. The higher the black, the louder you are. If you run too close to an NPC, their intention will be drawn to you and you'll be seen if you're not careful. There isn't really much of anything in terms of story. In between each section, you get these little newspaper segments which detail the king interacting with the population at large. No words were exchanged, but the king flashed a reassuring smile. Reassuring smile. That's pretty much most of the gameplay right there. Sneak King is not a complicated title, it was literally made to be sold with a value meal. It's not a hard game to learn, but figuring out the perfect storm of timing and combo building to get the highest score possible is the thing you'll end up wanting to master to get the highest rank, provided you know what you need to do to get the A ranks, but I'll touch on that later. It's a super arcadey title, so if you end up getting really invested in it like I did, you'll find yourself restarting the game at the first screw up to make sure everything is absolutely perfect. With that said, let's see what hurts this game.
While this game doesn't have much going on under the hood, I will say that I do have a few issues with it, mainly in terms of performance and camera control. The game runs smoothly, no questions about it, but there are some things that are a bit on the rougher end of the spectrum. Licensed games were the bread and butter for Blitz, with Burger King being no exception, and licensed game do what licensed game do best. Where jank exists, jank will come. And good mother of god, this camera. To start off, the camera controls are inverted with no way to change them. This isn't a huge deal as it's something you can get used to real fast. However, this is one of those cameras that does not like solid objects, and man is it bad in this game. When you're in a wide open area, the camera functions normally, but as soon as you come near an object, it doesn't pass through it or basically just zooms in all the way. It's not bad enough to intrude on gameplay too much, but sometimes you can get into certain spots where the camera will just not want to go. On rare occasions, you can go into a spot one time and the camera will work normally, but sometimes you can go back to that exact same spot and the camera will have a fit and not work with you. There are some moments where the animations don't work quite that well and are mostly cosmetic, such as doors not closing in one occasion having a person getting stuck in the faint animation but was still moving around and getting hungry like normal. But there is one that is really frustrating, and that's in the construction site. Obviously, the busiest sounding theme is going to have props to fit, and there's this crane lifting and dropping another concrete pipe to essentially open and close a pathway for you. However, as I have been talking about, animations break, so there's moments where the path is actually usable as far as the game concerned, but the animation doesn't reflect that, which is easily going to a fool a first-time player and waste precious time. This is also one of the few glitches I recall that happened very consistently. It's not a rare glitch by any means. Speaking of things that frustrate me, Rankings. I mentioned Sneak King is an arcadey game, so there's rankings and an emphasis on getting as much score as you can, or finishing something as fast as possible depending on what the mission has you do. However, Sneak King has an issue where it doesn't tell you what the requirements are until after you beat the mission the first time. I can't tell you how many times I finished a mission with a massive score only to be told, Too bad, idiot! This was a time-based mission, and I end up doing the entire thing all over again to get a rank higher than C. Speaking of time, there's usually two types of time-based missions. Do X as fast as you can, or do X within a certain amount of time. As previously mentioned, there's certain parts of the map where you can interact with the environment to change the person's pathway or to open up new parts of the map. There are two things that I neglected to mention. One, these parts reset every time you start a mission. And two, the timer does not stop when you do an action that is not delivery. A good way to see this is in the construction site, as there are multiple ramps that you have to essentially create in order to progress through different parts of the map. Some of the missions spawn you in these areas, so you have to find the exit ramp rather than going back the way you came, which, again, can eat up time. On the sillier end of the spectrum, sometimes if you're in specific spots, the camera will just zoom in on the king during a delivery, so you get an eyeful of the king's chest while handing somebody a cheeseburger. The easiest way to do this is to deliver food to people while they're inside their own homes. In certain spots on the map, people will walk into a house to pick up trash to take to a can. If a hungry person enters a home, you can walk into a doorway while it's open, give them food, and get up and close and personal with Mr. King. Also, the trash bags people carry. Strange thing to talk about, I know, but I was in the construction site when I noticed that they have no bottom polygons. The bags are completely hollow. Some of the writings in this game are also a little bit weird. Reading most of them, it was obvious the devs were having fun with the game and leaning into the ridiculousness of the whole concept, especially with BK themselves driving the direction of the game based on the reading I did. There were a couple of lines that were genuine head scratches, even with context behind them. One line came from a time-based mission in the cul-de-sac and mentioned, The king doesn't get dizzy. He gets freaky. And another mission in the same area asked me to deliver my meaty treat to five men. What are you trying to tell me, Burger King? Lastly, I know I said this game ran fine, but when this game crashed, oh boy, did it crash. It crashed on me twice, and though the first time was fairly standard, the second time when the construction site was actually kind of funny, the king left this plane of existence trying to enter a hiding spot. That's pretty much it in terms of complaints and glitches. Do I have anything good to say now? Thankfully. Yes. I'll open up my conclusions with this statement. I found the game repetitive, but I was not bored. I feel it's important to emphasize that this game, while fundamentally the same thing most of the time, failed at being boring while doing so. 
I think the fact that this game has this score and time trial based approach to most of its missions is what makes it shine. I found myself having a lot of fun with the game early on. Additionally, the game keeps itself fresh instead of rehashing the same 20 missions in every area. The vast majority of the missions in this game try to do something different to challenge the player or to make them think about how they approach the level in terms of strategy, even if they all follow the same basic premise. For example, early on the game's missions are fairly simple, like deliver three sandwiches, jump into hiding spots, perform a flourish on several deliveries. Followed by, deliver sandwiches to get X amount of points, deliver food only from hiding spots, make this many deliveries in X amount of time. And then it starts going off the wall in the form of make X amount of deliveries without missing a single one, deliver this amount of sandwiches but only do it to people who are a specific level of hungry and do the best level of flourish each time, deliver food to different levels of hunger and don't repeat a single one. You know what? delivering food, run around the map and get seen by everyone. And my personal favorite, make X amount of deliveries without going over a certain amount of points and do it quickly, you f***ing moron, you thought this was a score mission? And I didn't call this game Metal Gear Sandwich in some community post for a joke. This game can get hard. Some of the stealth missions of this game can get difficult and a lot of the later missions really make you think about your approach and honestly, as so annoying as some of the requirements can get, they really make you push towards wanting to get those A ranks which I did want to do on a lot of occasions. With how the game is, it feels like it found an okay balance between challenging and frustrating. There are missions that were a genuine challenge and I was glad to finally finish them. There are also missions that made me want to drive in the wrong lane on the highway but I didn't hate playing the game or get exhausted from it at any point, which I think is an important thing to note. If you're the completionist type, this game might be a genuinely good time for you. Getting an A rank without even trying feels great, and honestly, just building those massive delivery chains to get a crazy amount of points in one shot feels so damn good. The commercials they're based on were designed to be weird and wacky and stick out in your mind. The game is based entirely on those, but at no point does it feel like you're being advertised to. Yes, Burger King's trademarks and branding are littered everywhere, but it's not intrusive. It's a supplement to the aspects of the game world, not a replacement for the game world itself. For examples of what I mean by that, look at Pepsi Man. Pepsi Man is an okay game in its own right. It's a fun by the skin of your teeth runner game, but the branding? The title screen is Pepsi. The character is Pepsi. The health is Pepsi. The lives are Pepsi. The trucks are Pepsi. The billboards are Pepsi. The obstacles are Pepsi. People are starting actual riots over Pepsi. You save people from an actual plane crash with Pepsi. An entire city is plastered wall to wall with Pepsi. It is Pepsi all the way down. I like Pepsi, but holy shit. Do not get the impression that I am dunking on Pepsi Man. I played through and enjoyed the game. Pepsi Man as a concept is ridiculous within itself. I love the idea and I seriously wish they did commercials with the character outside of Japan. The game does the same thing Sneak King does, provide a fun experience while telling you to consume product, but what Pepsi Man does differently to Sneak King is that you're never not seeing Pepsi or its logo occupy some of the screen at any given point. Now, Sneak King does this too to some level. You're basically exposed to the Whopper anytime you're in a mission, not to mention the existence of the King as a whole. The thing is that it is nowhere near to the intrusive and over-the-top level that Pepsi Man is. The Whopper is there, but the Burger King branding is not in your face all the time. For this, this is a Pepsi game. You're playing Pepsi Man on your PS1. Did you know this is a game about Pepsi? Here's an entire wall of cans in case you forgot. What I'm trying to say is that both games do things differently when it comes to the product they are ultimately shilling. Pepsi Man is fun, but it feels more like a commercial disguised as a video game. It's over the top. Like, so over the top, it's incredible. There's never a dull moment, which is right up my alley, but it's throwing Pepsi at you every second of the game. It reminds me a lot of Eminem's Blast. You're constantly doing something, but the branding and advertising is constantly in your face. But to Pepsi Man's credit, it's a lot more fun than the Dollar Store Mario Party the latter game is. It's also kinda short. I emulated the game well before this channel was even a concept, and it wasn't too long. On my playthrough to get the footage you're seeing now, beating the game front to back only took around an hour. Sneak King is also fun, but it feels more like a video game disguised as a commercial. Sneak King feels more fleshed out than its soft drink sibling. It also feels like it has more common blood with a kid's meal toy. It gets people into the restaurant to buy food for their kid or something, they grab the game, and little Timmy shoves french fries into his face while laughing at the funny burger man on the Xbox. The point is that it created a potential customer, and it gets people talking about Burger King through word of mouth. It's all viral marketing at the end of the day. You make weird commercial, people talk about weird commercial. You make weird game about weird commercial, kids beg mom and dad to go to the restaurant. They buy food, they buy game, customers created, and CEO gets to go home to a house made of money. 
I feel Burger King pulled off advertising a little better than its counterpart. Sneak King knows what it is, and it doesn't have to remind you that this is a Burger King game at every single rendered frame. It and Pepsi Man are both good for different reasons, but despite the fact that you're literally playing as a mascot for the restaurant, the advertising should take a backseat. It feels like Blitz and Burger King wanted to make a game that is driven by fun, with the commercial aspect riding shotgun. Sneak King isn't a fantastic game by any stretch of the imagination. It's not gonna blow anyone away, especially now, but it's a decent game. It's okay, it's worth a look, even if just once. This run ended up being pretty weird, and it requires some explanation in a bit of detail. If you want to jump straight into this mess, timestamps are in the description. The idea here is that I need to do the bare minimum to finish Fallout 3, but the only things I'm allowed to use must have spawned in Vault 101. Food, ammo, weapons, armor, everything. If the item did not spawn in Vault 101, I can't use it for anything, not even to trade. Things associated with Vault 101, like the armored Vault 101 jumpsuit, are not considered from the vault, as you get that in Megaton. When it comes to picking up items, nothing is stopping me from doing so. The only thing is that using them myself in any capacity would make the run forfeit unless that item was in Vault 101. To keep things simple, using a 10mm pistol that I picked up in the vault is legal to use. Using a 10mm pistol that I picked up off of a raider, even to repair my own, is not. However, taking that same pistol from a raider and giving it to someone else is perfectly fine, provided I do not mistakenly give them the one from the vault, as that would leave me without a weapon. This means that it's important to pay major attention to your weapon conditions or to use hotkeys that way you know for sure which one you got from the vault. The idea is to make picking up items and looting in general a way waste of time, but not entirely pointless. I will explain this a little more later in the video. Obvious exceptions are made to any items required to beat the game, like the Vault 112 jumpsuit or the Gek in Vault 87. As you need those items to progress the story, they are the exceptions to this rule. Additionally, using fists is legal as well as they are a part of your body and not considered equipment. In regards to trade, any of the items I pick up in the vault are legal to use. Much like weapons and armor, junk found in Vault 101 can be traded. Junk found inside a desk in the middle of DC can't. Next thing, caps. No caps. Period. Even if said caps came as a result of trade. As with my previous videos, play the game as intended by the developers, no sequence breaks, and no glitching into areas I'm not supposed to be in yet unless it's required to do the game. This is the first time I've played Fallout 3 in like, 8 years, so let's see if my green colored glasses are still working. As with any story released by Bethesda in 2008, we start with our birth. I almost asked friends what to name my character before settling on Minkle. My idea was to create a monstrosity that never saw the light of day, but I ended up with the inbred cousin of Flamio Hotman. My appearance was so horrendous, it caused my mother to go into cardiac arrest, and now we are a baby. My special build emphasized strength and endurance, with intelligence at 4 and everything else at 5. My expectation was that I wouldn't be able to heal myself very often, at least for most of the game, so I needed to be able to not only take as much damage as I could, but also be able to deal a lot of melee damage as I was sure to have limited ammo in general. I immediately noticed the physics were kind of off. I played around with some objects in the room and it felt like gravity was stronger, you know, aside from the typical Bethesda jank. I eventually had my birthday party, got the iPhone 4S from the Overseer, and after talking to the local locals, I started picking up trash hoping it would be in my pockets for later. You'd be shocked to know my hopes were crushed when I had to take the goat. I went downstairs, hoarded BBs, took a short break to cap the frame rate, shot a disgusting insect and a rad roach, and cracked Wally Max's skull. I realized I forgot to change the difficulty, so I reloaded and got a good look at myself. I told Butch to back off and skip to the goat. My tag skills were unarmed, melee weapons, and medicine. That last one does not make much sense, and trust me when I say I paid for it later. 
I later woke to Amada telling me my dad ran off and gave me a gun. I then began the boring task of looting every single thing that wasn't nailed to the floor. Officer Kendall was dealing with some rad roaches, so I punched his lights out. Taking him down took time, but he was able to go down. I healed using a water fountain. This might look like cheating, but the fountain is part of the vault, therefore it is fine to use. Butch pulled me aside to help his mom, I did so, and he gave me his tunnel snake's jacket as a thank you, adding 5 to melee weapons. Something nice to have early on. I stole a switchblade and continued my quest for garbage. Fist fighting the officers in the atrium was a hassle, and I made a mental note that vats would be pretty helpful in this run for guaranteed damage. In most cases, anyway. I died for the first time to a rad roach of all things, and after looting the officers a second time, I beat up Officer Mac, and after looting the security room, I talked to the overseer, stole his car keys, hacked his computer, and waddled to the main entrance with 300 pounds of garbage in my pockets. I started opening the door, kicked the snot out of the raid party that tried to stop me, did one final sweep of the vault to make sure I got everything, and went on my merry way. Once flash banged by the natural world, I leveled up. I dumped my points between my tag skills, took Swift Learner as my first perk, and took stock. My inventory consisted of three 10mm pistols, a BB gun, a baseball bat, nine police batons, a switchblade, an absolutely unneeded amount of Vault 101 jumpsuits and various clothes, nine pieces of security armor, eight security helmets, a single shot of medics, two packs of mentats, three bottles of water, 30 pieces of rad roach meat, 20 stim packs, two bottles of vodka, enough garbage to make the writers for hoarders want to get in touch, 241 10mm rounds, 50 BBs, and 10 shotgun shells. I just want to remind you that this is all I have to work with in terms of combat, healing, and trade for a good 60% of the game. I started my trek towards Springvale and did my first real-world test on an Enclave iBot which broke my arm. My first stop was Megaton, attacking any creature that happened to come across my path to get as much EXP as I can. After buying a stim pack to fix my wounds, I talked to Lucas Sims for info on Dad and went to Craterside Supply for my first real shopping trip. Moira gave me the Armored Vault 101 suit after I bought some ammo from her. As a reminder, this item is from the vault on a technicality, but it wasn't given to me inside the vault, so it's just wasted space. Later in Moriarty's saloon, I stole his computer password and talked to him about Dad. I wanted info, but he wanted money from a lady named Silver and had the nerve to upcharge me for trying to get the info I need. I bonked him with my bonk stick and went back to Springville at the speed of Snail. I talked to Silver, took the money, killed her anyway, and waddled back to Megaton with the weight of my sins slowing me down, broke into the saloon, gave him his money, and got my next destination, Galaxy News Radio. On the way to DC, I worked similarly to runs past, at discovering locations and killing creatures to grind for EXP. I told a small child to get lost, battled raiders, wasted ammo, and got to level 3. Points went into barter, melee weapons, and small guns, took Lady Killer for some reason, repaired my tools which was a horrible idea, and ran into a raider with an assault rifle. I tried to pick him off with BBs and failed miserably. I wasted about half of my 10mm trying to take down a super mutant and went inside the metro. I destroyed a Protectron I freed from its prison, fought mole rats, and ran into my first pack of ghouls. Ghouls are going to be a recurring theme through this run as they were very annoying from the very start. It's one thing if you're not arbitrarily limiting yourself for entertainment and can do whatever you want. It's another thing entirely when your only weapons are pea shooter and big stick on top of being on I eat bullets for breakfast mode. I eventually opened the gate holding them back. A few went down with no problems, but so did I. This feral ghoul roamer was the biggest headache. They're normally about as much of a threat as most basic ghouls, but that's not the case here. They're about as threatening as the Reavers in Broken Steel right now considering how much health they erase. Bottlenecking the ghouls seemed to be the best strategy, as it eventually helped me take them all down. I slept in a nearby bed to heal before I realized I was cheating and reloaded a save. I soon ran into the first of many super mutants and began the legendary battle of Board vs. Bat. That ended up winning. I dropped a piece of heavy armor to help me move faster, much like in real life, and drank a single bottle of vodka which resulted in immediate alcohol addiction, much like in real life. The ghouls punished me for my poor choices by tearing me apart. I soon lured the ghouls to the super mutant instead and picked them off while they were distracted. I saw the sun once again, battled more mutants, and ran into the Brotherhood of Steel. Around here I noticed that Fallout 3 only really rewards you EXP if you do the majority of the work when fighting an enemy. If you attack someone and an NPC kills it, you don't get anything if they did most of the damage. I seemingly failed to learn this quickly as I wasted a lot of my 10mm ammo on the mutants outside GNR. A beeline for the door was a bad idea, as was trying to help the Brotherhood from a distance, so I waited it out by the doors of the building and then the behemoths showed up. Long story short, I waited out the battle while watching the big green moron throw the Brotherhood around like a small child playing with his Hot Wheels. Inside, I spoke to 3Dog and got info on my dad by hail marrying a 9% speech check, and my next stop was Rivet City. I got the educated perk for more perk points in the future and started my journey. 
I got attacked by another raider only for Uncle Leo to show up and steal my kill. I got wrecked by a centaur, found people selling human flesh, wiped them out, beat up the centaur correctly, got drunk, got chased by a Mirelurk and retreated inside Dukov's place only to make the mistake of thinking I was safe. Tried to juke it out and failed. After speaking to the women inside, I took my chances on taking down Dukov for the EXP, which ended about as well as I could have expected. Many, 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 many attempts later, I eventually got him. I chased Cherry outside who pulled a me and got the attention of a Mirelurk who took me down. I poached a few raiders battling an iBot and tried to knock out a scavenger after trading with him to get my vault junk back. As it turns out, an AK-47 beats a baseball bat no contest. I swam through the river to avoid battling some super mutants and snuck the rest of the way to Rivet City, barely making it there alive. Once in the loving gaze of Dr. Lee, I got the info I needed, did some shopping, and entered a state of pure agony. The Jefferson Memorial sucks. Like, really, really, really sucks. The outside was pain thanks to hunting rifles and grenades. The inside was worse. It's a simple concept, get to the memorial, get inside, go to the rotunda, pick up dad's shopping list, and get your butt to the vault they built under a quick loop for some reason. Anywhere else it's fine, here it's easier said than done. Especially when you're on death's door half the time with limited stims. I tried to do work on a few moons to make things easier in the future for when I eventually had to come back, but that only did so much. It was around here I remembered, wait. I have a gun, and started trying to shoot weapons out of the hands of enemies. I eventually got the notes from the rotunda, blinked to Vault 101, and did some shopping, died to raiders on a highway, hid in the vault after trying again, and got to level 5, bringing melee weapons to 65 and using Little Leaguer to get it to 70. On my way to Vault 112, I battled pretty much anything that entered my peripheral vision to get experience. I sent Ben Canning to God, lost to a scavenger, stepped on a mine, beat up a robot, played Ring Around the Mole Rat, and got a dose of reality in the form of a Mr. Gutsy using plasma. Once in the garage, I used the high ground to deal with the mole rats and finally got inside the vault. They gave me a fresh pair of pants and I wasted time beating up the Robobrain. Once in Tranquility Lane, I got my melee weapons to 87 and took toughness. Punching Betty proved to be a mistake as she showed me the power of God. I made a kid cry and wasted no time in overriding the simulation. I beat up the Chinese soldier and the little girl revealed herself to be an old man the entire time. I left the sim, reunited with Dad, and opted to follow him all the way back to Rivet City. Because I'm the one playing here and nothing is allowed to go right, a pack of raiders were waiting outside of the garage, which was frustrating since a light breeze could kill me right now. Dad did most of the work while I got the raiders from the back. Dad glitched at some point and refused to move, forcing me to beat him to the point of blacking out so he can walk again. My strategy here was to let Dad engage the enemies and pick them off while they were distracted, hoping they wouldn't go against me. This worked for a while and got me to level 7, allowing me to max up my melee weapon skill and take Bloody Mess as the next perk. A pack of dogs turned me into dinner, I died to raiders in DC, and some more raiders proved to be annoying. There was one with a rocket launcher in the area, which, as you may guess, is a bit of a hassle to deal with. Not helping the situation was the death clot that just happened to be nearby. I tried to avoid it as much as possible. Dad didn't, and I didn't even get EXP for taking it down. Shooting the guns helped against the raiders, but they would just pick up new ones. Once most of them were gone, we had to deal with this turret. I couldn't take it down due to an ammo issue, but I had the bright idea to bring a gun to Dad so he can try to pick it up. Being the old turd that he is, he insisted on using a tire iron against the turret hanging 10 feet above him! I eventually left him to die and blink to the Jefferson Memorial once far enough away. Predictably, he didn't come with me. One later, he showed up near the raiders underneath the bridge. We battled mutants on the way through, yet he insisted on taking out this one group of mutants outside of Revit City. The boat is right there, you old fart! After fighting back the urge to walk into the Potomac and inhale all of the water, we eventually cleared the mutants and watched him dock to talk to Lee. A railroad lady showed up to talk to me, so I beat her to death and began the annoying process of fighting the rest of the mutants at Project Purity. Just as before, fighting mutants with a mostly melee build is a problem when simply being next to a gun as it fires can turn off your brain. My strategy was entering and exiting the area to lure mutants to spots where I can whittle some health and run away, occasionally shooting guns out of their hands. Sometimes it works, sometimes it didn't. I eventually ended up with a single mag's worth of 10mm, which is not as great as you might have guessed. The mutants were pretty much cheating at this point. Watch this. I thought I got wall banged, but 
apparently not. I looked at the frame by frame and the very second the door opened, the mutant on the other side fired a shot into my shoulder. I also noticed that for some reason the baseball bat has a really bad range. I could backpedal and attack with the police baton while still being at the right distance to deal damage, but not with the bat. I soon retreated to get more EXP. I tried to go to Arafu, but the local Yao Guai told me no. I did test the range of the police baton against a Rad Scorpion, which was an eye-opener more than anything. Once I had 46 rounds under my belt, I tried again to take care of the basement mutants, which went down at enough time despite my own struggles with them too. Dad had me do chores, and this is where everything basically fell apart. Once the Enclave showed up, I had 19 bullets and no pants. The soldier downstairs had power armor and a laser rifle. My first attempt at getting his gun was mitigated by the dangerous wasteland monster known as the WALL and I decided that I was not going to be able to take him with me with no health and barely any ammo. He even managed to kill me mid-vats a few times. Once I did manage to get his gun down, I beelined for the rotunda and watched Dad take a nap. Dr. Lee agreed we needed to run, but it felt it was necessary to run in every single direction apart from the one we had to go in. I tried to go in the tunnels, but she never showed up, and she's required to proceed as the terminal that locks a large door is set to very hard, which I wasn't going to be opening at any point. I tried to help her the best I could, even in trying to entice her to pick up a rifle, which didn't work. I had enough when I saw that someone had stuffed a super mutant into the ceiling. I reloaded a save I made back at Smith Casey's garage, did the entire song and dance all over again, before I finally gave up. Minkle wasn't going any further from here. I was not going to beat the game in my current state. So where did I screw up? My tag skills were unarmed, melee weapons, and medicine. The idea behind them was that given my limited healing supplies, I wanted what I could have to be as effective as possible. Plus, when the run was in my head, I was thinking I would be punching a lot later on, so I wanted to have unarmed as a secondary main skill in the event my weapons broke often. However, I didn't anticipate the large amount of police batons I would end up getting from the vault, not to mention how durable the weapons I did have ended up being. My strategy changed as I encountered different enemies which caused my earlier actions to hurt my performance going forward. How I acted leaving the vault for the first time screwed me over by the time I was clearing out the Jefferson Memorial. Management is important to reach the halfway point. That point is called Trouble on the Homefront. Trouble on the Homefront is a quest you can do after completing the Waters of Life. This quest allows you to go back to Vault 101 to deal with the Overseer in the aftermath of you leaving the Vault. Not only does this serve as a restock point for the game, if you finish the quest in a certain way, you can leave Vault 101's door open permanently. This allows you to not only get extra loose items for trade and defense, but also have a home base for you to retreat to if you need to heal, removing the urgency of not having any stim packs as you can just run away and fast travel back there for safety. So where do we go from here? It's not feasible to proceed from the sub-basement, not with the Enclave running around. The end of the game without taking a hit until finishing the quest is possible in theory, but I'm playing on bullet sponge mode and I'm not sweaty enough to do that. So I figured my best course of action would be, using what I know now, to go back to square one, say goodbye to Minkle, and say hello to Fergus. <laughs> Mom die, learn to walk. The build this time is Strength 10, Perception 3, Endurance 8, Charisma 3, Intelligence 6, Agility 4, Luck 6. For comparison, the Minkle build is listed on the side here. Strength is maxed out from the very start. Having a lowered agility seems counterintuitive, I know, but Intelligence and Luck get a much needed boost. I need the skill points fast, and critical hits knock weapons out of hands. Lord knows I need them. Birthday, learn to shoot, flashbang, take a test. This time my tag skills are Barter, Melee Weapons, and Small Guns. This immediately gives a Melee weapon skill of 40. Barter is needed to get the most out of my trade supplies, and Small Guns is there for accuracy and perk reasons. I woke up with blood in my face, Dad went to get smokes. Looting, 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 escape. Leveled up, split my points between melee and barter, took Little Leaguer again. I started carrying a large bundle of armor with me in the overworld to move just a little bit faster. Cleaned up Spring Veil School to get to level 3, used intense training to get my endurance up to level 9, went to Megaton, talked to Moriarty, stole his password, found out where Dad went, killed Silver anyway, took out Grandma Sparkle and somehow my computer did catch fire, the presence of Brian Wilkes caused a bridge of mines to explode under me, I found this group of Wastelanders fighting a bunch of raiders, leveled up in the Metro, Melee 67, Barter 51, took the Educated Perk. The goals still suck, surprise surprise, save my ammo and let the Brotherhood do the work. Three Dog thought I wasn't suffering enough and told me to get the Virgo 2 dish. Basically, I have to walk through the Super Mutant Meat Grinder with basically no healing items and a limited inventory. Thanks, friend! Got melee to 77 and barter to 60 at level 5, took intense training a second time to max out my endurance. 
The path the game wanted me to take was full of raiders and turrets, which wasn't happening in this decade. I reloaded an earlier save to take a surface route which was just as bad, if not worse, thanks to a combination of raiders in the front and ghouls from the back. The ghouls forced me to waste ammo when I wasn't wasting it on the raiders, blinked to make a ton to trade, blinked back, still had issues. Went into a nearby tunnel that had Talon Company inside because things aren't allowed to be easy, retreated into Metro, did the swag at DuPont Circle, had to sneak around a massive amount of raiders, died in DuPont Station, reloaded again, and decided to push to the Talon Mercs. Parkoured around some grenades, beat up the Mercs, got forced into running towards gunfire, detoured into a neighborhood, then into tunnels, then into ghouls, battled a super mitten on Pennsylvania Avenue to practice shooting the gun, but he kept going out of his way to pick it up. Saw what was left of the White House and traveled through more tunnels. I didn't die, but I found more mutants. Once I finally had a close-up view of the Washington Monument, I ran towards it only for a pack of dogs to decide that wasn't happening. I ended up going towards the Lincoln Memorial and ran around the circle until I reached the Washington Monument, making a beeline into the Museum of Technology. You'll never guess what was inside, though. Let's just say this is where my patience really got tested. I had no meds, no pants, and no health. Had to sprint through different paths just to find the right one that takes me to the Virgo 2 lander. I eventually found myself at a stairwell, which was predictably annoying, but manageable in the end. I soon got the dish, but getting out was the next problem. Once I entered the main lobby, I had to make a break for the door and bolt back to the monument like they just told me they were handing out free money. Set up the dish, blinked back to GNR, got my information, leveled up, took a bloody mess, and sent three dog to heaven for putting me through that. I wasted no time on my way to Rivet City, spoke to Dr. Lee again. I got Dad's notes, went to the vault, freed his face, and went back to the memorial. However, because I made the mistake of doing something right earlier, the mutants kept picking weapons right back up again or taking a gun off one of their fallen brothers. This is where I decided that while I can't use weapons, nothing is stopping me from moving them out of the way or putting them in my inventory to make fights more viable. Once the memorial was clear again, I shoved a few rifles into the inventories of several people to give the scientists a fighting chance once the Enclave inevitably took over. I did the chores once more, the Enclave showed up, Dad did too much trolling for his own good, and against all odds, Dr. Freakin' Lee actually used the gun I gave her. She fired a grand total of seven rounds before immediately going back to being useless by picking up frag grenades from a super mutant. Her animation for throwing kept looping, but nothing was getting thrown. The one time she did throw a grenade nearly took me out. She kept going into places she wasn't supposed to again, but actually managed to get inside the tunnels this time. I led the mystery gang through the sewer and Daniel Trash talked my now deceased dad. I bonked his head, which angered everyone. Garza dumped an entire clip from two feet away, missing every single shot while I was standing completely still. Once the door was open, I was rewarded with more ghouls. Yay. Limited ammo on hand, but I did my best. But now Garza has a heart problem and needs stim packs that I do not have. I pushed forward without them to see what was ahead. Two Enclave soldiers, one with laser, one with plasma. Everyone kept running everywhere except forward, so I took out Garza to get it over with, which predictably didn't take care of that step of the quest. I pushed forward without the group using the girders on the stairwell as cover, and when I finally did manage to make it through alive, there were more ghouls on the other end because why the f It eventually clicked that I could not escape from the situation and had to reload a save. Good news, I did have one. Bad news, it was from before I cleared out the memorial, so I cleared it out for the sixth time by this point. Took a laser rifle from the Enclave soldier in the basement, tried to take out one of those soldiers on the ground floor and accidentally reloaded a save when I took him out the first time. I actually managed to get inside the purifier bulkhead somehow, gave Dr. Lee the laser rifle after reloading the save. She thankfully went to the stupid tunnels immediately this time. Decided to take the stim pack and the nearby first aid kit to give to Garza. The ghouls in the tunnel were enemies that I can fight. I accidentally hit Alex Dargan, which was apparently more than enough to convince the entire crew to sprint through the rest of the tunnels into where I needed to be. It was enough to distract the ghouls and I didn't even need to deal with Garza, which was incredible. I eventually made it upstairs to find more ghouls because Fallout 3. Three ghouls, one doorway, and I had to get rid of them all to continue. Right after Dr. Lee came to talk about Garza, though at that point I think he was dead. At some point, the third ghoul vanished, a shopping cart came in to save the day, and I was never so happy to see the Brotherhood of Steel in my entire life. I got to open air and saw the notification telling me the Waters of Life was done, practically jumping out of my seat at this point. I leveled up and took Little Leaguer again and teleported to Vault 101 without thinking twice. I tuned my radio and opened the door. After dropping excess stuff to not get confused, it was time to get restocked. 
The highlights of this trip included finding a stealth boy, which holy moly, that's one heck of a find, new weapons that weren't there in my first sweep, an extra bat, a lead pipe, and the reactor had an assault rifle and grenades, along with 100 rounds in the overseer's locker. Once all was said and done, the only way to keep the vault door open permanently was to destroy it. I ran the system's purge and sabotaged the vault. The overseer pointed his finger at me and I pointed my knife at his face. I drank whiskey over his corpse, and it was around this time that the loading screen started to freak out. Every single possible HUD element was loading in the black void, which was very concerning. I lied to Amada and restarted the game just to prevent any potential crashes. And finally entered the Citadel. Scribe Rothschild pointed me to a computer which told me where I could find a Gek and had to go off to Vault 87. I found Little Lamplight and explored the area for EXP. Found a Yao Guai instead. Took toughness at level 9 and offered to rescue children from Paradise Falls. I ended up in Arfu at this point, and much like how the Blood Ties quest broke for me on the Xbox 360, I left a house and a Yaogwai spawned on top of the guy that gives the quest, preventing me from finishing it. I reloaded away from that hole in the ground and a random encounter drained 99% of my HP because I had the audacity to have fun. After healing back at the vault, I teleported back to Paradise Falls and made the push through the region. I removed everyone from the area, got addicted to Mentats, and removed each enemy one quick save at a time. Sammy told me to get a key from one of the guys I took out earlier. I almost got deleted by the slavers deeper inside and remembered the stealth boy I got from the vault, which was a lifesaver in this part. I told the kids to run, healed at home, and began the run to Vault 87. I chose not to deal with the super mutants unless I had to, which was a horrible idea. My worst foe was a super mutant master, mainly due to the large amount of health that it has, but one of them got me to level 10. Here I started putting more points into science with my tag skills at okay levels, and got the mysterious stranger perk. I saved the game once in the vault proper, and my strategy was similar to what was going on in the memorial, lure mutants to spots where I could deal damage. The first part of the vault was okay, but things got rough in the living quarters. Once you get to the second floor, there's two mutants with ARs. One is in a hallway, and the second one appears in a scripted event where he opens the door as soon as you reach the walkways and opens fire. Tried to rush, and ended up dead. The second rush worked better, but now I had the mutants in the FEV labs to deal with. There's a centaur and several more assault rifle mutants. I talked to Fox and he told me how to get him out of his cell, but the problem was I didn't have enough science to hack the terminal that unlocks his cell specifically. At this point, I had two options. Rush for the fire control console, or leave and come back later. With both options being... painful, I tried for the console, but in a certified Fallout 3 moment, there's more mutants inside that will insta-kill me. I did manage to get to it at one point, but I got cornered by pretty much everything seconds later. More time was spent trying to reduce the super mutant presence in the vault itself and within Murder Pass. I want to take a moment to point out a little thing Vats likes to do when you're using melee weapons. Typically melee with Vats will be a guaranteed hit, however the game likes to move enemies back about 30 feet when your percentage is at 95%. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that's annoying. Sticky gave me the idea to go to Big Town. I did some exploring and hunting to bump up my levels so I can get the science skill I needed. The railroad lady showed up out of nowhere, made it to Big Town and was told to save Red from the Germantown PD. A rubble brain ruined my evening, as did super mutants. I blinked to the vault and realized robots can be killed, so I got 85 flamer fuel and a piece of scrap metal from Andy. Inside the PD, I turned on the fire alarm and got Red killed. In a second attempt, I gave her my assault rifle since I wasn't using it that much to begin with. Once in Big Town again, I got my science skill to 50 and took the best perk I could possibly get for this run. Finesse. Back in Lamplight, my 10mm had finally reached the point of occasionally jamming on reloads. Not a good sign, but the gun would hold on if it wanted to or not. Slowly but surely, I made my way back to the testing labs, rushed for the terminal, and the game told me no. Fun thing about Mentat's addiction, it lowers your science skill. Annoyed and tired, I played around in the Citadel, did more grinding, and almost walked straight to Vault 87's main entrance. Inside for probably the 10th time now, I tried to lure the mutants out with no success, and at that point, I figured rushing would be the only way to continue. First time failed, but the second time had everything line up perfectly. Fox was freed, and he led me to the Gek. I took a short break to see what happens if you get radiation poisoning with no clip on. It looked like this. Walked through the halls, a grenade took my picture, and Autumn held me hostage. The president let me go, I grabbed my junk, leveled up, and got to work. This is where the game turned into a glitchless speedrun. There was no chance I was going to last long enough to deal with all the Enclave inside, so I had to find the right path and book it to President Eden. 
The biggest issue was this hallway with two soldiers in it. Once again, not something you want to deal with at low health. I eventually got to his chamber and began talking to Eden. I took his funny virus, fought my way out, but something didn't feel right. It felt like I had more ammo than I did before. Just to be safe, I reloaded a save and, sure enough, back in Vault 87, I had less ammo. After making a mental note of how many bullets I had, I went through the Chuckle Nuts routine all over again and made sure to leave the excess bullets behind. Back where I was, Fox came to help me and God punished him by having several vehicles explode as he walked away. I healed, went to the Citadel, and began the final steps of the game. Liberty Prime ascended to a higher plane of existence, I noticed Paladin Glade was far more powerful than I ever could have imagined, the amount of explosions was scaring the heck out of me, and I died to a car bomb. I thought I could bypass the situation by going straight to the memorial, but I got radiation poisoning instead. After realizing I shouldn't cheat, I swam right back to Prime who didn't move an inch, healed again at the vault, battled surviving soldiers, and was on Death's Door once more. Now, I never had problems with Liberty Prime back on the 360, but this time he decided it would be funny to elevate himself 20 feet off the ground. Going in and out of a tunnel thankfully fixed this, I entered the memorial while hanging by a thread, turned a corner, and died instantly. My plan was to let Lions do most of the work, but not only did she have the ammo rock, she insisted on pulling out a flamer when she didn't. WRONG VIDEO! When I realized nothing was working, I reloaded a save and started the walk behind Liberty Prime again, only for him to take the sidewalk instead and get stuck. I bonked his leg as encouragement, and he responded calmly by sending me to Dad. He finally functioned as intended, and I got inside with a healthy amount of ammo and health. I moved to the rotunda, ruined the water supply with the Colonel's corpse, turned on the purifier, rolled the credits, and beat Fallout 3 using items from Vault 101. This is exactly what it sounds like. The rules for this run are largely unchanged on the original video in the base game. The only weapon I'm allowed to use in any capacity is the Flamer, be it arson or blunt force trauma. Any damage with the Flamer is legal. Environmental situations that lead to damage is fair, as it is out of my control. I can do the playthrough however I want, all other items are bartered material. There's no other restrictions to this run outside of the weapon requirement. One rule I established in later videos was to beat the game as closely as intended by the developers, and that point still stands for this DLC. Another thing to note, I will be using the original Flamio Hotman build, as while I could easily make a new build that actually, you know, makes sense, it wouldn't be a Mr. Max video if I did anything resembling proper research, but that doesn't mean I didn't learn anything from the first time. Enough talking, I have an island to burn. In the interest of saving time, and simply because I'm lazy, I loaded a save I made shortly after clipping out of Vault 111 many moons ago. As a reminder for our special stats, we have Endurance at 10, Charisma, Intelligence, and Luck at 5, and everything else at 1. Walking into the Vault Elevator allowed me to get a quick refresher on what my Lord and Savior looks like. The face only a mother could love. I got to the surface, and my first order of business was to attack a nearby cone and head towards Sanctuary for the sake of loot and chit-chat with Codsworth. I had zero plans to do any power leveling here as I didn't feel that would be fair. My focus this is on Far Harbor, not the base game. I did, however, grab the special book in Sean's room to give myself one extra point into strength. I checked the difficulty settings to make sure nothing was changed, and started sprinting towards the general direction of County Crossing to get my weapon. I'm pretty sure someone mentioned that there's an easier way to get the flamer on the first video, but I can't be bothered to check. I got chased by flies, and totally didn't get lost and had to google where my destination was. I started the robot rebellion by picking up a t-shirt, lured one to some NPCs in a failed attempt to save my skin, ran into ghouls and turrets, and found County Crossing with my skin hanging on by a thread. 
Once in the loving arms of other people, I began attempts to get my flamer with limited success, as was expected. I still die in first person, and I haven't figured out why. I eventually got the flamer and tried to help the locals deal with the blood bugs, but decided it was easier to run away instead. I tried my combat skills on a nearby Protectron and got reminded that I'm mortal, reassured myself with a feral ghoul, helped a man go swimming, and chose to explore Boston. My original plan was to hoof it to Diamond City once I got my flamer to start the quest, but only realized the game doesn't give you the quest to start Far Harbor just for walking into town after I got there. I did explore enough to level up and waste my first perk point on Ghoulish and my second point on another strength level. After realizing how much time I wasted, I decided that hauling butt all the way to the northernmost point of the map to the Nakano residence was a much better idea. This was easier said than done due to the local everything. I hugged the map boundaries, talked to the Nakanos, I extorted Kenji, and began my search for clues. I used my fourth level to take Arbor rank 1, which ended up being completely useless. I got my money, got on a boat, and only just noticed Bethesda really made you take a boat near a low detail area of the map. I landed in Far Harbor, met Avery and Alan, and was tasked with helping the town defend against the fog. Thankfully I had no ammo, so I stood there and looked pretty while the residents did most of, if not all of the work. I did try to melee on the ground a few times, but the gulpas are strong enough to send me to hell with a light shove. I eventually retreated into town and sold my trash to the bartender, as one normally does. And it was around here where OBS pooped itself for the first and only time during its run. I lost about 45 minutes of footage, but nothing eventful was lost. On my next recording, I got busy with helping the residents of town to get on people's good sides. Alan thankfully had flamer fuel for sale immediately, so I wasn't going to be entirely defenseless going into the island. I started working towards getting power tools for the Mariner, only to run into my first group of trappers who managed to kill me. I opted to go bowling instead, but the ghouls near the alley weren't very happy about that. A legendary feral stalker was annoying in particular, especially since it ate a third of my health with each hit. Inside the alley, I tried to conserve ammo as much as possible, killing what I could and looting the rest. I ran into a glowing one because of course I did. I had this brilliant idea to melee bash a fuel canister, and it ended exactly how you think it did. In a different direction, I managed to find a spot where I could bash ghouls until I fell through the floor, and I did my first real shopping trip once I made it back to town. I went back for round two after making some changes to my flamer, ghouls followed me outside, Cassie Dalton is probably insane, and I spent a lot of time at the bowling alley, enough to find out that pins in the physical alleys are owned for some reason. A ghoul was also having the time of its life trapped underneath some barriers. I battled the trappers that took me out earlier, snagged some coastal armor simply because it looked cool, and I kept trying to push through the island with my limited resources. The lack of loot was starting to become very apparent here. Going back and forth to any area where I could to do some trade was very common this run. If anything, I'd say it was more common than it was in the main game. However, things play much differently when you're in a massive city versus a small island off the coast of Maine. There's not exactly as many places to loot like there is in the Commonwealth, and you can't be away long enough under normal circumstances for loot to respawn in most cases. From my experience while playing this game, the loot that I found was the loot that I found, and I just had to sack up and deal with it. If I wanted anything better, I'd have to take it off of a body, which more often than not required me to put myself in danger. Speaking of danger, Cassie told me to go take down a fog crawler, but at my current level, that wasn't happening. So I went there anyway and discovered the location for later. A super mutant was rude and walked away when I tried to talk to him, and I took Cap Collector at level 6 to make my life easier in terms of buying and selling. This brings down flamer fuel from 3 caps per round to 2 caps per round, letting me get more out of my barter material. Kitteridge Pass had some pretty good stuff in there, but it also had a lot of ghouls, including a reaver because why is anything allowed to be simple? Yeah, I'm still bitter about Fallout 3. At one point I was in town and took a look at the souvenir cups that are on display at Alan's shop, and noticed Maine is spelled incorrectly, spelled M-A-I-N. How does this even happen? Seriously, it's the name of the state, literally- I went in a different direction towards a quest marker I had at the time, battled and lost to super mutants at the National Park HQ, blinked back for more supplies, chased a rabbit, a super mutant got the touchdown of a lifetime, went to the day spa, and died to mines near Dalton Farm. You may be noticing that I'm doing a lot of things other than the main quest, that's mostly because I'm trying to level up and when you really boil down the DLC to the bare minimum of what you need to do there, there really isn't that much in terms of content, kinda like the main story. It's there, but if you do nothing but that, you'll basically finish it in an afternoon. I finally spoke to Longfellow, who wanted booze if he was going to help me get to Acadia, so I gave him whiskey and went to go finish getting power tools for the Mariner. You'd be shocked to know that Bethesda only knows five things about the Fallout series, and three of them are feral ghouls. The mannequin in the Pulaski shelter was telekinetic, I got insta-killed by a pistol whip, 
and with no ammo whatsoever, I decided to book it for the tools inside the tannery, but ended up getting cornered. I was trapped in a small area, but the ghouls were too stupid to realize there was a gap between me and them. I wasn't really in the mood to reload a save, so I started looking for ways to get past them. Tried to cheese my way through a small opening, but a glowing one scraped my knee and sent me into a coma. I eventually realized that most of the ghouls rushed to the side hallway if I enter that same spot far enough to trigger them, but not far enough to where they can reach. Getting most of them out of the way let me run past the one straggler that remained. I got out of the tannery, escaped into the water, and blinked back to Far Harbor. The doctor told me to try and kill a Mirelurk queen. You'd be disappointed to know that for once I didn't try to do something as dumb as solo a queen with a flamethrower. I took a walk with Longfellow to appreciate nature and pet the local puppies. I kept getting one-shotted by gulpers and radiation was proving to be a bit of an annoyance due to the lack of Rataway. This was a combination of me being unable to find loose ones easily and the fact that Rataway is also incredibly expensive. It's almost like a nuclear war happened and it's in short supply or something. Made it to Acadia and leveled up, taking Heavy Gunner rank 1. Finally found some loose Rataway, went inside, and introduced myself to Dima. I spent a lot of time here just talking to him since this was the first time I played through Far Harbor since I played the game on the Xbox One. I also spent a lot of time in Acadia in general, introducing myself to and talking to just about every synth in the building. It reminded me why I like RPGs, talking to anyone and everyone in an area to learn some information or to see what dumb stuff they can tell the player. I eventually found Kasumi, who told me she suspected Dima was planning to destroy the island based on things she found in his memory banks. After pressing Dima for answers, I learned that the children of Adam are planning to do something extremely stupid because their leader is an idiot and sucks. He mentioned some memories of his holed up in their base, and now it was my job to make sure I can get to them. He stressed that I don't harm the children at all, which I'm sure I'll remember when the time comes. I started doing some quests for Arcadia both for clout and EXP as I wanted to get a few perks before ever going near the nucleus. I found a robot looking for a detective, got one shot by an angler, got blasted by some trappers, and started treating my flamer like a semi-automatic gun, using individual clicks when I knew I could hit for the sake of ammo conservation. I don't know if it was really effective in the grand scheme of things, but it certainly felt like it was when I was playing. I soon found myself dead in Southwest Harbor and retrieved some data tapes from a burning boat, swam to the nearby Vim factory and nearly ruined my chair when I heard a super mutant suicider doing its beeps. Tried to battle the mutants, died to a hound, blinked to Acadia to turn in the drives and level up again, taking Scrounger as my next perk. As a reminder for a run like this, caps only get me so far and they act like credit more than anything. Weapons, armor, and junk give me more caps per item, but they also have weight. Ammo is at least one guaranteed cap per round and is much more convenient, doubly so for fusion cores which can get me a good sale price. I took down the fog crawler at Dalton Farm and Cassie rewarded me with another death wish for later. I went to go find a missing synth to find out he got eaten, taking out my frustrations on the trappers only to get my head caved in by a Molotov. Got a gun for my efforts and took heavy gunner rank too. Stole some things, filled in Kasumi on what's going on, firefights happened, and actually managed to get inside the Vim factory. I was hoping it would be a Sunset Sarsaparilla situation where there's like a million bottles of the stuff laying around, but unfortunately that turned out to not be the case. Just a lot of super mutants, garbage, and pain. I did however get the Vim power armor as a trophy for my effort. I eventually left the factory with my drip in hand and kept the power armor in Far Harbor because I didn't want to be cheap for the rest of the game. Went shopping, explored, and shot up raiders in a cavern. At this point during the note-taking process, I was kind of just letting the clip run through since most of these recordings is just me trying to level up. I banged out a quick Tetris session on my Game Boy and, frankly, I could have done worse. Waddled through the woods with all the loot that I got, commerce took place, and someone died. I started using the doctors to heal myself because I can't find any medicine worth anything. I think this might be the only documented case of someone actually paying a doctor to heal your health in the 8 years Fallout 4 has been out. It also just occurred to me that Fallout 4 is 8 years old, dear mother of god, what happened? Money was getting easier to handle by this point, which is always a good thing, and I started to push towards the nucleus. They blasted a guy into the next life right in front of me, I chit-chatted with Richter for a while and tried to remember what Dima told me about the children earlier. I began my one-man siege of the Children of Adam right there. Radiation proved to be a monumental pain once again, but I got some new drip courtesy of what was left of Grand Zealot Richter. The lack of radiation protection was an issue, but it didn't matter because the armor looked nice. 
I soon entered the nucleus after a healing session, and my plan was to lure people to me and slowly pick them off. That proved to be a pain, mainly because of how Fallout 4's radiation works. It's not like 3 or Vegas, where it's a separate meter and you get status effects based on how much you have. Rads instead lowers your maximum health. In any standard firefight where you can heal normally, this isn't a problem, but in a firefight where enemies not only do damage but can also take away your healing ability, the children pose a legitimate threat. This is complicated by the fact that Rad Away can only do so much when the children can deal over 50 rads at a single shot, so sometimes your rads come back faster than you can get rid of them. Radix doesn't so much as increase your radiation resistance as it does delay the inevitable. You could have Rad Away on a constant IV drip and it will mean nothing to the crazy cultist with the cancer rifle and pinpoint accuracy. Speaking of accuracy, sometimes that isn't even needed considering the gamma guns some of them carry have shots the size of Alaska so they can aim in your general area and still hit you. They're incredible for trade, but annoying as heck to go up against with a flamer. After retreating to Far Harbor to rethink my strat, I traded what was left for some extra rat away and followed Pearl to the Cliff's Edge Hotel. This is the last time I will mention it here because the fact that I did a lot in there, died after stealing a water bottle, and forgot to save made me very upset. Shopping Episode 2 aired to little fanfare, and I went to Brookshead Lighthouse to finish the last of Cassie's quests. I learned here that with some quests, you don't have to clear the entire group, only a specific person. I tried to kill Douglas by blasting him through a staircase, but unfortunately, he had the same idea. It took a while, but I eventually got him and ran like heck to safety. For all of my troubles, she gave me her prized family heirloom. A Dirty Hook Got the self in my next video on Far Harbor. Kill Cassie immediately. The game was starting to glitch out and made it impossible for me to see out of windows, so I restarted the game just in case. I used what little Radaway was left to deal with the children while trying to retain my healing ability as much as possible. I tried to retreat, but they followed me outside and put me in a death loop. Thankfully, if you spam the Pip-Boy button on the loading screen, you can open it the second the game finishes loading your last save. I started to get rid of what stragglers were left in the open area, which was going very well right up until the spirit of Legit Lanius came back and started spamming Nuka grenades. Retreated it again to get ready. Came back to find the grenade guy, found the grenade guy, got rid of the grenade guy, and took damn near everything because there was no way I was leaving the nucleus empty-handed. I also found out that the bottom of the submarine is massively irradiated for the sake of being massively irradiated and having absolutely nothing else. Another wonderful world design decision from the team at Bethesda. Deeper in the base, I started dealing with the security system. Turrets, gutsies, protectrons, you name it. I ran into an assault tron, which is basically a jump scare at this point. I had to run, fight, and pray because I really did not want its face laser to so much as scrape me. Once turning on Dima's memory banks, I had to deal with the second one with the legitimate concern that I might run out of ammo, which thankfully did happen. Dima's memories are a thing you do as part of the Far Harbor DLC. I have nothing noteworthy to say about them other than the fact that they were something I did. After finishing with the memories, I found areas with super mutants, ran out of ammo, and died. I eventually got inside the hotel, which had the location for the launch key to the nukes inside the sub. The problem was I was mostly defenseless in a claustrophobic area crawling with super mutants. They kept cornering me in various places and their attacks nearly clipped me into the room with the launch key location. Once I successfully escaped, I went to the dock where it was located. There was a super deadly minor lurk there because why not? I got the key and then entered the nucleus for the final time. More children showed up to fight me and they failed. I bolted inside past the children in the sub, popped the key in, armed the nukes, and got the hell out of there as fast as I could. I stood back to watch the fireworks and leveled up, taking bloody mess which would have been good to have five recordings ago. Entered the regional soda building for the final time, dug up Avery's corpse, took her head and valuables, and left. Back in Acadia, Diva seemed upset that I destroyed the children of Adam. Listen, I know what he said. He knows what he said. But deep down I knew he wouldn't have wanted him to go about any other way. I told him I knew Avery was a synth, and he tried to get me to be quiet. I told Kasumi everything, and she gave me supplies I needed several hours ago. The town took their sweet time to get ready to talk about the nuke that went off on the other side of the island, and Brooks had the comedic timing of God himself. Please. A moment of silence. Big Chop's got everything you need. Thank you. After laughing for a good 10 minutes, Ellen paid me for getting rid of the children, and I woke up Avery from her nap to tell her she's a synth. She tried to deny the evidence that was right in front of her, and I told her to cry about it. I burned my last perk point, and told Dima I'd keep quiet after telling Avery everything. I told Kasumi it was finally time to come home, and said goodbye to the state of Maine, spelt M-A-I-N apparently. I saw the Nakano family reunion, finished the close-to-home quest, and picked up Grandpa Nakano's garbage. Since the quest was done, I wasn't technically breaking any more rules, so I pulled out a missile launcher, peeked into a window, fired one missile at Kasumi, and killed myself in the process. I might have blown myself to smithereens, but I beat Far Harbor with only a flamer.
Yeah, I don't think anyone saw this coming. If you told me back in September of 2021 that Pac-Man World was gonna get a remaster for current-gen systems, I would have laughed in your face. But apparently Bandai Namco thought it would be funny to throw a Pac-Man-shaped curveball at my video schedule. <laughs> Pac-Man World Repack was announced in June of 2022 and released on August 26th that same year internationally, with Japan getting it one day early, published by Bandai Namco and developed by Now Productions. I saw the reveal while I was at work, so I was tasked with holding back some excitement along with the five Pac-Man fans left alive. I was expecting to get to Pac-Man World 2 at minimum before this game ever got announced, let alone released. As a refresher, Pac-Man World was released in 1999 for the original PlayStation. It underwent some serious tomfoolery from its original inception, whose highlights include tank controls, a mass firing of the original staff, and the original version's cutscene apparently having been uploaded to YouTube one month prior to my video on the original game. Would have been nice to have that when I was making it. It was the subject of the second video I ever made for this channel. It's also the second video I ever made for this channel. For the love of God, don't watch it. It was from an era where I was still trying to figure out what I was doing. It's also from when I was still talking into the microphone from a rock band kit. You guys miss this audio quality? Because I certainly don't. As a refresher from my thoughts on the original, I thought the game still held up quite well, but was unbalanced in some areas. Despite some mild glitchiness, the game was a good challenge and fun to play. Besides, how can I trash a game whose antagonist sounds like Double D? It's so unfair! You ruined everything! But as we enter current year and pac becomes old enough to be someone's dad, it's time for him to revisit his 3D platformer roots, and that's what we'll be looking at today. Full disclosure, this video is based on the Nintendo Switch version of the game. Let's begin. I think the gameplay is the most important thing to discuss first. The short version is that this game looks like the original, but it doesn't play like the original. I didn't expect this game to be a one-to-one -one recreation as it was very obvious in the first trailer that this was not going to be the case. Starting with how Pac-Man feels to move, the very first thing I noticed was that he moved very quickly. The movement is still as snappy as it used to be, but his general movement speed is much quicker than before. Contrast with this footage in the PS1 game and you can see that Pac-Man's movement is visibly a bit slower, almost like a light jog of sorts when moving. If he was jogging in the original, he was sprinting in the remake. It took a little getting used to as throughout the game I always had the original in mind and that translated a lot to movement, leading to a lot of unneeded deaths. Never enough that I got a game over since, much like its predecessor, it hands out extra lives like candy. Once I got a full grasp on movement, it was a fun game to move around in. All of Pac-Man's attacks and moves to turn here, the rev roll is functionally the same, and the butt bounce has been tweaked just a little bit. The first few butt bounces have a brief pause in place before you go down, afterwards the bounce functions like the original with seamless movement. This threw me off the first few times, but not to the point of constantly screwing up. The chrome suit is back, same as before, but with a new twist added to it. Chrome enemies are a thing now. Some enemies you encounter will be fully chromed and can't be defeated without the chrome suit. I honestly don't have much to say about this since it didn't really seem to impact my playthrough one way or another. The chrome enemies were there, but that was about it. The power pellet sections have been altered and made somewhat easier. In the original, if you pick up a power pellet, it was on you to go after any ghosts in the area as is. This time around, Pac-Man gets huge, and depending on the location, some platforms spawn to prevent you from falling into a hazard. This gives you more wiggle room to eat all the ghosts and get the maximum score possible, as well as grab any fruit or dots that may be placed over a bottomless pit. And now we have what feels like a very needless addition, the Hang in the Air ability. This ability is new to Repack specifically and exists more for newer players who might not be very good at platformers as evidenced by the game's easy mode. Yes, not only does this game change a few things to make the platforming and collecting easier, we also have easy mode which increases the time in which this ability allows Pac-Man to do this Looney Tunes ass move where he runs in place in midair like a lethargic Yoshi trying to hover. <laughs> While I never used this move myself through the vast majority of the game, for players who feel they need an extra second of airtime to clear a gap, I can understand why it was put in. Coming back to speed though, it does feel like the levels have been tweaked to consider the speed change in their structure. I noticed some minor differences here and there. Like I said, I wasn't expecting anything to be one-to-one, -one, so the changes are nice and they don't feel like they stick out. If anything, the speed change is a big help to some of the slower levels from the original. I criticized Down the Tubes for being an absolute trog of a level due to its water segment, but with how the swimming has been altered in this game, it's nowhere near as bad and I didn't want to jump out the window playing it. It feels much better this time around and faster movement helps the segment out a lot better. 
Touching on swimming, in the original you had to use two buttons, one to swim downward and one to swim upward. You swam fairly slowly, which in some levels made water segments take quite a bit to get through. In this game you sink down to the bottom by default and have a faster movement speed, on top of only needing to press one button to swim to the surface. Some aspects in the platforming also feel like they've been tweaked, some items and sections being made easier to get to and the difficulty feeling like it was toned down in a few areas. One area I can point to in particular is this section where you get one of the Pac-Man letters in the space area. In the original game, you have this large pillar with a chest directly in front of it. It's designed to mess with new players coming to the level as the letter is just off screen and the only way to see it is if you got close enough. Now that same pillar has an extra block on the side so you're able to get to the letter no matter what. Shortly after that area, building on the change made to the power pellet, you got this big section with a narrow walkway which has some ghosts. Grab a power pellet, platform spawn, and you can basically steamroll everything for the most score possible. As far as fruit goes, nowadays it's permanently kept on you. Previously whenever you entered one of the fruit doors, the fruit would be removed from your person and not counted towards the slot machine at the end of each level. The amount of fruit that you had on hand whenever you finished a level would determine how many chances you get at the slots and made farming lives fairly easy. You could do the slots so long as you had fruit on hand and could leave whenever you wanted. The current version of the slot machine ignores fruit entirely. Fruit is counted towards your score at the end, but slots make the use of these tokens. Up to five tokens are scattered around each level and each one gives you a chance at the slot machine. There's a little chart which tells you how many lives each matchup is worth and I noticed aligning them was a little more difficult than before. The slots also have a new feature where on occasion you'll get this fruit bonus. This changes most if not all of the slots to two specific types of fruit and guarantees you extra lives. You pretty much have to go out of your way to miss it most of the time. I wasn't 100% sure what triggered it at first, and full honestly the first time I ran into this I wasn't paying attention to the TV and thought it was a glitch. From what I understand, if you die repeatedly, there's a better chance you can get this because I got this event a few times throughout my playthrough. It is very obviously not the same game and how it feels overall. It's simpler this time around, but some difficulty tweaks. The tweaks aren't any detriment to the game as a whole, and I never really got bored playing it. Pac-Man feels great to play with, and it felt like I was having just as much fun on the Switch as I was the PlayStation. Moving on from gameplay, let's discuss the game's story. As with the original game, it fills you in on its story with a cutscene. I won't go into picking apart every last detail like I'm a movie channel trying to figure out what Thanos was cooking, but I will highlight a few things, such as, who is this lady and what did she do with Miss Pac-Man? Well, fun fact, uh, Bandai Namco can't legally use Miss Pac-Man anymore. It's a whole complicated mess that surrounds the history of the character and her origin game. If you want a better breakdown of that, or for lack of a better word, cluster f and a good summary of why Miss Pac-Man doesn't really appear in anything new anymore, there's this really good video by another YouTuber, Joni, who goes into much further detail than I'm willing to go into right now. I'll link that in the description, you can get to that with the card on screen as well. It's the same general plot as the original game. It's Pac-Man's birthday and the ghosts kidnap every single member of the family thinking they're the real Pac-Man despite the fact that one of them is literally a dog. All the ghosts do some weird antics to kidnap each family member instead of each method being themed after the world they're kept in. Professor Pack, for instance, was located in the space-themed worlds and was abducted by aliens as a result. In the remake, they put drunk goggles on him. I'm not joking. It's extremely stupid. But I like it. He might have gotten lost in front of where he wanted to be, but the man fell over into unconsciousness through goggles that ruin your vision. Incredible. Then there's Pac-Boy, who basically dies. The original game had some voice acting, though there wasn't a lot of it. Most of it came from Takaman himself, with seldom input from the ghosts. The remake has more dialogue than the original, but no voice acting. Sort of. <laughs> There's spoken dialogue, but it's not dialogue. It's like The Sims, where they speak in gibberish, but there's subtitles. Every Pac-Man World game has some kind of voice acting in the cutscenes, so I find it a little odd they chose not to do it here. Not that this is a bad thing, voice acting isn't required through an entire game, the Pac-Man World games had it where it was needed, save for 3 where it was fully voice acted. It just feels like some of the character was a little lost, especially in someone like Talkman given how he acted back in the original, but without Talkman himself as portrayed in the remake, I don't think that not having voice acting is that much of an issue in regards to him. Let's talk about that big metal idiot for a bit. 
When you started a new game on PS1, there was two parts to the opening cutscene. One with Pac-Man leaving his house and finding out about the party on Ghost Island where he's supposedly appearing, and the second one with Talkman at the party criticizing everything and generally being salty as hell. In Repack, the first piece of this cutscene is moved to the intro with the new game cutscene taking place exclusively at the party. As for the party itself in the original game, it looked like everything was already going on and the crowd was significantly more dense. In the remake, it looks like the party is still being set up with Talkman wandering around criticizing everything. Honestly, it makes Talkman's complaints a little more justified as not everything has started yet. He's still being a whiny little bitch, but the whininess of his complaining is toned down significantly, whereas the original had him acting entitled as all hell. Here's the introduction of Talkman in both games. You idiots! I wanted gold streamers and red balloons! But DJ stinks, the banners are crooked, and the cake should be chocolate! You're gonna ruin my party! <laughs> The tone of the cutscene changes completely, and honestly, not having the voice acting isn't necessarily a bad thing here. In my honest opinion, the remake presents Talkman as a character much better than the original. Someone who wants Pac-Man's fame and glory, and absolutely nothing else. His presence in the game is much more pronounced than in the original as well. The original idea behind Talkman was to pose as Pac-Man and be loved and appreciated like he is. But Talkman never really made any game appearances outside of the cutscenes and his final boss. The times he did appear was somewhat cartoonish, especially towards the end. Look at how he speaks and acts in the cutscenes of the original. I thought you had captured Pac-Man! You idiots! My plans are already in motion! Oh, here I am! Love me! In Repack, he seems to be more grounded and serious, while also maintaining that aura of I'm Pac-Man and this is all about me, and that's reflected throughout the game. You are never not reminded of his presence at any point during the game. Every level of this game ends with you destroying a Talkman statue before finishing the level, and Talkman also appears at the beginning of every boss fight to introduce you to your upcoming opponent, rather than it happening just because video game. It feels like he is actively making an effort to try and stop you at every turn, and that's more than can be said about the original. Even in the intro cutscene we can see this. The flyers are getting dropped from a balloon that's in the shape of his head, and his stupid face is featured on the flyer. Image seems to be a huge thing for them this time around, and I'm all for it. I haven't even touched on his design yet, but I'll save that for the visual section. In general, I felt he was done very well, and I liked his implementation in this game much more than the original. But what about the other bosses? What are they doing these days? The bosses in the game are reimagined while still retaining their original ideas to some capacity. They're all pretty fun to play, I've gotta say, though I do have a few small criticisms. Let's go through each one, starting with HMS Windbag. Windbag's stage is mostly unchanged in the original version. The level opens with a side-scrolling section before moving to a switched-based battle system. The side-scrolling has been altered with more paths, with some riskier ones having more fruit to reward you with more points. He also has much more health now, requiring 10 hits across two segments to defeat. He has some new attack patterns, which I don't remember being in the original as well. He's still the same boss when you boil it down, and I honestly don't have anything new to say. If you played HMS Windbag in the original, you played HMS Windbag in the remake. Anubis Rex still retains the Mummy Chase segment from the original. It felt faster paced and had more variation in terms of obstacles. The addition of fruit to the areas also makes the collector in you want to grab them and essentially throw yourself into danger. I actually found myself taking a few hits during this part because I kept getting too close to the mummy thanks to this. As for the reason I drink, I found Anubis himself to be significantly toned down from his horrifically unbalanced PS1 counterpart. Which in that case... THANK GOD! The boss is still functionally similar at a base level, run on the Revro platforms to open his hands, and roll into the gemstone heart to deal damage. What's changed is that the platforms are no longer individual pillars, it's all one walkway that is gradually destroyed the further you progress. New attacks are introduced with each phase, just like before, but there's more variation on how it works. An enemy spawns in the center now, with dots spawning upon them being destroyed, so you have no chance to run out of dots while fighting. Anubis himself is a little more animated, slamming down onto the stages to bring meteors up while spitting them at you as well. The tornado attack returns and is functionally similar to the original, and the laser attack has been significantly nerfed, with the beam focusing on one individual area you were standing in, rather than sweeping the entire stage. I was honestly expecting some kind of challenge, and thank the lord that wasn't the case. Don't get me wrong, I still died a couple of times, but nowhere near to the extent I did back on the PS1. It's a nice breath of fresh air from the original boss, and I'm glad they took the time to balance things out the right way. 
King Galaxian is pretty much mostly the same. The unstoppable death laser exploit I mentioned in the original is now basically a mechanic. Instead of pressing each button to fire a shot, now you just hold one to fire a continuous stream. Grabbing a power pellet gives you a three-way spread shot, and it feels like they turned up the difficulty a little bit. It felt like there were more enemies and things to dodge in the first section. Galaxian himself is mostly the same in the sense that you have to destroy each eye, but a new segment was added where he uses a large tail-like turret that you have to destroy in between eye attacks in addition to the energy balls he shoots out at you. It's overall a good fight. One small criticism though, and this is nitpicky more than anything, but for some reason it didn't feel as satisfying as the original to beat this boss, I think it might have something to do with the eyes not having any clear indication of health. On top of that, you don't get any score at all for destroying any of the enemies. Ironically, it has less of an arcade -y feel than the original did, despite the segment being similar to Namco's old shoot-'em-ups from back in the day. All the score you get is from collecting fruit, and while it felt like there was more enemies in this version of the boss, it felt like they were just things that you got out of your way rather than something you can take down for additional points. This isn't a bad boss whatsoever. If you like shoot-'em-ups or bullet hell to an extent, you'd like this boss. But it didn't hit as hard as the original did. The music still does, though. Cloud Pre is... Well, it's Cloud Pre. Gone are the bumper cars that drive worse than the Fortnite shopping carts of 2018, and in comes a go-kart that actually feels pretty good to drive. Not the biggest fan of the first-person perspective, it reminds me of a similar mode in Mario Kart 7, but the race itself actually felt pretty good. You now have boost by default, and picking up a power pellet makes you invincible, allowing you to take out other racers. Falling off the track doesn't put you back to the start anymore, and instead places you near where you fell. It's treated more like a traditional kart racer this time around. It forgives you for making mistakes while still creating setbacks should you do so. It's also a lot more visually interesting. The world around you has a lot of nice set pieces and background elements instead of this void of nothing that surrounds the track. And when you win the race, everyone basically just dies while Pac-Man smiles with glee. Beautiful. Funnily enough, the biggest change in terms of bosses, in my opinion, comes from Chrome Keeper of all things. And I don't just mean visually. If anything, he looks more like Discount Iron Giant than he did before. This time around, you have a large open stage with conveyor belts of boxes and chests. These give you items like health, dots, and fruit. Your goal here is to grab a chrome suit, run up to him, and rev roll to deal damage. It's kind of like the Anubis Rex boss to an extent. The more damage you do, the more varied his attacks become. In fact, his attacks are much more varied in general. It's not as repetitive as the old version, and actually fairly challenging. I ended up dying quite a bit to this guy. He has extending arms which he fires at you, he can stomp on the ground to cause gears to fall from the ceiling, damage him enough he'll put rocket launchers on his shoulders to shoot at you with. After a certain point, more obstacles start spawning on the conveyor belts like these boxes that spit out steam, and his final phase has these laser cannons that sweep the stage. I wonder where they got that idea. I mean it when I say that this boss was a genuine challenge. I died here more than anywhere else. And trust me, when you have to start from the beginning each time you die, it gets pretty old. Luckily, I found out that if you're fast enough, you can land a second hit on the guy to progress a little bit faster. Moving on to the big man himself, the Talkman cutscene as Pac-Man show up in the party and instead of every single ghost running in fear from Talkman, they, they kinda just crowd around Pac-Man himself. This boss, like the others, is much more varied. In each phase, skeletons spawn which give you pack dots on being destroyed. Talkman will shoot at you and fly at you with his wings while you throw dots at him. On the second phase, he'll eat a chrome suit orb and your job is to evade his carpet bombing long enough to grab your own suit and deal damage. Returning from the original is his butt bounce attack, which goes out in waves, but is much slower than before. Phase 3 is also new to this game, where he'll eat a power pellet and become huge and start stomping around. Your goal now is to attack his boots to get him to fall over. He will do a rev roll attack just like before, but you have to be careful since you can't easily avoid it this time around. Knock him down and stomp on his head three times. Pac-Man will walk away and get smacked into the cake, which conveniently had a power pellet inside. He will eat, you mash a button, and the game ends. One thing that's common throughout every single one of these bosses is the emphasis on score. These boss levels are a lot more generous with fruit and dots throwing loads of them out with each completion. Most bosses have a phase change once you reach a certain point in the fight, there's a short cutscene of the boss getting ready to double down to try and take you out, and each boss gets introduced by Talkman proper as a nice little detail rather than the boss just starting. In terms of endings, we get two different ones depending on how many of Pac-Man's family members we rescued along the way. If you rescue some or none of the family along the way, you get the game's original ending. Little Ghost Guy vents about how nobody likes ghosts, Pekka whips out a power pellet, eats him in front of his own kind like some kind of psychopath.
In the remake, if you manage to rescue every single member of the family, you get a new cutscene of Pac-Man forgiving the ghost despite the fact that he kidnapped his entire family on his birthday. This ending is stupid. Both cutscenes end with the family being released, and everyone celebrating his birthday properly. At the very end of the game, we get an interactive credits sequence, which is nice to see. You get a big open maze to explore so you can collect letters that spell out thank you for playing, all to a new song about Pac-Man. A happy, energetic pop song, which... it sounds alright. <laughs> Melee created the soft spot for interactive credits for me, so this hits a lot of buttons in the right way. It's a fun way to wrap up the game. Let's talk visuals. I'm just gonna come out and say, this game looks beautiful, even on the Switch. Every single environment has been beautifully remade with new set pieces and backgrounds, and it all just looks absolutely fantastic. The enemies are given new makeovers, all given a modern look while still keeping in tune with their original versions. The mansion area in particular is my favorite. After playing the game twice over to get the, all the footage I needed, I have to say I like this area a lot more than any others in terms of visuals. The bosses and their new looks were applicable, all look great. Talkman in particular I like a lot this time around. He's a lot more lifelike in this incarnation compared to the crude machine from the original, still clearly villainous but more of an attempt at impersonating Pac-Man than before. Then there's the slot machine. I don't like the slot machine. It doesn't look bad or poorly made, but it doesn't feel as engaging as the original did. Now, I understand the changes made to the bonus screen from a gameplay perspective, considering the game has a heavier emphasis on score and the fruit mechanics being tweaked in general, and the whole thing being done by coins instead of, you know, the fruits and nuts that you picked up, but this doesn't feel like something goofy on Ghost Island. This looks like a gas pump. Speaking of Ghost Island though, the layout here feels like it makes a lot more sense and actually feels a lot more like an island compared to the original version. A PS1 Ghost Island was a side-scrolling hub world with each segment connected. The first three worlds are accessible and can be finished in any order before unlocking the next two, which need to be done before unlocking the final one, and it's the same case here. Instead of a side-scroller here, it's structured almost like a pyramid. The first three on the bottommost tier, the next two in the middle, and the mansion on top. As an unintended consequence, however, traveling between each section can be a bit of a trog, and I think the developers were aware of that while the game was being made, and this can apply to both games, especially if you're going back to catch anything you missed. So this time around, we actually have a little warp platform in each area. This allows you to blink to the section of the game that you want to go to. Speaking of each section, they're all still appropriately stylized about what their general theme is. The ruins look like ruins, the pirates look like a pirate town, the funhouse looks like the carnivals in town, the factory fits the setting, the mansion absolutely f and then there's the space area which honestly feels like a downgrade. The original had these multicolored rockets for each level and in repack it's... Uh, uh, hey, you like metal? This probably has more to do with the tile set used than anything, but a good chunk of this area is just sand and for the pirates and ruins areas it makes sense, but when looking at the funhouse and factory areas they're clearly defined and cover the entire section. Why not do that here? The sand and metal exteriors don't mesh at all. When viewing these same textures and models in the levels proper, they look fantastic, a massive step up from the original game's textures both in quality and aesthetic, but on a sandy beach by itself it doesn't work. Cover the whole floor with this junk, not just parts of it. Now for something very unique, resolution versus performance mode. In Repack, you have the option of experiencing the game in two different ways. Resolution mode, which locks the game at 1080p 30fps, and performance mode, which lowers the sharpness of the image ever so slightly, while still retaining a great looking image on a TV and bumping the frame rate up to 60. I played the game with the capture projected onto my main monitor, and it still looks great. In my original playthrough, I kept it in the 30fps mode as that was what I started recording in and wanted to keep it that way. I didn't want random FPS jumps in the gameplay footage for consistency reasons, but man, I was kicking myself for not turning on performance mode earlier when I finally did play the game with it turned on because look at how smooth this is. You never realize how smooth 60 FPS actually is until you've sat down and watched lower frame rates for a long time. If you have to play Repack on the Switch, turn on performance mode, you won't regret it. You'll lose some of that sharpness, and from what I've seen, you'll get some frame rate drops in busier areas, but the smoothness is extremely nice to experience for this game. That said, it isn't perfect. 
Keep in mind, performance mode is a software thing. I'm still running a launch era Nintendo Switch from 2017, and to say the Switch is aged, especially as of the time of making this video, is putting it lightly. Nintendo and weaker hardware go hand in hand, but even in performance mode, it shows during the more intense scenes with a lot going on. A good example is the introduction of King Galaxian. Regardless of the mode used, there is a very noticeable drop in frames when he does that roar of his. In resolution mode, it isn't as bad, but that's primarily because the game is limited to 30 FPS rather than 60. The drop in frames is still very jarring to see. All in all, it looks fantastic and tickles the brain in all the right ways seeing this game get the remake treatment, but for now, we need to talk about sound. For this section, all songs were recorded from their original hardware as described on the screen. I apologize in advance if anything sounds odd, as I've never done comparisons for music before in this manner. I will not be discussing every single track for the sake of time, but I will say that the music of this game sounds great. Every track has been beautifully remade with a couple new ones thrown in there to keep things interesting. My only small gripe is that while you can basically listen to the original soundtrack off the CD right away, you can only listen to Repack soundtrack to the DLC, which is pretty annoying. Yep, where in 1999 you can listen to your game's music for the price of buy the game, you need to fork over an extra three dollars to listen to Repack's music. This isn't a huge deal considering the game on its own was 40 at launch compared to the usual 60 and now unfortunately usual 70 tags, but come on, it's music. I know, people sell the soundtrack separately all the time, but it's not even a downloadable file. You have to be in the game to listen to it, and the same applies to the PC version as far as I can tell. Comparing the two games together is like digging crud out of your ears that was making things hard to hear. Here's a small sampler of songs back to back. This is an addendum late into editing. I originally wanted to gush about the music here, but after listening to them both multiple times late into the editing process, they honestly sound very similar. I want to say the repack versions are a little more clear or balanced or whatever the word is, but again, I'm not a big audio guy. Judge for yourself. I could take either soundtrack personally, both for nostalgic reasons, they both sound great in their own ways. In terms of volume, they took the time to actually make things sound normal this time. The main menu didn't destroy my ears, and neither did the hammers in the funhouse. Okay, we're good. I honestly don't have too much to say. There wasn't really anything I hated that much to talk about, and any criticisms I do have, I'm saving for later. And by later, I mean about half a second from when I finish this sentence. Time to throw my rose-colored glasses out the window and complain about a few things. I already gushed about the music earlier, and don't get me wrong, the game sounds great, but there were some moments where it felt like sound effects were quiet, not very impactful, or flat out missing. Contrast with the original game where it felt like some sounds were too damn loud, this game has the opposite problem where some things are too quiet. This is especially notable in the factory levels, specifically down the tubes. In the level you got these gears coming down and crashing from above and pretty much all of the noise, the factory is basically falling apart at the seams and the obstacles make noises to reflect that. You can see and hear this in the original version of the level. Contrast with the version in Repack, which I have not altered in any way. I'm no sound engineer. 
But if giant pieces of metal are falling from the sky, you need to make it sound like there's giant pieces of metal falling from the sky. This weird absence of sound effects is present in the game over screen of all things too. This is something I didn't bring up in my video on the original. If you run out of lives, you get a view of Talkman on the main menu screen laughing at you with his name slapped onto the game's logo. <laughs> It's his big hunk of metal sparking at you, and his laughter combined with the music is a nice touch. What do we get in the remake? That, the game over music, an animation of Talkman laughing at you that loops, but nothing else. His name kind of just appears over the logo. It's the same idea as the original, but not done as well in my honest opinion. It serves the same purpose, but... That's it. This is nitpicky, I know. But a little bit of sound goes a long way. Like, you already have this sound clip of him doing this evil laugh before every boss fight. Why not use it here? Here's a mock-up with some sound effects edited in to give you an idea of what I mean. Now this might just be me, but I felt like whenever I was underwater, I had a very hard time observing depth. In the original game, Pac-Man always had a solid shadow underneath him at all times. In a typical fashion for the era, Pac-Man himself was not a 3D model. He was a 2D sprite with 3D parts, so having the solid shadow underneath was the way to go here. Very low detail, but enough to get the point across. Since we're no longer limited by the technology of the era, we have a fully modeled pack with accurate shadows to match in the remake, barring some floating limbs. The original shadow not only gave you an idea of where you were in the general space of the level, but it also helped you navigate around hazards present underwater, be it a hazard built into the geometry of the level itself, or an enemy that happens to be swimming in the same body of water. This made some water segments a lot easier to navigate and much easier to avoid enemies in. Coming back to Down to Tubes, which had sharks swimming around, once you figured out where in space the sharks actually were, you could hug a part of the level that they never touched and navigate through with no issues if you didn't have the chrome suit. In Repack, Pac-Man still has the shadow, but it's somewhat low detail. Granted, the Switch is also fairly old hardware by this point, so something like a lower detail shadow is expected, and from what I can see, the shadow is consistent across all console versions. But underwater, there's no shadow whatsoever. I tried to see if this was an issue isolated to the Switch version, but I looked up some gameplay of the PS5 version and the same issue appears to be present. You can clearly see a lack of shadow underneath him while he's in the water. In terms of 100%ing, this time around I was actually able to beat this game front to back unlike the original. Though in terms of extra content for going through all the effort in doing so, unfortunately there's not that much this time around. I will restate a point I made in the original game's video that the things given to you in the original game for beating certain milestones were cool in an era with limited internet access, and my point still stands. I don't think anyone's gonna go bonkers for including concept art in a game these days as finding stuff like that is extremely easy to find nowadays, though it is still a neat thing to have out of the box. Same goes for the little blooper reel I didn't bring up in the original. It's fun, it's cute, but I can take it or leave it. Requirements wise, you need to finish the story mode, save every member of the pack family, complete every single maze, including marathon mode, access every bonus level in every stage, and get a total score of 765,000 points. Beating the game unlocks the original arcade game, while accessible right away in the original, it serves as a nice little reward for beating the game at least once. Much like before, it's simple, no-nonsense arcade Pac-Man. Nothing else to really say. I will say beating marathon mode was a bit of a letdown because you don't really get anything out of it. I know I just said that not having the gallery wasn't a huge issue, but the original was open about the fact that finishing it let you access it. It gave you motivation to actually attempt it back on the PS1. Here, it's just achievement collecting and getting 100%. There's no achievement system baked into the Switch, so it's pretty much just there for the challenge and getting 100%. I felt like I got left hanging when I blinked back to Ghost Island like nothing happened after finishing the final maze. Hell, even a congratulations pop-up would have been nice at the very least. As for getting 765k, apparently this is actually lowered from the original, which had that requirement set to 1 million points, and the reward is the same between both versions of the game in the form of the Magic Key, which allows you to open all fruit doors in the game without collecting the necessary fruit required to open them. However, if you were me, this is the last thing you did to 100% the save, so by that point, it was completely redundant. And with that said, that is everything in Pac-Man World Repack. 
To summarize how I feel about the remake, overall I'd say I have a positive opinion of it. It's very nice to see this game get revisited after so many years, especially since Pac-Man World games haven't been touched in any capacity since World 3 back in the GameCube PS2 days. The last new 3D Pac-Man platformer was Ghostly Adventures 2 in 2014, and while I can't speak for the quality of that game as I've never played it, it's nice to see the classic games get some love after so long. The original was fun, in spite of its rough edges, and while this game smooths out that roughness, it does bring a couple hiccups of its own. I love both versions of this game for different reasons, and I can happily take both any day of the week. They're both fun in their own ways, and depending on the experience I want, I'll go back to the version I choose. I like this game, and while I understand that this game is now inching closer to being out for a year, I hope that it did well enough to encourage a look into the other Pac-Man World games as well. I don't remember liking World 2 as much, and World 3 was weird, but fun. And I'd like to see a modern take on both of those games someday. I can't predict the future, but hey, maybe we'll see a remake of 2 someday. One day I woke up and thought to myself, hey, I haven't played Stalker in a while, maybe I can make a video out of it. I thought it would be fun to try to beat the game with a pistol, and it went with the first pistol I got my hands on. The Makarov pistol, called the PMM in the game. A Soviet-designed handgun chambered in 9x18mm, first introduced in 1951. Small, reliable, and the source of my frustration for about three weeks. When I say with only a pistol, I really mean only the first pistol. Meaning that the very first handgun I get a hold of is my workhorse for the rest of the game, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I just have to deal with it no matter how bad it gets. If I kill someone with literally any other weapon, the run is forfeit. This is no different than any other weapon run. I've done a few of them in Fallout. If you've been here before, you know how this goes. If this is your first time here, beat the game as intended by the devs. I could do whatever I wish, however I wish, provided I follow the game in the logical intended order and on the hardest available difficulty. You may have noticed the death counter featured in the corner there. That's a special treat for those of you who like a visual representation of agony, because I'm going to come out and say it right now. I wouldn't wish this on anyone else, and I genuinely mean that. Normally I would come out of something this stupid, unscathed, or feeling pretty good. I felt like that image of Ryan Gosling in Blade Runner where he looks like this. This is the face I made looking at the credits. Buckle the fuck up. Like any good story, we start with a car accident caused by a lightning strike where the power of convenience allows us to be the only survivor. The next day, I forget to set the audio output in OBS correctly while a man finds my body and brings him to the man eating the only turkey leg in the entire zone. They find my tramp stamp, and the game begins. At this time, I only have one goal, kill Strelok. No clue who that is, as I currently have amnesia. I'm quickly retaught how to use my PDA, and I'm told to find a flash drive belonging to someone called Nimble and to speak to Wolf outside. Thankfully, unlike the runs of yore, we don't have to go very far to get our weapon. Speaking to Wolf gets us a PMM handgun in perfect condition with a few magazines worth of bullets. I then started to tear the area up and down to search for any extra supplies, managing to find my first artifact in the process. Stone blood, which regenerates health but reduces my ability to take bullets. My current strategy is similar to my Fallout runs where I make use of things important to me while everything else is barter material, though this is only going to get me so far. By the end of my looting adventures, I had over 100 rounds of 9x18M. Wandered out of town to meet a man called Petrua, and was told about bandits located inside of a car park. To properly test my skill, I offered to go in there myself. My logic here was that since this was going to be my workhorse for the entire game, I felt that testing my current skills would be a good idea. 
An important thing to note about Stalker is that it doesn't 100% work like other shooters. Just because you're aiming down sights doesn't guarantee you're going to hit that spot, be it aiming with a pistol or dumping the entire magazine of an AK-47. The durability system affects accuracy, and weapons worse for wear are going to perform worse more often than not. As my weapon is currently factory fresh, this isn't a massive issue. Early fights aren't a pain in the ass, and the weapon itself is fairly accurate. The fighting continued as I tried to aim carefully for headshots in an effort to save ammo. On paper, 100 rounds sounds like a lot, but if you're familiar with any shooter game or just firearms in general, 100 rounds is basically nothing. This pistol has an 8 round magazine and in a game where your shot can deviate ever so slightly from where you are aiming and throw up your shot, aiming carefully counts. Headshots can deal good damage and occasionally provide an insta-kill, but center mass is better for a sure hit early on, but won't deal nearly as much. This isn't a big concern as we're just fighting bandits right now, but uh, don't worry, the concern can and will get bigger. During the fight, I goofed it and died for the first time. I spent a good long while trying various tactics and ways of approaching the car park with varying degrees of success before finding finally being successful. I found some medkits, gave the flash drive to the trader, tried to do some shopping while he explained my thoughts perfectly, what is this shit, and topped it all off with reloading my save for a reason I have yet to understand. I unfortunately spent a good chunk of my time repeating the exact same section I already finished because I misclicked a key, I made Petruro do a backflip out of frustration, and made sure to save the fight properly 12 failures in. Gave the flash drive to the trader again, bought some medkits, and made sure not to accidentally sell my gun. Got bonus loot from Wolf along with some jobs and a new artifact. Jellyfish. Sadly, jellyfish is radioactive, so it does far more harm than good right now and is currently useless. As I wandered towards the boar lair, I found some military men walking nearby. This mere sighting was an omen. It was going to spell precisely how the rest of this playthrough was going to work out because I decided to engage them in a firefight, which angered the entire base in the same general area. I made some attempt to pick them off with my pistol, results of which being very predictable, and I started trying to move between trees for cover and maintain distance. I even climbed inside of a tree, which actually managed to work for a little bit. I eventually managed to run back where I started and back into the safe loving arms of the trader. As I traded my loot, I bought 9x18 plus P ammo, which would be instrumental in how I worked throughout this game. One small issue, though. The unmistakable sound of gunfire. The military followed me back here. As I deal with this, allow me to explain what makes plus P ammo so damn important. Ammo types are an important thing to take into consideration while playing this game depending on the situation. You generally want to use the ammo type you'll need depending on who you are fighting, and in my case, I only get two flavors of bullet. 9x18mm and 9x18mm plus P. In the context of Shadow of Chernobyl, these are two ammo types found between the early game and early portions of the mid-game, i.e. anywhere from the bar back. Standard 9x18 rounds are about as common as dirt and are found on most stalkers, just about all bandits, and are extremely easy to find in general. Plus P, on the other hand, is a different story. It's only found in specific caches and can only be bought from traders. Namely, the trader in Cordon and Barkeep in the bar, more so the former than the latter. Plus P ammo, according to the game's description, has a slightly improved armor piercing effect in contrast to its cheaper and more common cousin, which, keep in mind, is a fairly weak bullet as it is. The gun I am using, the PMM, is also the weakest handgun in the game. Plus P rounds are able to do just under twice as much damage compared to standard rounds, barring any loss of damage due to resistances of course. This is crucial to know as better armored targets will eventually come into play, see the current military attack going on. So having ammo that not only does more damage but has armor piercing potential is good to have. Also, just to rub salt in the wound and clarify how weak this weapon caliber combo is in the grand scheme of things, not including the suppressed equivalent of the PMM, every other weapon that can use this caliber does more damage. By one. It is a good starter weapon, and nothing more. It is the bare minimum weapon you can have in the game before you find literally anything else. By the time you get to garbage, you would probably have already picked up a 4, a 12, or a Walker P9. Anywhere past that, and you're probably running around with one of the weapons chambered in 45 ACP. Before you even get within walking distance of the Red Forest, let alone the power plant, you can find Big Ben, a Desert Eagle variant chambered in 9x39mm a rifle caliber, and a pistol, which is capable of more damage than both of the stock rifle variants said caliber is intended for. 
If you're at the front door of the sarcophagus and you're still using any of the 9mm pistols, you are an idiot. Or you're me. As time passed and deaths piled up, the military were eventually dealt with and I made a failsafe save, just in case. I exploded in a tunnel and tried to fight more military men that happened to be nearby. While there was plenty more cover in this area, I was still one guy going up against several men with AKs, so these conditions were less than ideal. When my deaths pushed into the 50s, I gave up and just ran past them, pooped myself in a nearby building, spoke to Fox for info on Strelok as he got mauled by dogs, and finally made it to garbage. A guy started to mag dump me and missed every single shot. After facing his buddies, I backflipped them into the next life and dropped dead. I began the battle against spawn camping bandits while back and forthing between garbage and cordon. I just want to remind everyone that we're at 56 deaths and this is the second recording of 13. I died so hard during the scuffle I was asked to go back to Corden. Politely said no and eventually won the battle with the help of some friendly NPCs so I can collect the supplies left behind. Further into the territory, I got a radio call from a man called Bess. More bandits are coming and he needs help. I took cover behind a truck and bandits were taken down with little effort. Bess gave me cash and lore for my help and my current goal was to find another man called Sieri. Some fine folks were kind enough to put a few bullets in my chest, and I found a suppressor that was useless to me. I was hiding inside another truck around here, and bandits kept walking in front of the opening looking for me. They let me land easy headshots, and every time I took one out, another one took their place. It was honestly kind of funny. At this time, I was more focused on my inventory space rather than my weapon condition. It was still pretty early, and I was trying to carry higher value items for better trade value and to balance weight. I found a new artifact, Meat Chunk, which has a better healing ability than Stone Blood with identical drawbacks. I got irradiated and found another cry for help. More bandits were harassing a group of stalkers at some train station and needed assistance. The pistol was starting to show some problems at longer ranges, and this was only the start. It's all downhill from here, and you'll see why. I died fighting bandits outside of the station. Turns out having a concrete pipe as your only cover isn't good. I eventually saved Sieri and got info on Strelok's group stash, along with being told to head west where a man called Mole would have more information for me. Upon entering the adjacent area, a stranger told me to follow him as the military were pinning down some of his friends. And thus began my next headache of a battle. While there is plenty of cover here and new explosives to shoot at, I'm still fighting against armored men with rifles. The bright side to this is that newer AK variants were spawning, meaning I can drop the older ones without feeling like I'm wasting them. As I gained more ground and climbed up a building, I died so hard the camera left reality. Explosive barrels did only so much in the grand scheme of things since hitting them with a pistol is a challenge within itself. Got back on the roof of the building, went inside for cover, took out the last military man, and met Mole. He gave me an earful and showed me his hole. Five things were down here. Bandits, SMGs, shotguns, me, and 409mm bullets. Lovely. This area is dark as hell with limited cover, so not only do you have limited places to hide, it's also hard to see. I hit my first funny number in terms of depths, but that only lasted so long. The flashlight is good enough, but only does so much in an area like this. You do have night vision as an option, however I only learned about it recording this run, and even then I didn't really learn about it until much later. My current situation at this point was two men in a dark hallway who could come out and kill me whenever. After spending a healthy amount of time getting them both, I made the naive belief that I was safe, and while searching the area for loot, some military jackass came out of nowhere and domed me. I sat on that game over screen in absolute disbelief over what just happened, did the entire fight all over again, looked for the guy, and predictably he wasn't there. What did I find though? My first bloodsucker, which ended me quickly. I snuck back upstairs to get more ammo, tried to take a shortcut protected by the might of Zeus, I dipped. Spoke to Mole, did some trading, and wandered off to the local military base to get some documents. Easier said than done considering the piece shorter, but hey, let's try it! I started to poke the bear by taking some pot shots at the sniper towers, which was enough to trip their alarms. I used the local trees as cover where possible, and slowly pushed to the base while my massive supply of bandages slowed the inevitable. Once inside, I repeatedly got a face full of the Ukrainian military. I pushed inside while fighting and searching for documents, eventually found them in the back of a large building, and I had to fight my way back out. I got into a game of chicken with one guy who kept landing kills on me. That's basically what this whole run is to be honest, a long, tedious game of chicken. Go to the base while the alarm made me go deaf, and I started to waddle off to god knows where. After dying repeatedly a handful of times, I decided I needed to refocus my goals. I put a quest marker that took me to the bar, and went into the f***ing tunnels again. While down there, I got what was probably one of the most important artifacts I could find in my opinion. 
Sparkler, which boosts your endurance by 36. This increases your stamina regeneration rate, which is super helpful when carrying more than 50 kilograms. I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bloodsuckers again and realized they run away when you go into a certain room, marking another one of many cheese attempts in order to proceed. During the battle, I found Urchin, an artifact that reduces radiation but prolongs bleeding, very useful when combined with any healing or radioactive artifacts. Gunfire that didn't come from me started to fill the room, and guess who came back for revenge? And at a time when weapon jams were starting to become much more common. That's a good combo of things to happen, and don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. Ignore that rising death counter, it's just an illusion. Unlike the scratching noises you hear in the walls at night, those are real. You should move. After dealing with the finest men the country has to offer, I found some more artifacts. Notably, Flash and Moonlight. Improvements on Sparkler, which, when combined, make sprinting practically infinite when below the carry limit. I got shot at while climbing the worst stairs ever made, and made a new friend. <laughs> The Controller, a humanoid capable of killing you with psychic powers, to which he actually did at least one time. Upon a successful escape, I found myself back in the goddamn military base. I fled to garbage, found out the bandits respawned, and realized my PMM was at two-thirds of its full condition. Coupled with being dangerously low on ammo, I needed to do some shopping. I tried to take a shortcut, but Adam remembered my antics back in Maine and wouldn't let me. Slipped into duty territory only to be immediately eaten by dogs, spoke to the barkeep who promised me work and told me to go to the X-18 lab to the west. While he had 9x18 ammo, he didn't have any plus P rounds, but he did give me the stalker suit, a nice step up for my current jacket. Explored the region, felt the cancer between my toes, and entered the dark valley. After helping with an ambush and learning about night vision by accident, I needed to get a key from the lab from a man called Bora, but not before falling into a hole and dying instantly. The constant waves of bandits here were not helped by the fact that my weapon was now having issues at shorter ranges. I found a man called Shaggy, freed him, and watched him die. Witnessed the teabagging world champion and found tons of loot in a nearby room complete with 34 bottles of vodka that I proceeded to drink and subsequently blow myself up. Exploring continued once my liver finished rebooting, splattered Borov's head into the wall behind him, took his keys, and waddled back to the bar to get mauled by dogs again. Here was where I started to experiment with the traders. I wanted to see if exiting and entering an area would reset the inventory, which, to my surprise, it did. I bought ammo at the bar and went back to Corden to get some plus P. I got executed by the military, bought my bullets, and then went to fight the nearby military base for reasons I genuinely cannot remember. Highlights of this adventure include the discovery of the Ring Around the Rosie tactic, the deadliest game of peekaboo ever, dumping an AK mag into a radio and being punished for blasphemy, and this TV that I proceeded to break. Back in safety, I found out that not only do traders reset when you enter a new area, they reset whenever you load the game. Naturally, I did what any reasonable person would do, and abused the ever-living hell out of this to get as much ammo and medkits as I could afford or carry. By the end of this stunt, I had over 40 medkits and a 60-40 split of 9x18 and 9x18 plus P, totaling over 2,700 rounds of ammo. The road to X-18 was full of adversaries, and my pistol was half broken. Bear in mind we aren't even at the halfway point yet. After being eaten by dogs for the third time, I found myself in this lab, and this is where I felt like treating the area like a horror game. Lights off, headphones on. As a result, my first encounter with Snorks scared the crap out of me. They almost got me, but were manageable. It was also here where the weapon condition indicator first appeared. Now you're probably thinking, hey dumbass, why don't you find a way to fix your gun? Unfortunately, as you can tell from my various exploits, Shadow of Chernobyl was programmed on 26 onions and a car battery hooked up to a CRT monitor. We weren't quite at repairable weapons yet. So the only option I have is to replace the gun, but the run demands I use this rotting potato of a weapon. The devil himself can explode out of the elephant's foot at the end of the game, and I still have to deal with a weapon that misses at point blank. Anyway, I got the code to the first door, some ghosts kept throwing shit at me, this door put pee in my pants, and I discovered the pseudo-giant. Being near the thing was as terrifying as it was. Trying to shoot it was a task and a half since I couldn't really see. I eventually took it down and got a look at the face that makes Flamio Hotman look beautiful by comparison, got the second code, saved the game when the screen turned red, and got locked in a room with a weird fire ghost. I picked up the divorce papers and had absolutely no goddamn idea what to do next. 
ended up finding a walkthrough and shooting the fireball, and passing out when my liver shut down again. Got a cutscene showing the power plant, my glitchy ass, and every rat in the country running towards me. And because this is a challenge run video and nothing is ever allowed to be simple, the military came by as soon as I came out of my coma. Shots were starting to miss more often than not, aiming down sights was becoming irrelevant. This is also the point that military men started to spawn with 9x19mm ammo instead of 9x18. This is the standard 9mm parabellum round everyone knows and loves. If this were an all pistols run, this wouldn't be a problem, but it's not, so I'm out of luck. I chased the f out of the trader for a reason. I finally made it to the surface to find out the road to garbage has been closed off by the military, but the cordon trader was kind enough to give me directions to a back road I can take. A bridge made my skin feel funny as I got Kennedy'd into a previous save. The trader congratulated my survival and sent me puppies as a thank you gift, fought the car park bandits again, and gave the trader the papers I found. I now have to take a trip to the bar, speaking to the barkeep who told me about this big stupid thing called the brain scorcher near Pripyat. Unfortunately, going near it right now is not an option. I need protective gear. Got some armor, got some lore, there was no hint on the map, and I pointed myself to X-16. The least covert bandits ever started shooting at me after saying they would on a public radio channel. Once again, they have rifles and I don't. First set done, second set comes in. I now have to save some scientists from some local mercs. This spot has open areas and the parts that do have cover are a maze of nonsense. The tunnel was full of pain, the Half-Life reference reminded me I should stream again soon, and I tried to escort this guy to safety. If my memory is correct, I was so useless it was easier to let him die and move on. Battled mercs, got fresh pants, the snorks are here again, and there's a tunnel full of fire. I killed one snork, did my best impression of Chicken Kiev, and ran into my first zombies. The first one I knocked down was having way too much fun. Outside of the scientist's bunker, I died. As a reminder of how much I suck, watch this. That was the whole magazine. Inside the bunker, I talk to the professor. He has some Psy armor prototype he can give me, but I need to help him with his research first. I followed his assistant to measure radiation. The Mario pipe of doom was full of zombies, and he died. As did I. This broke 200 deaths as the choke point on the pipe exit made us easy targets. Every death made the game's Mexico filter grow stronger, and finally on the other side, we took measurements, got shaken like a can of soda, and had the Saturday night tradition of blacking out and waking up in a bus. When to give my measurements to the professor, the assistant wouldn't f***ing move, got the prototype from the professor, and he told me that another scientist was chilling out near a crashed helicopter. I had the urge to buy a shotgun, even though using it would invalidate the run. Remembering Black Mesa, it felt like it would be nice to have one in all honesty. No. The Mexico filter followed me to the helicopter as it felt like hip firing landed more hits than aiming, except I didn't go to the helicopter. I decided to wander around the zone for a good long while. I think I was looting, I don't remember. Halfway to the bar I had to play ring around the crashed helicopter. All dogs go to heaven but at least one gets to come back. Speaking of which, I ran to presumably the families of every dog I killed up to this point because this was the biggest pack I had seen up until now. Tried to record the guy playing guitar in duty territory but people kept ruining the shot. I killed the guy for that, reloaded the wrong save, pet the puppies again, and tried to sell my nearly non-existent gun. This is another section of recording where it's me just doing random things with nothing of note. The highlights include getting turned into cheese, a stalker called Smartass, one particular fight that just kept going on and on and wouldn't stop, the discovery of landmines, meeting freedom, stealing all their Chef Boyardee, a cutscene that was apparently supposed to play near the crash scientists being triggered, bloodsucker jump scare, and me discovering my vision improves if I stand in radiation. My trek to the X-16 lab was met with zombies, and I think this was where note-taking Max was starting to put less effort into these notes because I wrote, and I quote, I have a pistol that misses the side of a barn from point blank. I can only repeat pistol versus rifle so many times before I throw up. Progress was slow as slow can possibly be. I hid inside what I think was a crane, lost my progress, died hard enough to get stuck in a wall, the state of Mexico had taken over the zone, but at least I was able to see. Finally inside this stupid lab, I had to shut off the emissions. This started off great when I broke my legs and back. In an open area with snorks and zombies, I was cowering inside of a bathroom trying to take pot shots at them as they got closer to me with time. Got into another firefight with more zombies only to find the door shut behind me. The additional snorks up ahead were far more annoying than usual. Please note the amount of time left in the video because it's about to get ridiculous. Seasoned stalker players probably already know what's coming. 
but I'll keep my mouth shut until we get there. I was practically throwing ammo around like confetti, making me glad I stocked up as much as I did. I was finally met with this big tower and staircases, and now I had to actually shut the machine off. By this point, I don't have to tell you what open areas are for me. There's a timer for the Psy Armor's resistance, but it doesn't cover every single spot in the area, and entering certain sections stops it and allows it to reset. However, being able to cheese the timer isn't helped by having to rely on RNG to pray for the chance that your gun might land a hit. I got jump scared by a fire anomaly. I tried to shut off the machine at the top only to realize I missed the switches on my way up. I continued to walk into fire anomalies, feeling like that bit from The Simpsons with Sideshow Bob walking into rakes. I got one more cutscene. I, I don't care enough at this point to tell you what happened. I have to find Ghost. His body is being guarded by a controller. Luckily, I have my tinfoil hat and I can give him high speed lead poisoning. I borrowed Ghost's shirt since he wasn't using it right now, and went down to meet the Ninja Turtles in the sewer. Except instead of turtles, it was more zombies, storks, and a pseudo-giant. Funnily enough, the enclosed space made dealing with them easier in this case. I was past the sub-thousand rounds mark by the time I got out. When I was last at the bunker, I had over 1700. Spoke to the professor one last time, and realized I made a mistake. Like, a very, very big mistake. Stalker is very particular about how you proceed through the game. If you deviate even a little bit from the intended path, things can break. At the beginning of this video, my only condition was to get the game's true ending. To get this ending, you need to do the story in a very specific order. Namely, you have to access Strelok's group stash before finishing the X-16 lab. Failing to do this will not let you speak to Guide, someone you need to talk to to get to the quest that puts you on the path to said ending. This is the ninth recording in terms of my notes, and most of it was spent wandering around the zone confused as ever, wondering why the specific guy I need to speak to isn't there. I even went to the spot he was meant to be with no luck. For all intents and purposes, I'm softlocked. Thankfully, it uh, wasn't the end of the world, thanks to a community poll I made back in December of last year. On that post, I mentioned unspecified runs in the Stalker games as an idea, and one commenter said this. If you do a Stalker game, and you find the guys at a campfire playing a somber song on guitar, please post the recording. I only heard it once and want to hear it again. Couldn't find it. I made a separate save specifically to look for this song. I couldn't find anything that sounded somber, but having that basically saved me loads of time. After reloading back to the music searching save, I hoofed it back to Corden as fast as possible, making sure nothing stood in my way. Shopped until I was carrying nearly 3,000 rounds of plus P ammo, and hauled myself back to the App Program Research Institute to get Sherlock's group stash. The Blood Moon rose once again and respawned every single bandit down there. My corpse vanished, finally found the stash, found the info about Strelok which told me to find ghosts, learned that the controller can disable your keyboard, and did the long, painful, not to mention annoying, journey of doing X16 in all related areas all over again. I'm sure watching me struggle through this sucks, but think of it like this. You're not the one playing it. And you are most definitely not the one who had to rewatch all 27 hours of footage to mark each and every single time you died. I stopped taking actual notes by this point because it was Saturday the 13th and I had two hard ciders in my system. Left the lab with a hilarious 387 deaths, finally got the quest notification, and made my way to Corden as fast as humanly possible. At the bar, I saw the barkeep selling an exoskeleton for 200,000 rubles. I'm currently holding 15, no way am I going to preppy out without it. In garbage, I stalked a military patrol for their loot, which ended in disaster. I met the guy called Guide who told me to meet Doctor in Strelok's hiding place. My battles with the military saw no end, I briefly debated buying a fresh handgun, and the game crashed while I was in garbage. In Agro Crag, the bandits kept spawning around where I needed to be. The underground bandits didn't spawn this time, blew up at the stash, and Doc pulled me to safety. He proceeded to tell me Santa wasn't real and that his workshop was inside the power plant, but I needed a decoder to get inside. Said decoder is somewhere in Pripyat, but before I even get to Pripyat, I need to get my exoskeleton. The remainder of this recording is looting and shooting and is largely uneventful. My next stop was the Red Forest. In the real world, the Red Forest is one of the most contaminated areas on Earth, receiving the most radiation from the Chernobyl disaster. And the context of the game, on top of being the proper introduction to Monolith, is somewhat of a hellhole to get through. There's very few stops, not much cover, mostly roads, and any radiation present here is extremely concentrated, to the point where having anti-radiation medication is mandatory. Artifacts delay the inevitable and won't work fast enough to remove the radiation before it kills you. Oh, by the way, guess what else is here too? 
Speaking of distance picks, that was near impossible where I was. It didn't matter where I aimed, my shots would go pretty much anywhere else. In between a few rocks, shooting at Monolith wasn't easy, much less at the sniper in a nearby truck. Luckily, the kill and save tactic really shined here, but my tracks got stopped fairly quick. Nearing up to a very long pathway, I got served to death 424 in the form of an RPG. Deeper into the area was just a very long road with lots of monolith and radiation. Long story short, nothing has changed. The Brain Scorcher was problematic because my weak ass kept dying, but I kept pushing closer and closer to the Brain Scorcher with time. The effects on my surroundings were so bad I could barely hear what was going on around me anymore. A group of monolith tried to Donkey Kong me out of existence, found out barrels tend to explode, I was hallucinating now, and with enough time and what little patience I had left, I found myself at the doorstep of the Brain Scorcher. Next question was where in the name of all that is holy was I supposed to go? Critical Psy emissions meant death unless I could figure out where to go. I wandered the area like a headless chicken hoping to find something somewhere right up until I found a path through a train which gave me a problem in the form of narrow hallways. In a normal playthrough, this isn't so bad, but this is not a normal playthrough. I'm in a bunker with more mutants now. The first area was dark as heck with minimal activity, barring the moment I fell into a hole full of fire. It was actually kind of nerve-wracking to walk around. The only real enemies I found were some bloodsuckers wandering around. With less than a thousand rounds, aiming carefully was crucial, but my pistol could hit the floor while aimed at the wall. The deeper I went, the creepier it got, and I kept looking for supplies, and while some were there, they weren't very useful. At the deepest point, I found a control panel and shut off the Brain Scorcher. A cutscene showed me the Wish Granter, among other things, and I had one final task. Sneak into the sarcophagus. But for now, I had to enter the meat grinder. The monolith soldiers are in the bunker. A casual walk outside was about to turn into an agonizing crawl back out. Death, 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 and more death. This section can only be passed with a combination of luck and prayer. Even with plus P rounds, my weapon isn't worth its weight in crap. People I skipped kept showing up behind me, the camera ended up in the back rooms, and I eventually found myself with less than 300 rounds on my person, giving me the legitimate worry that I might actually run out of ammo here. I got no-scoped through a giant metal box, made it back to the room with the first bloodsuckers, and with enough blood, sweat, and tears, I finally got some fresh goddamn air. I parkoured through a sniper nest to save some time, and since I barely had over 150 rounds by the time I got outside, I decided to go shopping. Back in safe territory, I was still 100,000 rubles short to get the exoskeleton. Most of my 12th recording is wandering around and looking for loot and collecting from caches, as well as doing quests and generally just trying to get as much money as physically possible. At least two quests broke during this time because I didn't do them correctly, leaving me unable to get any money from them. Some military guy also spawned beyond the edge of the map, so that was a fun time. And after looting for three agonizing hours, I had enough to buy the exoskeleton, and the end of the game can finally begin. This behemoth of a suit is extremely tough, but removes your ability to sprint. However, you also have a carry capacity of 70 kilograms, which is pretty nice. That carry weight is irrelevant to me because my next goal is the end of the game, provided my suit wasn't totally destroyed by wild dogs. 1500 bullets, 591 deaths, and I finally managed to set foot inside the town of Pripyat. I ignored the stalkers nearby and started pushing towards the secret stash containing the decoder I needed inside the power plant. I didn't fight unless I absolutely had to, ignoring everyone that tried to shoot me. Anomalies couldn't even do much to me right now. In a parking garage, there was an attempt to fight that was short-lived. Inside the building I needed to be, I searched for the room with the stash, found it, collected my spoils, and began to move my fat ass to the CNPP. The outside of the plant is a literal war zone. In my original playthrough years ago, this section gave me a very tough time. Strategy was the same though. Quick save when safe, try to fight if I can. A conveniently placed explosion let me through a fence, I tried to ignore the warfare around me, and got blasted by an RPG. Strategy number two was to hug the walls of the power plant and fight back when necessary. This area was less painful than the runs past, but I still had to deal with the RPG guy who had his aimbot turned on. The blowout timer suddenly showed up as I walked into an anomaly and died. Out of morbid curiosity, I decided to wait out the timer to see what happens. The sky turned cherry red and all kinds of things were happening in the sky. The end result was a black and white screen with loads of radiation. It was honestly kind of underwhelming. With the entrance to the sarcophagus finally in reach, I walked to the gate, ready to walk inside, and got exploded by a helicopter. I timed my entrance again, and finally made it inside the power plant. What I would experience from this point forward can only be described as going through a hell. I have joked about certain aspects of runs being like going through hell before, everything that happened from this point forward to the end of the game does not compare. I had an easier time beating Super Mario Sunshine without taking damage. 
I said at the beginning of this video that if you're still using the PMM in any capacity by the end of the game, you are an idiot. If you have not understood what I meant by now, you will hear. My first enemy had a Gauss Rifle. It was one enemy at the end of a hallway who could be easily dealt with through a bob and weave. Nothing wrong with that. However, the entire run caved in on itself the second I turned the corner. Several monolith men in a small doorway with limited cover. Getting close to them is not an option. The small opening they shoot from is also an issue since I have a tendency to miss. I tried exploring other areas only to get caught up in a two-way battle. I hugged the wall near the other room where the men were in and failed. I got pre-fired after a reload and it was at this point the game became sentient and started f***ing with me. Enemies started respawning behind me. The entire recording had devolved into me living for a grand total of around five seconds on most attempts before falling to the floor. Here's a sampler. This isn't a death loop anymore. This is death limbo. Enemies spawning behind me. Enemies spawning in my face. Quick save and kill basically stopped working here. Retreating into one part was able to get me some supplies. I found another spare exoskeleton and one of the best artifacts I could get my hands on. Nightstar, which adds a 5% bulletproof cap. One of the monolith was clipping into a wall and I tried constantly shooting a guy in the hands to no avail. If you don't understand how useless this pistol is at this point in time, you are legitimately blind. I was legitimately getting upset watching this section of the recording because of how much of a mess this was. When another guy spawned directly behind me, I snapped. I pushed into the room with the other monolith where death purgatory continued. It was at this point that I decided I have had enough. If this game wants to f*** with me, I have zero issue f***ing it right back. I started paying attention to what happens in between deaths. In Shadow of Chernobyl, every time you load the game, all NPC animations reset. This gives you a window of, at minimum, two seconds to gain ground and quick save before you're sent right back to God. So what's one to do here? Simple. Abuse the ever-living hell out of the quick save quick load system so badly that I'm gonna make sure this game is done one way or another. Move, quick save, die, quick load, move, quick save, die, quick load. Just keep doing that, gaining the smallest bit of ground each and every time. Fighting in positions where I legitimately can't just isn't going to work. I could beat this game without firing a single round and technically I will have beaten this game with a pistol. I was soon clapped in a nearby stairwell, fighting enemies from different angles and narrow doorways is bad enough, and now I have elevation in the mix. I eventually got to the next floor, good news being I made it deeper into the power plant, bad news is ANOTHER NARROW DOORWAY. I was hip firing at the door because I stopped giving a crap. Saw some dev textures after one death, I got into a game of peekaboo roulette and finally got close enough to the wish granter and got crazy irradiated in the worst attempt at parkour ever. I know this is not the true ending, but I was curious as to what ending I would end up getting. I got the one where he says humanity needs to be controlled and I just end up in a void. Back in reality, I wandered up and down the plant trying to find the doorway to Milo's secret lab, eventually climbed up a ladder to find it, found another exoskeleton, and began to open the door. Some monolith teleported in, but I stayed hidden until the door opened. Currently in a small maze of hallways crawling with monolith, I found myself only willing to repeat myself so many times. At this point, with how high that number is in the corner, I don't think I have to explain how this went. I tried to take my favorite rifle as a trophy and was punished for it. The game crashed again. I stopped fighting in certain areas since it was borderline impossible, and I bobbed and weaved my way into a room full of consoles and computer junk. Bear in mind that this is the first time I have ever seen this section of the game, so I have genuinely no concept of what's coming up right now. After fighting in a room containing the most cover I have ever had up to this point, I entered a room with a hologram and a few... Uh, coils? I, I don't know what they call these things. With absolutely no idea what to do, I just started throwing random junk all over the place, including grenades, until one of the coils exploded and some fire ghosts spawned. I reloaded a save to keep things fair and started to unload bullet after bullet into them. At some point, I died during this, and once the last one was destroyed, I was given a hologram of a scientist to talk to. He explained the sea consciousness, the existence of the zone, and how his group wasn't involved in the explosion of Reactor 4 in 1986, pinky promise I solemnly swear so help me god dude trust me. He offered me to join, I said yes out of curiosity, I got put in a tube, and the game ended said no after reloading, and got blorped outside of the power plant with portals scattered around the area. Not sure what to do, 
I walked towards the first portal when some monolith teleported in, telling me exactly what this type of section was going to be. I got through the first portal, climbed a ladder, got blown up, ran around with no clear direction, parkoured in the pipe, and had less than a thousand bullets left over. I tried to do stealth in one area and failed camp defense, apparently. I'm skimming over a lot of this because it's really just a push to the finish. We're at the end of the game and I wanted this to be done. After parkouring off the goddamn building, the game started cheating when one of the enemies had no clip turned on. The same area is a pain because you're blind for a couple of seconds when you teleport, so more often than not, you die immediately. Timing a quick save helped this and I entered a death loop, followed by another death loop. And at some point during this... event, I passed 1000 deaths. Do you now understand why I hated getting ready to write this script? I would just like to let you know that this count is 100% accurate. I sat through every last second of footage to count every single time I got sent to God, and I had to redo parts of the count three times because I accidentally mistyped the death amount. Anyway, I started sprinting for portals and ignoring fights because it just wasn't worth it anymore. One portal made me jump scare the traitor back in Cordon, and before I knew it, the very last portal was in arm's reach. As I got ever so close, ready to finish this goddamn game, some c munch with an RPG blew me up. The very last thing I did was b-hop my way to victory. I was given one final cutscene of Strelok in front of the sea consciousness, he pulled out an AK and started shooting. Soon enough, the clouds were green, the grass was green, his clothes were green, the credits had one hell of a stroke, and sitting quietly at 1,019 deaths over the course of 27 hours, I beat Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl using nothing but the very first pistol I was able to use. I'll just get this out of the way now, this isn't so much a challenge run as it is a typical modded playthrough. The only mod running here is the New Vegas Door Randomizer, and apart from the necessary mods required for it to run, that's about it. This is an anything goes playthrough, the only thing I had to do was go with the first faction I found that didn't hate me once I found the appropriate room to do so, minus the Legion of course. Following the game as logically as I can isn't going to happen. This is less about the challenge of beating the game, and more about the chaos of the experience brought on by the mod. That's really it. All good stories begin with you waking up after being shot in the face. I did my best to make my character vaguely resemble Shaggy from Scooby-Doo and performed the time-honored tradition of robbing Doc Mitchell blind right in front of him. Since this is just a standard run with doors all over the place, we don't need anything in particular as far as special stats goes. Agility was at 8, Perception, Endurance, and Intelligence at 7, Strength and Charisma at 4, and My Luck at level 3. My tag skills were Guns, Medicine, and Speech, with my traits being Claustrophobia and Hoarder. If you were wondering why I chose that first one, since there's a lot of indoor areas in Vegas... I don't know. Doc gave me some toys for the road, I got blinded by the sun, went to the general store, and realized that I didn't load the mod correctly. Troubleshooted the mod off-camera to get it to work properly, and decided to obscure all door destinations. After saying my hello and goodbye to Victor, I said my hello and goodbye to Victor, and upon trying to go into Good Spring Saloon, I got teleported to Nellis. I'm honestly surprised the boomers didn't try to shoot me on sight. While wandering around the fancy playroom, I took their stuff, and my next door took me to a Night Stalker den. After dying, I ran back in with a grenade launcher to take them with me, played Bring Around the Rosie, then cut off their butts and took their blood. Blasted a boomer, left Nellis, and ended up in Zion Canyon. I swam in a cave, which also took me to Big MT. I can only hope that, if you're watching this, you're a fan of Old World Blues, because you're going to be seeing it a lot. 
I looked for doors in between picking up these seemingly endless magnum rounds, and one door took me to the trading spot the Silver Rush meet the Legion in. Found myself in Freeside, murdered Mickey Mouse in broad daylight, and found myself in Bitter Springs, which allowed me to borrow the NCR stuff with the promise to not bring it back later. Spoke with the locals, woke up someone who told me to f*** off, took my ass westward and leveled up, dumping points into speech and lockpick while taking Swift Learner. Further west, I found my first Cazador, and won after throwing literally every single thing I had at it. The game must have thought I was a really good player, so it threw a Death Claw at me not too long afterwards. I also made the mistake of quick saving while some were starting to chase me, so I ran for my goddamn life while jamming every stim pack I had into my arm to avoid being torn into confetti. The nearby door told me to go f myself, as it turned out to be the Enclave Remnant's bunker, and it was there that I learned that Death Claws can go through doors. After escaping south and finding myself at Camp Galt, I found several tents, and therefore, several new doors. One of which put me in a Mantis-filled cave, which, if memory served me right, was part of Vault 22. Another tent put me in the hotel room, and another back in Zion. I'll be brief of any mentions of Zion, because the vast majority of its areas are outdoors, and there aren't that many doors to open. That being said, Daniel did ask me this. How did you get in here? I'm wondering the same thing too, Daniel. Explored the canyon and went lizard hunting, made sure I was on very hard, landed in the NCR sharecropper farms, and then Helios 1. I extorted the smartest man in Vegas, went to Camp McCarran, and then Vault 21. I'm embarrassed to say that I spent an ungodly amount of time looking for a usable door in the vault. I went back to McCarran and landed in the sharecropper farms again. One more door took me to Lonesome Road, specifically Tunnel or Hell. They did not like the fact that I was there. Picked a lock to get into the Brotherhood bunker, Paladin Ramos tried to kill me, so I shot his gun out of his hands and stabbed him to death in self-defense. Took the can of beans he calls armor and then went to Crimson Caravan, the Vegas Medical Clinic, and then Big MT again. I teleported to someone's house to escape a Cazador, stabbed old Lady Gibson's dog, and then found myself at Ashton Missile Silo. At level 3, I bumped up lockpicking guns and tried to launch the nukes for fun. Sadly, it wouldn't let me, which triggered the wrath of the marked men. Just a reminder, uh, Lonesome Road recommends that you be at level 25 at the very least before you even think of trying it. Level 3 isn't that far away from 25, but is probably not the most ideal level to be at. Anyway, the marked men ate me for breakfast, I had a pistol, and they had shoulder-mounted LMGs. My grenades were doing a whole load of nothing to them as well. What made things worse was my first death loop by running into this guy, Bonesaw. With imitation legged armor and a chainsaw in hand, he chased me around before I exploded. I tried to focus fire on him before the other marked men closed in, but it wasn't working. Realizing I was well and truly screwed, I tried to go back the way I came, but the door was locked. I kept trying to run away towards open paths, but either stepped on a landmine or got turned into fondue meat. I eventually escaped into a highway, which, by sheer coincidence, was also Deathclaw territory. <laughs> Good news? Bone Saga torn to shreds. Bad news? I now have to deal with Deathclaws. I tried to deal damage with no success at all, but I managed to get Bone Saw's loot, which was nice. One of the Deathclaws had no clip turned on, and I kept falling off the damn bridge. And around here was where I learned about the problem solver. <laughs> The problem solver is an item included with the mod that's permanently in your inventory because I think the mod dev realized that the game can probably break really easily by nature of how this mod works in general. What the item does is keep track of the previous room you were in. Use the item and it teleports you back to that room, no strings attached. The intention is to prevent soft locks, but believe me when I say that this method, while it works, is not foolproof. But that's for later. Moving on, after teleporting to the garage once populated by Dog, I went back to Big MT to die, fled to the Mojave, hunted Brahmin, went northeast, hunted again, found a shack, and went to prison. I figured since I needed to kill the Powder Gangers one way or another at some point, I pulled out a machete and got busy. I parkoured out of jail after committing my atrocities, beelined for the Yangtze Memorial, blew up a rad scorpion, followed by a coyote, found this hole, landed in Good Springs, and unlocked a door that took me to Novak. The hotel has some doors that we can use, one of which took me right back to the Divide, so I turned around instantly and then landed in this interrogation room containing a man called Silius. Okay, easy XP, just talk to the guy and leave. I must admit that a conversation with an imbecile may be far worse than the kind of torture I was anticipating. I stabbed him in the head until nothing happened, went back to Novak, and then realized all of my weapons were gone. Isn't that great? I mean, this is NCR territory, they probably considered a tax for messing up the interrogation or something. 188 Trading Post happened to be nearby, and since this isn't anything ghost type of run, I decided to take Veronica with me as I wouldn't be entirely useless with her by my side. Bought a gun, and went to the NCR quarry that was conveniently inside Victor's house. 
Later in Boulder City, the bar took me to Nipton, and another door in Boulder City put me at the dam. That led me to a few corpses, and this tower led me to- HOLY SHIT, I FOUND THE F***ING CUPS. I gave the front desk my guns and wasted no time going straight to Benny. After making an attempt to cut him up into playing cards, the chairman finished me off. The second attempt had me knock Benny onto the floor, but also ended in failure when he took me out and shot me five times in the ass. As I continued to prove why bringing a knife to a gunfight is a horrible idea, Benny soon died, I robbed him blind, and started murdering everyone in the casino for the EXP. As I wander through Big MT now, let me explain something. If this were any other video, this would be the part where I talk about what my plans are for how the rest of the run is going to go. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. It's not like hoarding vault weapons or going into diabetic shock with lasers. I can make all the plans I want, but nothing is going to happen until I find where I want to be or a place I can proceed. Now, yeah, I can easily just turn on a quest and follow the markers to where I need to be, but that kind of defeats the point of the randomizer. Because even with all the rooms scrambled, the game can still tell me exactly where to go to get to where I need to be. This would essentially make the randomizer pointless because, yeah, it's random. But the game knows where to go, and nothing stops me from pinning a quest as a placeholder so I follow the predetermined path. What's the purpose of a randomizer if you know where you're gonna go before you even get there? Imagine doing a Pokemon randomizer, and you knew exactly what Pokemon the first gym leader was going to have because it still adhered to types based on the gym. It's not really a randomizer anymore now, is it? Later on, I soon found myself in the Ultra Lux and tried to destroy everyone inside, but failed to consider the fact that the white gloves can take a shocking amount of bullets from people in suits and dresses, coupled with the fact that my ammo was already fairly limited. I fought fire with fire and tried to hold them off with a dress cane, but that didn't work. I stole all the drinks instead and went to the sewers for rats and ghouls. I got jump scared by a rat and got introduced to Master Splinter. Later in Boulder City, I let the NCR out of the clutches of the cons and the cons let my soul out of the clutches of my body. Blinked to nowhere, did some shopping at the gun rudders, went to Freeside only to get surprised by Lonesome Road for the fifth time. Turns out the CN Crimson Caravan stands for Corn. Found Vault 19, then Gibson Scrapyard again. Went to go melt in the desert, and Veronica was kind enough to offer herself as a human shield against the Vipers. I got food poisoning, and what happens in the gas station bathroom stays in Vegas. Mr. Crocker gave me an F, and Volpe spoke his final words before I caved in his face with a shotgun. McCarran took me to the Boomers, then the Farms, then Walmart Garden Center 22. Later in the Sierra Madre, I was unable to kill any of the ghost people properly, and they were wasting my ammo. Luckily, I didn't have any bomb collar on me to annoy me. After fighting through ghoul hell, I found a door that took me to the Vegas sewers, then Coyote Mines, and some more ghouls, which meant I was near Camp Searchlight. This stray Legion moron got what he deserved as Malcolm Holmes climbed out of the dumpster I previously left him in, but he got scared off before he talked to me. Novak, Doctor, Nowhere, Corn, Bathroom, my lobotomite turned me into cold cuts, started to realize how much the iron sights on the cowboy repeater suck ass, got the best axe, which is great because I needed to harvest some more f corn. Oliver Swanick tried to seduce me, Legion assassins started to spawn, but I kindly negotiated a trade of bullets for money. <laughs> continued the Ultra Lux Massacre, and locked doors were really starting to annoy me. That's another thing I want to bring up. Locked doors exist, which can't be accessed unless you're under certain conditions, or have the appropriate key, or can't access them at all. Especially when some doors may require you to go through them to get to a certain area to actually finish the game. I'm not foreshadowing anything you are. The LRA Motel led me to this one room I didn't recognize at first. I wandered around a bit before it hit me. This is the section of Vault 21 that's meant to serve as Benny's escape tunnel in the tops. That's another thing to mention. Areas you aren't actually meant to see, let alone walk around in the vast majority of cases, are also in play here, since they may also have functioning doors. At level 10, I took the Commando perk, Mojave Outpost took me to McCarran, then to Vegas, then to Big MT. Cazadors are as annoying as they tend to be. Specimen 73 in particular was getting annoying, but the spirit of Dale Gripple gave me the strength to wipe out the last of the bugs. Meanwhile, in the Sierra Madre, I found a decent amount of loot and stumbled upon Christine. After giving her a good look through Veronica's head, the two looked at each other for five seconds, I gave Christine Benny swag and a gun, teleported to Zion, and decided to bring Fowl's chalk with me because why the f*** not? Sadly, that turned out to be a mistake because he would not shut up. <laughs> Even 
love it. It was also slowly dawning on me how few doors Honest Hearts actually has. Powder Ganger, Gecko Party, and the Mojave. Then I got gassed and nearly had a damn heart attack thinking I was gonna lose all my stuff again. Thankfully didn't, and landed somewhere near Jacobstown and then the game froze after trying to leave the Ultralux. This was followed up by the game going into a freezing fit and refusing to load whatsoever. I eventually managed to get it to take a concerningly long time to load properly, and then re-entered the Ultralux to go to town. Got rapid reload at level 12, a trauma harness sicked his puppies on me and exploded into gore despite being a skeleton, continued the bloodbath at the Ultralux, corn poisoning, found Prim, found that room full of rats people keep getting locked inside of, Camp Forlorn Hope led me to some other chunk of NCR territory, then the pens for the thorn, which was the easiest EXP I have ever gotten in my whole life. Landed in the tops, then the Bison Steve, gave Christine some beer, and then found another problem. There's certain parts of Lonesome Road that automatically trigger dialogue conversations with Ed E. There's just one problem. We have a tribal, a mute, and a woman who likes punching things. None of these are Ed E, so the game doesn't know what to do besides send tunnelers after me. I reloaded a save to go back the way I came, finding Gabe the dog, who, much like the average German Shepherd owned by the average American, is trained to eat me alive and explode on death. I had the bright idea to try and find the laser detonator in the divide somewhere because it occurred to me that exploding nuclear warheads might reveal doors. That's why we did all that testing during the Cold War. We had to find more doors. That's what Wikipedia tells me. I maxed out my lockpick, stole a bunch of irradiated snacks from Searchlight, went through a door that surprised me with being underwater, regrouped at the tops, and enraged the NCR by trying to get on their monorail. Dead Sea had a tragic accident where he ended up in front of me. There was a crowd of boomers at the monorail station, and I think the NPCs are starting to freak out and not know where they are. Found the fiends, a giant rat, free caps, ant hunting, level 14, here and now, sniping with a 44 magnum, cow tipping, mild inconvenience, mild inconvenience again, major inconvenience, the game froze, looted a room, the game crashed, shot another fiend, the game crashed, shot up the gun runners and then paid for their hospital bills, the NCR rangers were getting to the point of starting to annoy me, found enough beans to make me set for life, the Nelson, the Madre, the one door I'm able to enter needs a f Key. Paradise, the Legion, backflip the guy, got to level 16, tanked science for unknown reasons, and I lied, we didn't pick off the last of the Legion. If it seems like I'm skipping over a lot of things, I know. This sentence is the seventh recording of 15. I can only repeat myself so much, and this script is already, what, 15 minutes based on what I've got in Audacity? And that's before trimming things down in the editor. I got the sniper kill of a lifetime, shot a small child in plain view of NCR, someone had a pet tumbleweed, and New Vegas did the opposite to function properly again. By this point, I was losing hope to find anything resembling a path to proceed. My player model was a little messed up, the ghouls in camp searchlight exist, I found God in a dark basement, entered Hoover Dam, entered Prim, shot up the Vicky and Vance. Prim Slim took lasers like a champ, dude did not want to go down. I landed in Nipton, wiped out the Legion there, and made the most terrible decision of my life. When I started this playthrough earlier this year, my brother told me something. To paraphrase what he said, Imagine if you go into Good Springs and immediately land at the end of Lonesome Road. So there's this one door in Good Springs. I'm sure you know where this is going. We're gonna fight Ulysses with the Dream Team. Christine, we're on the go. A close job. An easy beat, apparently. I unloaded damn near everything I had on hand and then died to a robot. I pulled out my Proton X to take care of those while pumping Ulysses full of lead whenever possible while the companions focused on him. In between throwing grenades at the marked men that broke in, I tried to shoot weapons out of his hands and then he fell to his death before I died. I decided early on that he needed to die from combat, not gravity, as the companions had a tendency to shove him towards cliffs. That's not fair. Besides, he has good loot. I can't let that go to waste. I also got this weird audio glitch and I had to kill myself to stop it. I like to think that this was Ulysses telling me to fight fair. AP rounds seemed to work well until they didn't. The marked men were getting on my nerves as my companions got knocked out since more fire got focused on me. To be truthful, there's zero reason for me to do this. This fight is a pain in the butt without the randomizer, let alone with three companions that shouldn't even be here to begin with. At one point, I was the only one alive and needed to focus on the marked men since they take giant bites out of my health. Close combat wasn't in the equation since they tend to explode into a puddle of goop. 
At one point, I knocked out the last one and died immediately, to which I said screw it and started the fight all over from the beginning instead. I let Ulysses come to me and focused fire on the others. Spamming discount Bane with explosives while keeping distance to allow breathing room became the strat. I soon gave up on this strat and just started pulling out anything and everything with no regard to practical purpose. If my memory serves correctly, I hit him with a ripper at one point. We eventually managed to gang up on him, push into a corner, and calmly beat him to death. I picked up whatever wasn't stuck to the ground, blew up, did it again, and nuked the Legion on my way out. I got a nice look of the inside of my companions' heads while the endgame narration played. Now, at this point, I had once planned to make this a two-parter. Picking up off of where we left from here, I would have kept doing that if it were not for what happened next. After getting my ears talked off, I got blinked back to the Divide entrance with one problem. The control stopped working. I tried to turn them back on with console commands to no success, tried to console command my way back to Good Springs, but that didn't fix the problem either. I reloaded a save since I didn't really have much of a choice in the matter, only to find out that after the missile launches, you're not allowed to open the Pip-Boy, and one of my most recent saves was after the missile was launched. So I decided to make an executive decision. Since the problem solver would have taken me back to Good Springs anyway, there's no harm in using console commands to take myself back to the town, as that's what the problem solver would have done anyway, just on a more specific level when it comes to the particular door. Wandered around Spud Grings for loot, the gas station on the hill had no value to me, beat up a couple death claws, tried to convince Arcade Ganon to tag along, but it didn't work, went to Novak, bought supplies, went to the cons, went to Zion, Vault 34 had all of the ghouls and none of the doors, but I picked a bunch of locks for EXP. I don't even know if I had a plan anymore at this point. Black Mountain, Lake Clerks, Night Person, blew up Mortimer, then most of the Ultra Lux, I bought some stuff on the bartender, then killed her, and then Heck Gunderson. I found myself at the bottom of Hoover Dam. I didn't even know this was a section you could even get to, let alone see, and I've been playing this game for years. Killed off the Powder Gangers in Vault 19, then the game froze. Powder Gangers Round 2, left the vault for the tops, and at this point I was pretty much shooting anything and anyone that happened to be in my line of sight. I landed in Vault 3 to continue this streak. Traded a bunch of Legion and NCR money back at the tops before killing the banker, there's a Sierra Madre in my gas leak, Nightkin in the basement, Vault f 3 Part 2, a wild Julie Farkas appeared, and later in the divide, I fell asleep taking notes during this recording, and the last sentence I wrote was, and trust me, I'd love to go back to finishing the toddler Camaro of it. I did some sniping at Big MT, once again entered an area you're never meant to actually see. This is a section in the Repcon basement that has this tunnel that seems like it has a very short draw distance. There's also this arrangement of white shapes directly above a manhole at the end. Back in the Thorn, I found Courier's Mile, which is where every single irradiated monster in America came to say hello. I'm at level 21, and everything here is too much to handle for me. The automatic rocket launcher I had on hand was about as effective as throwing rocks. Christine actually ran away from the fight, if you believe that. I also forgot marked men can open doors, so that was nice. The game crashed when I tried to load a building at Big MT. I sent Petey to Piranha to Hell. Once again in Zion, I avenged Roadrunner, found a hut I didn't recognize in the Mojave, and good lord, let me tell you, when I walked inside, I shit my pants. I wasted no time turning everyone in Caesar's tent into mush. I entered Freeside and into Maker Ralph's when I realized something. The nameplates stopped working. I found a food store, got drugged by Elijah, but now I can kill ghost people, which is nice. Some NCR doctor landed at the Divide, I ate some trash, started getting genuinely mad finding the sharecropper farms, and found some really mean robots in some warehouse. I have no idea where I was, but I'm positive it was Big MT again. Fell out of a dino's mouth to my death, took drugs, drank, looted the NCR, saved the game, spoke to Daddy Khan, traded smokes for money, I bought pre-war money for a reason I genuinely cannot even begin to explain, train tunnels, more of the friggin' madre, robbed a house, thought I could get to a new area from Nellis, but couldn't, and started shooting Follows Chalk in the face any time he had the nerve to open his mouth. Buildings and give away all their money just to watch someone... Hoover Dam, then Nowhere, then Camp Golf, then The Divide. I feel like I'm going nuts. After shooting another one of Fowler's Chuck's teeth out, I felt like I was living in Groundhog Day with the amount of places I've already been. The hatch at Cottonwood Cove is the closest I have ever gotten to being within any distance of Mr. House by this point. Take a wild guess as to what the game did. The NCR Supply Depot got me good stuff and a shitload of caps. Broke down and reassembled ammo, found some locked up drip. The top's chairman came back to life somehow, and at this point, I gave up. 
If I kept going any longer, this video would not end. I put on a quest marker and decided to do Yes Man to get it over with. I told them I didn't care about anyone else, went back to Prim, only to find out that my one path to house was in Prim the entire time. I was killing house anyway, so I opened fire on everyone inside and the Proton Axe took care of the Securitrons, got to level 25, exploded house, and didn't even bother looting the Lucky 38, I just wanted the game to be over. At this point, I'm just following to where I need to go to finish the game as soon as possible. I murdered a man in broad daylight, hacked a Mr. House, Christine's bald ass head took up the entire screen, sat through Yes Man's PowerPoint, and went to Cottonwood Cove to shoot up what was left of the fort. I got a pretty sweet Vance kill that knocked a dude's head off mid-power attack, I opened fire on everyone that came to the front gates, and sniped out the rest. I also forgot that Camp Golf exists. NCR Rangers were shockingly more irritating than the Legion due to the large caliber guns they carry. At some point, I have ended up killing someone inside the dam, but I can't be bothered to mention it in the script. Who gives a shit at this point? Veronica got lost. I teleported outside of Nellis to do the introduction properly. I got taken to Pearl and ignored them, but the almighty Todd had other plans. I ended up in Vault 34. Okay, whatever, no problem. There's no door I can use here. I went back the way I came, and the only other door is locked. <laughs> me, man. You know what this means? The game softlocked me. I got softlocked again, and I can't even use the problem solver here because it's just gonna put me back in Vault 34. To add salt to the wound, my last save was when I started this particular recording, so as you can tell, I'm pretty peachy about this. I declared that if cheating was required to continue, I didn't care, I already gave up, I forced the door to unlock, and that took me to the big MT boss battle room against the X-42 giant Robo Scorpion. I dumped damn near every AP-308 round I had and found myself back outside the dam before choosing to teleport back to Prim. I talked to Yes Man back in the Lucky 38, ignored the NCR president getting shot, and was told to find El Dorado substation, which pointed me towards Hoover Dam. After shattering the hopes and dreams of everyone on top of the dam, I made a realization that this run was doomed from the moment it started. Near the Legion side of the dam, there's this one hut that's controlled by NCR. Outside of the battle for the dam, both doors are inaccessible. However, it's not these doors that we are concerned with. It's what's on the roof of said hut. There's a sniper's nest up there with a hatch that you can enter, but the room you're required to go into cannot be accessed unless you have started the second battle for the dam. Technically speaking, in my current state, I can't start the end of the game unless I've already started the end of the game. Which brings me back to the question asked by this video. Can I beat Fallout New Vegas if every door is random? In theory, yes, but the stars need to align. It is very much possible because it's highly doubtful that however this mod calculates the randomness of door placement is going to result in a broken path every single time. There's no way of knowing where everything leads without having the nameplates turned on or without going there in the first place. Unless you cheap out and turn on the quest markers, there's no way of knowing where something leads until you get to it in an ideal case. There's sections of this game you're never meant to actually see, let alone walk around, and there's sections of this game that cannot be accessed until you reach specific milestones, which can cause paths to break. This can result in a playthrough that, without cheating, can become unwinnable by complete accident, and by the time you find out, you run the risk of being too far along in the playthrough to do anything about it, depending on what you did or what saves you have lying around. I had a few emergency saves in case something corrupted or broke, but reloading the game to redo my steps feels cheap. Even if I did, House is dead, the NCR hates me, the Legion hates me, not that I'm gonna do anything with them again anyway, how far back would I have to go to actually be able to finish the game, and what's the guarantee of me being able to actually do so on another path? For all I know, those paths are broken too. As a final executive decision, I no-clipped to the nest and went inside the substation. I made one last visit to the Gunrunners to buy as much ammo as I could physically carry along with two-step goodbye and some reloading supplies. I told Fallows Chalk to piss off and started the Battle of Hoover Dam. I took a door to Cottonwood Cove and upon trying to fast travel to Nipton, I made one final horrific discovery. When doing the battle for the dam, you're not allowed to fast travel. Okay, whatever, it's the end game, that's fine. But this doesn't apply to Hoover Dam. This applies to the entire map. So I started walking all the way back to where I needed to be.
Once finally inside the dam proper, I plugged Yes Man into place and got to work. I exploded a guy and dropped dead. My next reload put me against heavy troopers, and I got what was probably the hardest VATS kill I have ever gotten in my entire time playing this game. I soon blew up one of the generators, waddled back to the battle only to need to no-clip myself back onto the dam. I kept shooting everything in sight right up until the game froze again. Got something resembling a death loop until a stealth boy and AP round saved the day, no-clipped through a broken door, sniped out the dog waiting at the gate, and once inside the Leggett's tent, I pulled out a 50 cal and finished the job. I got sight of the Leggett and started dumping bullet after bullet into his ugly face. Once he was down, I picked up his sword to pick off the ground troops, sniped out the last sniper, and it was time to face General Oliver. And much like everyone else before him, it was time to go out the violent way. He killed me instantly. I popped the turbo and went behind a wall, pulled out a hive missile, landed one shot right on Oliver and company, killing him instantly, and Yes Man rolled to come and talk to me mid-explosion. Christine kept taking up space. The credits rolled, and I could not beat Fallout New Vegas while every door was random. Ping Pong, also known by its significantly less cooler name, Table Tennis, is a tabletop sport originating in England in the late 1800s with its earliest games making use of rounded champagne corks as the ball before the introduction of the celluloid ball in 1900. Odds are you've played some form of ping pong at least once at some point in your life, be it a full-size table or even some form of video game. Tennis, in general, as a video game, has been around as long as the concept of video games themselves. One of the earliest examples of such being 1958's Tennis for Two, and the more famous example being 1972's Pong. I'm not about to explain Pong to you, so let's just get to the point. It's currently August 2007, and a movie has just released. Balls of Fury, a comedy film starring Dan Fogler, his first lead role in a movie and signed with a wide variety of movie and TV roles both as an on-screen and voice actor. Also starring Christopher Walken, playing the movie's main villain and is known for a multitude of other things that someone else has already catalogued. Along with George Lopez, best known for those times he fell asleep watching Nickelodeon and woke up with the TV still on at 2 in the morning. And because this is 2007, this somehow got a video game tie-in which came out not even a month after release based on what I was able to find. Balls of Fury for the Wii and Nintendo DS, the former of which is the subject of today's video. As some of you may know, I was working on a multi-game special which was going to cover a few games that, from my recollection, couldn't stand on their own for an entire video and posted this thumbnail teasing the three. The first one being fairly obvious, the second one just showing a ping pong paddle and a ball, and the third looking like something out of those old inkblot tests. The second one was originally going to be Balls of Fury, but as I kept working on that section, I decided that spinning it off into its own video would make more sense. It didn't feel right sandwiching it between a game based on a children's toy and a game that only a specific amount of New York children would know even exists if they were going to school during a specific time frame, and no, I'm not exaggerating any of that. In regards to the movie itself, I rewatched it as part of the research to prepare for that section of the video, and honestly, it's okay. It's not the greatest movie I've ever seen, it got a few laughs out of me, it's got some decent jokes scattered around and it works really well as a background noise movie. Something to get together and watch with friends after you've had a few beers. It's definitely one of the movies I paid 10 bucks for on iTunes, but not something I'd throw on my movie shelf. Now I'm sure some of you were aware of the movie's existence, but maybe not so much the game. I don't remember seeing any ads for it being pushed anywhere, I just remember it being on a discount shelf at the mall while I was out with family at the time and the movie was still fresh in my mind, so we kinda just went, wow, a movie game. Balls of Fury is often considered one of the worst Wii games ever produced. The Wii is no stranger to shovelware schlock. Besides its motion controls and first-party offerings, it's arguably one of the biggest things it's known for. Low-effort games that exist as a cash grab and nothing else beyond that. Today we're gonna dig into Balls of Fury and explore what makes this game as bad as it is. Side note, I'm playing on a Wii U running custom firmware and I don't remember having fun playing this on the real thing, so 
This should be fun. Get a good listen to this track because it's one of like three pieces of music in the whole game. Our title screen gives us a few options that we're able to choose from. Exhibition, Story, Arcade, Tournament, and Trophy Room. For the sake of simplicity, we're gonna run right into Story Mode. We're presented with what is probably meant to be a cutscene that gives us a brief synopsis of the earliest portions of the movie, with a young Randy Daytona about to face Carl Wolfstag in the 1988 Summer Olympics in a game of ping pong. Now, I'm going to show you two different clips of this first match because it's going to highlight a problem I noticed while playing this game that I'll discuss in more detail later. To start off with this pre-game screen, let's ignore the fact that the versus text on the ping pong ball doesn't look like it was warped correctly and look at our characters. Young Randy doesn't look terrible, but Carl? Good lord. What's wrong with his face? It looks like he ate sour candy before his picture was taken and is trying to hide it. Anyway, my first clip went mostly well, barring a few video issues. The screen kept blacking out at random points, making the footage difficult to use. You can see in this footage that the game is functioning pretty much fine. It's ping pong. Swing to the left, swing to the right. Don't overshoot and get more points than your opponent. I don't have to tell you how the game works. The game gives you at most five seconds to take it all in on the loading screens. Before moving on to the next level, I'm going to show you the same level after redoing all the connections to my capture card and to the computer. It looks like I left the controller alone and didn't do a single thing, but I promise you I was doing the exact same movements I was in the first clip. The game, for one reason or another, just refused to do anything. And I'm going to tell you right now that my biggest regret while playing this was not having my desk mic on. After a couple back and forths, the game abruptly throws a loading screen at us and gives us a cutscene detailing the next few portions of the movie. Randy is knocked out, his dad is killed, he gets fired from his job, and he meets FBI agent George Lopez to participate in an underground ping pong tournament led by Fang. Now, this is very important, so pay attention, because the game makes special mention to note that nobody knows what Fang looks like, but, and I quote, they suspect he looks like George Takei, who is Mr. Sulu from Star Trek. Okay. On the next game, we're thrown into another match against the lowest quality textured shirt I've ever seen, even by Wii standards. I would also like to redact what I said about Carl. Just take a moment to absorb exactly what you're looking at here. This is supposed to be a recreation of a human being. Do you think Patton Oswalt knows about this 3D model? Do you think he knows what they've done to him? Holy crap. The bright side is we at least have a proper game to play to completion this time. Besides being standard off the shelf ping pong, the game actually does have a few things to make gameplay interesting to some extent. You have special moves activated by pressing the A button, which vary depending on the character you are playing as or against. As you rally the ball back and forth, you increase this meter off to the side, allowing you to stack up to three special moves at once, with each character having two unique moves related to rallying the ball or serving the ball. While playing as Randy, who is the only character you play as in story mode, you launch the ball as a high-speed fireball whenever you rally it back. While serving, the ball zigzags back and forth. There's also the ball doing a loop-de-loop, -loop, a similar one where the ball simply goes fast and low. The ball can also teleport and gravitate towards a specific area. There's also a taunt mechanic. And it looks like this. Tastes good! Yeah, I'm not going to be nice on this one. This would have to be the first video game you ever played in order to get messed up by it. Taunts play a line from the specific character you're playing as or against in the movie. If the opponent taunts, it shakes the screen around slightly and buzzes the Wii Remote. If you taunt, it just plays the audio, at least in single player mode. Have your grandma pull the car around. If my memory serves me correctly, it shook your opponent's side of the screen in two player mode, but that requires someone else willing to play Balls of Fury on the Wii. And I can guarantee you beyond any matter of doubt that I was the only person on Earth for a brief period of time willing to actually play this game. Your gameplay, at least while playing as Randy, doesn't change much apart from the changes in difficulty. I didn't have too much of a hard time against the hammer, but besides that, a good portion of the game wasn't too harsh. I honestly wish I had more to say about it, but really, this is all the game is from this point on. Volleying the ball back and forth and occasionally doing power moves and taunts in a vain attempt to try and mess up the AI player. I'm gonna run through the remaining characters in the game because there's genuinely little I can say about them, and the real meat of this section comes from my overall experience throughout the story mode. After beating the hammer, you get thrown at Master Wong following another slideshow. Wong doesn't have much going for him barring a unique power attack, but it's still the same game we've been playing so far. Our next power point introduces us to Maggie Wong. We get confirmation that you're allowed to say ass in a game rated E10, and she, and I quote, uses the mystical lyrics of the greatest band ever, Def Leppard, 
to lift Randy's spirits and get him back to training. Okay, just just one one minute for a moment. I understand that being a Def Leppard fan is a big part of Randy's character in the movie. He's almost never not wearing a shirt featuring a band most of the time, and his paddle has the band's logo burned into it. The music from the band is featured throughout the movie and in a dance party at the end during the credits. I I have nothing against Def Leppard, but... Jesus Christ. That line is written like someone writing their first story has some kind of self-insert and wanted an excuse to gush about Def Leppard. Anyway, Maggie made me want to blow my brains out. Maggie's match had an unexpectedly high difficulty spike that seemingly came out of nowhere. Looking back on it, this feels like the game's way of treating Maggie like some kind of mid-game boss, but with no warning whatsoever. A number of problems rose from this match, mainly in the form of sensitivity. The game seems to have this bizarre problem with how the game registers movement. Somehow, it is too sensitive and not sensitive enough. It's not constant, but when it happens, trust me, you will notice it. If you recall during the first level, I mentioned that it looked like I wasn't doing anything whatsoever but swore that I was. This level had the exact same issue, but in the opposite direction. There was a few moments where the game would make me swing, even though I barely moved the Wii Remote, forcing me to either lose a game or rush to do another swing to save myself, as well as the game not registering any movement at all despite me swinging the remote. As you can imagine, this happening during what is probably the hardest match up to this point is extremely irritating. Imagine playing a racing game. You got a slight left turn coming up, so you lightly move the analog stick just enough to make the turn and still have control of the vehicle, but the game decides no and pulls a hard left and slams you into the wall. That was my experience. I decided to play this game using two different Wii Remotes. The stock Wii Remote I've had since I've got the system, and a Wii Remote Plus I got off eBay forever ago. For clarification, all the footage recorded for this particular section was done with the Wii Remote Plus. My experience was slightly more consistent on the stock Wii Remote, but then again, I have no reason to believe that this game is doing anything different with a Wii Remote that has better guts under the hood. This is likely me getting a better handle on the game's controls. Balls of Fury came out relatively early in the Wii's lifespan, and Wii Motion Plus did not exist until 2010. I highly doubt this game is being affected by it in any way. One thing I will say beyond certainty is that, regardless of controller, Maggie is not an easy fight whatsoever. I always play the hard difficulties because I feel it's more rewarding that way. That and it gives me the opportunity to get more footage and potentially get a more entertaining video despite any, you know, potential detriment to my sanity. <laughs> That being said, I can't see a logical reason for the game to crank up difficulty this much at this point. It's the mid-game, not the end game. I'm not going to blame the game entirely though. There is some genuine skill issue here. I'm not afraid to admit that. I spun the ball off the table more than a few times. You suck like a but it felt genuinely unfair more often than not. I'll discuss Maggie more later on, but we need to move on. I eventually managed to beat her and moved on to my next opponent, the Dragon. Funnily enough, this match was the second easiest in my first run. She's the first match in the game that requires you to lead by three points rather than reach a set point limit. Nothing much else to say. Mild difficulty at best compared to the previous match. Randy is thrown into a dumpster despite the game never showing Randy getting thrown into the f dumpster and we're invited to Feng's house for a play date. Terry Crews, I mean, Freddy Fingers, is our next opponent. Uneventful. His taunts sounded weirdly cut off, and I only found out after rewatching the movie that it was in fact cut off. He's supposed to call you a bitch at the end of this line. Blow it out your ass. Blow it out your ass, bitch. Yukito Nagasaki. Once again, more uneventful nonsense. Nothing special, just like Freddy. But also like Freddy, he had a very interesting taunt. Here it is. <laughs> Me pressing the home menu button is the sole reason I regret not having a microphone on. I was 100% not prepared to hear that come out of my speakers, and it broke me. I was laughing like crazy. <laughs> Yukito didn't have any lines in the movie, and every taunt is a line from the movie, and unless there was a deleted scene that I'm not aware of, 
I'm entirely convinced that the developers needed something for a taunt noise and caught up with one of the team members in the middle of fighting for their life on the toilet. After knocking out Yukito, we're presented with an image of George Lopez with an Uzi that honestly goes pretty hard, and we have our final match against Fang. Fang is up there as one of the most embarrassing final bosses I have ever had the privilege of playing, and it ties into one of my primary issues with Balls of Fury in general. Let me start off with that I do not expect a tie-in video game to follow a movie's plot verbatim, front to back. But I generally feel that if a movie plot can translate to a video game well, then having the game be as close to the movie as reasonably possible is a good goal to have when making a game of this nature. Not every plot is going to carry over cleanly, and sometimes you have to take things out from the movie, contradict what the final movie established, and maybe even add things that didn't happen in the movie to help the game feel more fleshed out. Hell, in some cases, you can ignore the Source movie entirely to tell your own story with the same characters in the same universe. Look at something like Men in Black. Or, in even rarer cases, you can even have it count as a sequel, like Incredibles Rise of the Underminer. The movie came out in August, and the game came out in September. It is reasonable to assume that the game was developed alongside the movie to some extent. Balls of Fury takes some artistic license with at least one event from the Source movie, notably the match against the Hammer, but otherwise the original movie's plot is almost entirely intact, at least on a basic storytelling level that is required to get the plot to move along. Unfortunately, this also translates into the gameplay and level progression. The execution is not great, and you can see this from the moment you start the story mode, but for the time being, let's get back to the final battle against Fang. In the context of the movie, Randy and Fang are wearing these electrified vests that gradually increase in power depending on who loses a point. In Fang's own words, Nobody's ever made it past three zip. In the game, this is translated to another match where there is no minimum score limit and you only have to get a three point lead, just like the match against the dragon. So guess how long it took me to beat Fang? Have you grandma pull the car around? Have your grandma pull the car around. The very first video I did on this channel almost three years ago now featured a boss battle that was finished in roughly a minute and a half. And even then, that was through some mild cheese. What you just witnessed was a cheeseless final battle that, from beginning to end, uninterrupted, completed in less than a minute. The sheer audacity of being able to beat Fang without so much as trying compared to literally everything else so far sprouted a genuine theory in my mind. In the movie, Fang never finished his training with Master Wong, and as such, does not have any ability to do a backhand whatsoever. When watching my first recording against him, every single time I won was on a backhand serve. My theory was that Fang will not score on any rally that requires him to do a backhand. Here's another fun fact, the only reason I even have a decent amount of footage of the story mode besides the Wii Remote experiment was because I wanted to see if this was somehow true and replayed the entire story mode all over again. In hindsight, I don't think anyone would have programmed such a little detail because, frankly, that's pretty stupid in a game context, but my second run of the boss left me speechless. I made a mental note to myself. No taunts, no special moves, raw ping pong swings, nothing else. And while Feng did have a few successful backhands this time, it happened again. 3-0, without fail. Feng was beat without so much as a fragment of effort. I'm, I was speechless because again, as any game would lead you to believe, this is the penultimate battle. Everything you do leads up to this. Why is it so pathetic? I'm sorry if I'm leaning into angry video game nerd at home territory with this, but I'm just genuinely confused. The game ends after this. Y you get a brief summary because the developers need to drop their paycheck off at the bank, Wong falls down an elevator shaft, and that's it. It's a borderline beat-for-beat -beat retelling of the entire movie, and nothing changes. 
you get a goofy little congratulations screen saying how Randy has become the ping pong champion, but it's just an exaggeration because you just won the mode. Yippee! I can boil down my problems with Balls of Fury into two categories, presentation and consistency. How the game gives you the story is extremely, extremely, extremely weak, and the difficulty is bizarrely inconsistent. Let's start with breaking down how the game presents itself. This is a fancy way of calling it the visual section, but it's a little different compared to what I've done in the past. I'll start with the actual visuals, and despite everything so far, I actually do have something nice to say. Admittedly, there is some attention to detail that I can happily admit is nice to see in this game. The venues are definitely Wii quality, but are otherwise decent recreations of the various areas in the movie. Fang's little rec room what have you featuring the paddles and ashes of the players he's killed is my personal favorite. It's faithful to the movie location right down to the little section housing the panda that's definitely not dead. Master Wong's academy looks pretty good, and the high school gym where Randy faces the hammer is fairly well done. I noticed while playing the other modes that some characters have unique paddles specific to them, Fang being the most noticeable with his black and gold design, Randy's being more subtle with Death Leopard rules burned into the paddle, and Freddy's being a dual-sided black paddle with what looks like tape around the handle. It's small details that I absolutely appreciate seeing, but that said, let's talk about the character models. They're not... great, at least when talking about the pre-rendered ones we see before every match. Both young and adult Randy, funnily enough, look the best out of everyone, but consider the competition. Carl looks off, the hammer looks like someone was trying to remember what they look like, Wong looks fine, Maggie looks like she was AI generated, the dragon looks fine, we have Terry Crews at home, Yukito Nagasaki is a character in this game, and Fang looks like they had a hard time getting the rights to use Christopher Walken's likeness outside of movie stills. The menus are as simple as simple gets. They're functional, and I'm not even going to mention any music because it's generic and inoffensive. No notes for now. In regards to animation, I mean it's there. Every character kind of just waddles in place like they really have to pee. Background characters have minimal movement or don't move at all, sometimes cycling through the same basic animation. I understand this is a weird thing to nitpick because they're background characters. They're supposed to populate a scene and give some life to it. My nitpicks are more in how Balls of Fury does it. This works in the room where you play against the dragon. There's these two guys that appear to be having a conversation, but in an area like the high school, there's this guy in the background who is forever dusting his shirt and nodding in place. Strangely enough, the room where you fight the dragon also has an example of a bad background character. This guy off to the right of the table. He's unchanging the entire time, and it's made worse by the fact that he seems to be on the same section of middle ground that the opponent is, so it's not like he's entirely in the background. He's off to the side, but he's very much visible and in your peripheral vision. To further emphasize my point, here are several clips of gameplay in this room layered on top of each other just to show you how static he is. I even went the extra mile by going into Dolphin just to make sure this guy wasn't just some weirdly bent PNG. He's a full 3D model, and he doesn't do anything. For some reason, he's allowed to exist, and these guys playing poker off to the right got vaporized into cosmic dust. There are some animations that happen when you win a round coming from the opposing player, which, again, is a nice extra detail as each character has a different animation that can be seen, like slamming a table or genuinely looking disappointed. What I found extremely shameless, though, is that the game does in fact have a trailer. You can view it on the disc. You know? The trailer for the game to sell you the game that you already bought. <laughs> Made worse by the fact that these game models are actually animated somewhat and they don't look that bad. They could have done more with the game models, they just chose not to do that in the actual game. There's also a movie trailer which happily tells you along with the cover of the box that the movie is happily available on DVD and HD DVD. The movie format that is sure to give you bang for your buck in terms of watching high definition movies at home. Never mind, though speaking of images and video on a disc, let's talk about the cutscenes. Calling them cutscenes is me being nice, because these are not cutscenes. These are slideshows and explanations. I was only half joking when I called one of these a PowerPoint earlier. I made more engaging presentations in Office 2003 with every piece of clip art and sound effect ever. 
for God's sake. I mean, you already had access to footage from the movie to some capacity. Is it too much to ask that you at least have a short clip on the disc or even some kind of FMV or even a brief animation with the models that you already have shown as in the game's trailer? It's not like the whole game is eating up that much space. They could have easily fit trimmed clips or something. The ISO is barely over half a gig and Nintendo was using full-size DVD by this point. You have at least four more gigabytes to work with on the magic plastic frisbee. Why not make use of it? The whole damn movie can fit on one. Why do we get nothing but photographs on what is technically the same thing? I... I feel like I'm complaining about this the wrong way. My main problem with the cutscenes is that they're beat-for-beat -beat retellings of the movie for the most part. And yes, I am well aware of what I said earlier regarding a movie plot translating to a game plot, but that's not what I have a problem with in terms of this game. What I have a problem with is how Balls of Fury presents its story this way. I have problems with how Balls of Fury does things in general. I've played other movie games before, Chicken Little, Kung Fu Panda, Madagascar. I'm well aware that these are 3D action games based on animated movies, not the live action sports comedy that Balls of Fury is, but my point is that these games at least followed their source movies plot as much as reasonably possible in an engaging way. I finished each of these games and, at least as a kid, I remember having fun playing them and enjoying them for what they were. It actually felt like an attempt was made at adapting the movie to game form while giving you a decently enjoyable experience on top. What Balls of Fury does is present a hyper-condensed version of its plot through slideshows in order to move the game along and get you to the next ping pong match, giving you pretty much just the necessary information to tell you the story as quickly as possible while having to set up for the next match. This wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if it were not for two things. Number one, the storytelling is boring. I don't have a problem with games presenting the story this way. I've been playing games that are older than me for a very long time now. But if you're going to seemingly intentionally limit yourself to an extremely simplistic form of storytelling, there has to be something that makes it interesting. Dialogue between characters, maybe some basic animation, literally anything to keep my attention beyond having Dan.Fogler.JPEG on the screen with a blurb of text. I almost want to edit subway surfers onto the sides of every cutscene for the rest of this video just to put something interesting to watch. I can't believe I'm about to do this, but Balls of Fury is far from the first game to present its cutscenes this way. Look at Toy Story. I played Toy Story on the PC back in the day, but that game at least had the excuse of being made in the mid-90s and was limited by the hardware capabilities of the time. It's presented in a somewhat similar fashion, the only difference being that it's treated more like you're reading a story with the dialogue exchanges rather than just having the events of the story summarized in front of you. Once again, this was being done in the mid-90s. This is 2007, and while I understand that the Wii is basically just a GameCube in a trench coat and mustache, the only excuses for this that I can even think of are time and budget because the Wii is more than capable of doing more than this. I'd argue the very first level was the worst about it, because it presents itself like everything else you see going forward. Young Randy vs. Wolfstag. After a couple back and forths, you're smacked out of nowhere with a loading screen and give it a cutscene detailing the latter half of the movie's opening. It doesn't even treat itself like a tutorial, it's just like any other level. Zero build-up, zero warning, it just happens. One minute you're playing ping pong and the next minute you're staring at a group photo with a gang. If this is the part where Randy gets knocked out mid-match, at least show me in the game when he gets knocked out mid-match. I want to see what happens. I want to see the events lead up to this unfold in front of me. I want to see this kid eat shit over a fence. The entire way the game feeds the story to you is just bland and lifeless. Still images and blurbs of text detailing movie events all playing an amalgamation of every single rock track you can't quite remember the name of, but heard on the radio a few times. This wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the fact that various jokes from the movie are sprinkled in here too. Which brings me to my second issue. Let's ignore the quality of the movie for five minutes and focus on the fact that it is a comedy movie. Say what you want about Balls of Fury in terms of its writing, its direction, the quality of the jokes, the type of humor it has. Say what you want about anything regarding this movie, but let's focus on one key detail. Balls of Fury is a comedy. Balls of Fury is a comedy 
movie. By nature of it being a movie, there is a general expectation that you are going to see jokes, as well as hopefully get a laugh from the deliveries of the actors telling jokes. The scene after Randy beats the dragon and gets tossed into a dumpster by the cheering crowd genuinely got a laugh out of me. It's a half-decent joke. Having this joke described to me on a still image of a crying Chinese kid does not hit the same way. You can regurgitate jokes verbatim all you want in your game, but they mean nothing if there's no attempt at actually telling the joke. Sometimes I like to write down visual jokes in my script, and this is mainly to help me during editing when I'm trying to put something together in DaVinci. But I would never just put down the description of a joke and call it a day by showing text on a screen. Let me ask you this. What makes more sense in terms of a joke? Long monologuing about how a good ping pong player needs to be aware of their surroundings only to immediately fall down an elevator shaft mid-sentence like a f***ing Looney Tunes character? Or the game outright telling you Wong accidentally falls down an elevator shaft while giving Randy advice. He's okay, on top of a picture of what is the happiest group of people ever. This is the part where you show me Wong falling down the elevator shaft. This is not the part where I see George Lopez clapping. I'm not asking this game to go out of its way to make me laugh. I don't want the game to do that for me because that's not why I'm here. I'm here to play ping pong and the story is there to push the game along. What I am saying is the visual joke works better with an actual visual element. Don't tell me Randy is getting thrown into the dumpster. Show me Randy getting thrown into the dumpster. Don't tell me a mysterious Asian man that invites Randy to fang his tournament can't find his way back to the highway. Show me the mysterious Asian man coming back to ask for directions. Now, translating a visual joke to a written form can work, but you need more detail beyond what feels like an essay being half-assed to get a C grade. I need a reason to actually pay attention, sit down, and watch the damn cutscene. It is just as much a part of the game as the actual interactive portion itself. Make me want to keep playing this game and continue this story. Make me care enough to keep playing. How can I reasonably be expected to keep playing the story mode if I don't care? Oh, who the f*** am I kidding? It's Balls of Fury. My last issue is gonna have its own section, and that is- If there's one thing I noticed throughout the game during my entire time playing it, is that this game is not consistent at all when it comes to difficulty. Once again, I play it on hard, but the game seemed to do whatever it wanted most of the time. This was evident in not just the story mode, but the adjacent game modes like Arcade and Exhibition as well. In any other video, I would have covered them as well, but it's just more of the same. Exhibition is just a singular match against the AI or another player. Arcade is just a ladder mode with the same ping pong games you've already played. Tournament is tournament. I legitimately got more fun screwing around on the character select screen in arcade mode by doing this. Throw it out your ass. I already discussed my gripes with story mode, but let's come back to that and focus on Maggie Wong. There is absolutely zero reason for Maggie to have been as difficult as she was, barring my inability to play properly in some cases. Her primary special, and by extension Randy's, is straight up broken. Maggie shares the same fireball thing that Randy has, and uh, yeah, it doesn't feel so good when the shoe is on the other foot. I wouldn't be too annoyed by this if it were not for the fact that Maggie was seemingly able to reflect my fireballs 9 times out of 10 no matter what I did. Meanwhile, damn near every single attempt I made at reflecting Maggie's ended in failure. On the few occasions I did manage to do it, it required me to essentially be trying to predict when it would happen, leaving me with what felt like less than a second in order to react to hit the ball back. I use the phrase predict because pressing the A button causes flames to appear around your special meter signifying yeah I'm gonna do a special move next, but it doesn't do that when you're playing against the AI. There's zero indication of when the AI is gonna do a special move, it's basically on you to be on your toes and predict when a special move is going to happen. There's no warning or heads up, you have all the flashy graphics in the world for when you are gonna do a special move, but not when the opponent is. How is that fair? Does that seem fair to you? Because that doesn't seem fair to me. If this were me against a real person, I'd think it's extremely unfair because my opponent basically gets a giant neon sign that says I'm about to do something different. Meanwhile, I'm up shit creek before I even know what's going on. If this game 
showcased that Maggie was a mid-game boss, I wouldn't be complaining nearly as much because, okay, I get it. This is not meant to be an easy match. This is clearly some type of boss battle, but the game doesn't do that. Every single match is presented the exact same way every single time. And while I will happily say that this game did feel like it actually got more difficult with time, it simply doesn't know how hard it needs to be at what moments. What makes the primary villain of the game a significantly weaker opponent than someone you fight in the middle of the game? Why is she such a pain in the ass versus the guy who literally kills people? More importantly, why is something like this halfway through the game? If you're gonna put a fight like this, it would be better saved for something, say, oh, I don't know, closer to the end, especially because not only you would have the opportunity to change up the gameplay you've experienced up to this point, you'd also get to translate a major event in the movie from the main character's perspective. Let's pretend I'm one of the developers. I've already put Maggie in there somewhere at least once. If I had to put a significantly more difficult match against her somewhere else in this game, where would I put her? Easy. The fight before Feng. Why? Because around here is one of the movie's more involved scenes between Randy and Maggie, and in the real game is relegated to text on a screen. During this moment, Maggie is subbed in for what is supposed to be a match against Carl. Carl gets mad and is killed because he is annoying and nothing of value is lost. This results in Maggie and Randy essentially having the longest matches they can in order to not let the other one get killed. How would I treat this scene in a game context? Simple. Make it the one match in the game where your goal isn't to get points, but rather volley the ball back and forth as much as possible to run out a timer, or to volley the ball back and forth a specific amount of times before the game ends and moves on to the next level. The game already did an abrupt loading screen jump scare out of the gate, surely they can do another one here. Speaking of weird difficulty spikes and dips, I noticed something similar within the other game modes too, but the game fluctuating between actually really difficult to practically giving away the win to you. Once again, with any game mode like this, there is usually meant to be a general expectation of increasing difficulty, or at least a consistent difficulty throughout, and that's not present here. I originally planned to run through the arcade mode in its entirety, but to be honest, what's the point? It's more of the same, and I didn't even bother to going through the rest of it. Not like I could if I wanted to anyway, I got around 4 matches deep before the game decided to hit me upside the head with Randy, because big surprise, his fireball is just as annoying as Maggie's. I wanted to run through the entire thing from beginning to end, but I gave up after around 45 minutes. I did not want to play this game anymore. The match you're watching right now was the point I put the remote down, shut off my Wii U, and packed it back up. Balls of Fury went back on the shelf, and I've been playing Yakuza 0 to occupy my brain with literally anything else. Let's wrap this up. I'm just gonna say it. Don't bother with the game. Don't bother seeking it out. Don't bother emulating it. You're better off just watching the movie. If you want the best Balls of Fury experience possible, just watch the movie. You'll have a far more enjoyable experience watching it than you ever will by playing this game front to back because it's not even ironically enjoyable. Don't get me wrong, there's some silly things in the game that did get a laugh out of me, but in terms of actual enjoyment from playing it, I can safely say it was slim to none. I'm sorry for bringing up Men in Black 8 billion times, but at least with that game, I got some ironic enjoyment out of how crummy that game was in hindsight. It was a trash heap, but some of the things that made it bad made it fun, or at least enjoyable to talk about. Here, the things that make Balls of Fury bad make it bad. It's not fun talking about Balls of Fury as a video game, and that's probably the worst thing I can say about it. This game is not fun to talk about. I'm dead serious, by the way. Hop on the Prime Video or whatever, rent the movie for five bucks, watch it, and move on with your life. I'm not gonna tell you you're gonna like the movie or not. It's a mid-2000s comedy film. Lower your expectations, order a pizza, grab an adult beverage, sit down, watch grown men play with balls. If you wanna play ping pong, scrape together a Wii Remote Plus and get yourself a copy of Wii Sports Resort. The ping pong in that is not only infinitely more enjoyable, it actually feels like you're playing ping pong. Better yet, get the boys together and play some actual ping pong. Outside of sports stuff, if you want an honest-to-god enjoyable Wii experience, there are some good games outside of the first-party stuff if you know where to look. Rabbids Go Home is one that I see people sing praises for, which is funny considering it's the Rabbids if you know anything about their reputation. 
Personally, I loved that game. Genuinely one of my favorite Wii games of all time. Seriously, go play Rabbids Go Home. It is genuinely good. I've got nothing left to say. All I want to do is lay down and do something I know that I'm going to enjoy that's not this dumbass game. I'll see you guys later when I finish my playthrough of Serious Sam. I'll see you guys later when I finish my playthrough of Serious Sam. Well, that didn't pan out like I hoped. For a good while now, I've been taking the time to try and figure out how I even want to frame this video, because in my head, this is supposed to be a challenge run. Here's the thing, though. The last one of these I did was a New Vegas door randomizer, and that was pretty straightforward. It wasn't a challenge run. It was more or less a typical playthrough summary, but here, there was a limitation, there was a requirement. But what do you call a challenge run that doesn't have challenge? This is for Alligator. He is my son, and I love him. I wanted to do a solo run with this blue alligator crocodile thing in the sense that he's the only one allowed to do damage. Other Pokémon to use HMs are fine because, realistically speaking, I can't have a single Pokémon doing all of the work. Show me the starter Pokémon that can learn every single HM because I'd love to see which one it is and I'm too lazy to look for it myself. I didn't think it would be anything that crazy, and for all I knew, I might run into some genuine issues along the way. Uh, no. No, no, I didn't. As I get through this gobbledygook with Professor Oak, I just want to let you know that I mostly played this game in the afternoon after I got home from work and from doing things on the weekends, so if you wonder why a bunch of the in-game footage takes place at night, this is why. The game started off simple, just like anything else you would expect in a Pokemon game. You go through all your standard stuff with talking to mom, going around town, and meeting the Pokemon professor like any other child being sent off into the woods to die. Professor Elm offered me three Pokemon as his tradition, and I picked Totodile because he's the best option out of any of the Johto starters, and anyone who says otherwise is a Cyndaquil fan or lying to you. You didn't pick Chikorita. You settled for Chikorita. I took a quick peep at my Pokémon stats, however this turned out to be extremely pointless to do, and you'll see why in a bit. I got my PDA from Mom, and the Professor gave me his phone number before I started doing some training on my way to Cherry Grove City, while getting ready to go meet Mr. Pokémon. Some of you may have noticed that my character sprite doesn't quite look okay, and seems to have this weird set of expanded pixels on top while outside. Trust me when I say that this is a warning sign I did not pick up on until it was far too late to do anything about it. This old man gave me his used shoes and a map, and I traveled north to go into what I thought was the correct house, and then into what actually was the correct house. Mr. Pokemon gave me an egg, while Professor Oak gave me the Pokedex, and Elm thought it would be a good idea to call a random child instead of the police over a break-in at the lab. The red-haired kid who was peeking through the window back home bumped into me and thought he could beat me with his Chikorita. By this point, Totodile was double the level, and I still had a hard time beating it despite this. Dumbass dropped his ID, and some brain-dead cop accused me of breaking into the lab when I was two miles away. When asked what the name of the guy who actually did the deed was, I decided he didn't deserve a cool name and gave him something stupid. I gave Elm his egg, and then the emulation proceeded to die entirely. As you can tell, we're off to a great start. I tried to run the game again, and there was some strange glitching, but it was otherwise running okay. I grabbed my gator, fixed my settings, got my meds, saved my game, left my phone at home before my universe got erased for the second time.
Anyway, I goofed around with melon settings to get it to look pleasing. I had to work a little bit to try to get rid of this disgusting smoothing effect that everyone hates, but that will go away soon enough. In this universe, my total dial has a bashful nature with good endurance as its trait, currently having 20 HP, attack and defense at 12, special attack and speed at 10, and special defense at 9 when picked up fresh from the lab. I did the whole 9 yards all over again and got to the catch Pokemon tutorial that I've probably seen a hundred times by this point in my life. Totodile made it again to level 10, and I was making my trek to Violet City while mopping the floor with the trainers on my way there. I also did some off-camera research into what Pokemon I would need to train on later, seeing what is worth attacking and what isn't to train certain stats. Once in Violet City, I tried to go to the gym immediately, but I was told that I needed to go to Sprout Tower first, where everyone inside has a Bell Sprout and pretty much nothing else. As I climbed, I actually got concerned I'd have a problem because this is pretty much just a giant hallway of grass types, but since Totodile was double the average level of the Pokemon here, I wasn't entirely worried. You're gonna notice a theme throughout this video. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention I named the kid Burger because I couldn't think of anything funny. Once he sensed that I was breathing the same air as him, he used a rope to disappear from the tower. The last guy in the tower was no problem at all, and he proceeded to give me flesh. I was now tasked with trying to find a Pokemon that can use it so I don't waste any of Totodile's moves. This is why HM Slaves exist. I'm positive most of you watching this have played at least one Pokemon game, but on the off chance you haven't, HMs are moves that are used outside of battle and cannot be unlearned through normal methods like learning other moves as you level up. They're stuck to that Pokemon until you can find the guy who can forcibly make Pokemon unlearn moves. An HM Slave is a Pokemon whose sole purpose is to learn HM moves so Pokemon you actually want to use don't have wasted slots. This is not to say that all HMs are wasted moves though, as some moves like Surf are useful in double battles for instance. I captured a Bellsprout after a quick waterboarding session to teach it Flash and went to get the first gym badge. I had a suspicion that Falconer imported his Pidgey from Kanto because it immediately started spamming Sand Attack like the ones in my Nuzlocke from a few years back. Luckily I had an X accuracy in my back pocket to counter that nonsense. Pidgey did go down but his Pidgeotto however proved to be a serious issue since luck was not on my side in this fight. Crits nearly took out my Totodile, and the potions I was using were doing nothing but delay the inevitable since my attacks kept missing. Once I realized it was a losing effort when I got the HP to near death and it restored its health using Roost, Totodile fainted and I had to throw out Bellsprout. This will be the first of a couple of problems that were easily resolved. Totodile is down, and we can't just leave the battle. Now what? Simple. Totodile is the only one allowed to do damage, so two options. 1. Use attacks that don't do damage, and 2. Throw Pokeballs to skip turns. In a way, you could think of it like having a tantrum over losing, so you just chuck a Pokeball at high speed at the gym leader's head. I got sent packing to Nurse Joy, took a brief detour to school with the help of a Kalos native, and went back to the gym for round 2. This time, Totodile damn near killed the thing in one shot and made it to level 16 after knocking it out. Pidgeotto was throwing Gust around, so I spammed Rage for the damage boost with consecutive use. It also started spamming Rooster this time, so after a quick scary phase to slow it down, it went down in two bites. With this, I got my hands on the Zephyr badge and Elm called me to pick up some eggs. I found a free range potion in some cave, healed in Cherry Grove, and tried looking for Sentrits. It was nighttime and I had completely forgotten that Sentrit do not spawn at night, so this was a complete waste of time. Sudowoodo is a Pokemon that exists, the puzzle in the ruins of Alf broke my brain for a few moments, and the kimono lady told me I had a nice egg, while this guy gave me a funny looking seed. A fisherman showed me his rod, and another his balls, and I found out Faulkner sent a f***ing hitman after me. It was no problem. Inside Union Cave, I found some drugs on the floor, presumably from one of the trainers inside. The Pokémon here are good for training defense, so battling everyone isn't a total waste of time. As I made my way through the cave, Totodile evolved into Croconaw. I picked some Apricorns and found out that Team Rocket not only still exists, but they're also giving the people in Azalea Town a very hard time. I spoke to the Apricorn guy, fell down a well, and battled the Grunts inside. Every single one of them went down easy, same for the Rocket Leader, and it was beginning to dawn on me what the rest of this game was going to be like. The guy offered to make me some Pokeballs, so I gave him some of the apricorn I had laying around and never went back for them. Burger didn't like that at all, so he showed up to steal my wallet. His ghastly cursed Croconaw while his Bayleaf poisoned him. At that point, I was more than done for, so trying to heal was a wasted effort. I let him and Bellsprout go down, gave him money for the bus, and healed up before running into the bug-type gym. The trainers here put up a surprisingly decent fight, but otherwise were not that difficult to get past. Croconaw learned Ice Fang at level 21, which was a pretty good replacement for Bite in my honest opinion. And I'm not gonna lie, up to this point I totally forgot double battles were a thing, and I got blindsided running into my first one. 
Once again, Krokona is the only one allowed to attack. Using specific moves and throwing Pokeballs to skip turns is the name of the game. As long as my second Pokemon doesn't do anything to actually cause harm to the opponent, it's a fair thing to do. Pokeballs bought time while Krokona got to work on the other team. Once they were out of my way, I had to deal with Bugsy. He chose Violence and threw Scyther down out of the gate, only to immediately pull him back and throw a Metapod instead, which went down fast. Scyther came out again, which put up a small fight before I had to put Kakuna in its place. With Kakuna frozen and out of the way, it eventually had nowhere to run, and the Hive badge was in my hands. And now we begin my least favorite and most talky part of the video. Allow me to explain what I mean while Krokona commits mass murder. In Pokémon, there's several pieces of information that determine a Pokémon's stats. Effort values, individual values, nature, and characteristics. These mechanics have changed slightly over time, so just to be clear, we're speaking in terms of how they are in the fourth generation of games specifically. IVs and characteristics go hand in hand with each other. IVs are fixed numbers that are generated whenever a Pokémon is encountered at any point. These influence how a Pokémon's stats are calculated along with the other pieces of information I just mentioned. A characteristic gives you a vague idea of how good a Pokémon's IVs are. According to Bulbapedia, a random sentence is given depending on the highest value IV that a Pokémon has, but the sentence given doesn't determine the actual numeric value. It's intentionally vague. You could go out of your way to get a Pokémon that's known to be overpowered to high heaven, but their highest IV might not even be in the double digits. I mentioned earlier that Totodile had good endurance. This means the highest IV it has is in defense. This doesn't necessarily mean that I have a high value on it, as it could be anywhere from 3 to 28. Thankfully, I was fortunate enough to be able to find out that my Totodile has an IV of 18 in both defense and special attack. When factored in with its base stats, which Totodile and by extension the rest of its evolutionary line are naturally stacked at attack and defense, I would consider this a generally good thing. Not so much Special Attack, which has a base of 44, making it the second worst stat, but this just means it shouldn't lag behind as much as it normally would. Nature just tells you what positives or negatives a Pokémon will have in terms of their stats. Every stat, save for HP, has a nature that's going to affect it in some way. Most natures provide a 10% boost to one stat while causing a 10% decrease to another. I bring this up because Krokona was blessed with Bashful, which is one of said natures to do nothing at all. This is both good and bad because none of his stats are being held back by nature, but none of his stats are being helped by it either. To explain how I know the exact IV values of my Pokémon without that information being clear in the game, I used PK Hex, specifically the 2024-0505 build that was the latest available at the time I started the run. For all intents and purposes, this is a save editor with a focus on the Pokémon themselves. For my purposes, however, this is purely for keeping track of Krokona's effort values and knowing what his IVs are, so I can train him to the best of my ability. EVs are obtained whenever you defeat a Pokémon in battle up to a maximum of 250 per stat and up to 510 EVs across all stats. Different Pokémon give out different EVs, and every 4 EVs you get adds 1 point to a stat. EV training is attacking specific Pokémon to invest in the EVs that you want to boost stats in. This is why I mentioned hunting for Pokémon like Sentret and why the Pokémon in Union Cave were helpful. Sentret gives you 1 EV for attack, and Pokémon like Onix, Sandshrew, and Geodude give you 1 EV for defense. In a team of six Pokémon with everything properly EV trained, it's perfect if you want to steamroll people in online battles or the competitive scene. The problem is we don't have six Pokémon here. We have one, and he looks like this when faced directly. Since we only have one Pokémon to work with, it's very important to know what stats we want to invest into and to avoid optional battles as much as reasonably possible so we can EV train to the best of our ability. And now the part where I admit I f***ed up. I originally thought that I needed to progress the game somewhat since I didn't have enough badges and wasted some EVs during the game, but as it turns out this only applies to traded Pokémon, so... That's on me. I did not do enough research on how the badges work. By this point in the run, I wanted to invest primarily in defense and attack, and in case anyone heavily into comp Pokémon battling is shaking their heads so much they're registering magnitude 7 on the Richter scale, I formed my plan around Totodile's natural strengths. At the end of the day, in my personal opinion, the best way to play Pokémon is just to go with the flow. Understanding certain things can be very helpful in getting better at the game and improving your team, but I've always had the most fun playing these games using the Pokémon I personally liked, and playing with the team I wanted to use. I didn't pick Totodile for his stats, I picked Totodile because I love this stupid blue gator beast. 
He's my favorite starter of any Pokemon game, period. I didn't even know he was stacked like this until I started this video. I'm not gonna speak on how you should EV train because I'm not a competitive Pokemon player by any means. There's a non-zero chance I could get something wrong and I bet good money I messed up something here as well. Do your own research and get an opinion from someone who has actually done this enough to know what they're talking about. I'm just an idiot who likes to torture himself on the internet for YouTube clicks. Now that I've spent enough time talking about this nerd garbage, we ball. And by ball, I mean spend four and a half real hours of my life grinding away attack and defense until they're at the amounts I wanted them to be at, not counting the moment I fell asleep in the middle of recording. By the time I was finished and my EVs for Croconaw looked like this, I was at level 29 and attacking Pokemon for the purpose of leveling up, since now I can battle at will with no issues. At some point I ripped the burger to shreds and made it into Ilex Forest to help some idiot catch his birds. He gave me cut, and I taught it the Bellsprout. Croconaw led another kimono lady to her doom, and I beat up some dumb kid's army of small animals. The daycare is a place I could get to, the cops tried to arrest me, and Croconaw finally achieved his perfect form at level 30. While in Goldenrod, I got a reminder that Voltorb Flip is quite possibly the worst game ever conceived by man. I understand that slot machines can't be done for reasons relating to age ratings these days, but I'd happily take Gamble Core if it meant the slightly higher age rating for the games on the condition I never have to deal with Voltorb Flip again. The gym leader was out getting milk, so I answered a quiz to get a radio card for my Poke Gear. Once the gym leader came back, it was populated by normal type trainers. It was a bit confusing to navigate, mostly because I wasn't paying attention. Whitney only has a Clefairy and a Miltank, both of which were pushovers, and I beat her so badly she started crying. I told her to give me my stupid badge, got my mugshot, and by this point every battle was basically a minor inconvenience. We're only three badges in by the way. Feraligator was at level 31, and most Pokemon I'm running into are barely into the double digits. I might as well have the game on autoplay at this point. The National Park had no value to me, I went shopping, picked up garbage, briefly got lost, got the Squirtle watering can whatever, pseudo jump scare, failed miserably in trying to catch it for fun, got some potted plants that allowed me to neglect a bunch of berries, and at some point Togepi hatched and tried to evolve, but I told it to shut up. I was starting to think that I probably should have done this video with Totodial specifically. Team Rocket was harassing someone at the local theater, so I killed him and got me the one HM that Feraligator could actually make use of. Some loser at the gym threw me out, and some moron left their dogs inside of a burned out building. Burger was here too, by the way. The dogs ran away when I went to go pet them, and I started running the gauntlet through Ghost Heck. Every single trainer in the Ecritique gym has a small army of ghost Pokemon, like this is some kind of gym for ghost Pokemon. By the time I got to Morty, he also had his own collection of Pokemon from Ghastly's evolutionary line. He put up a decent fight, but the Fog Badge was mine in no time at all. I'm gonna do my best to power through the rest of the gyms, because I'm not gonna lie, this is why the thumbnail has the caption that it does. Gator Boy was at level 38, and he was starting to creep into the triple digit range in terms of his stats. I left the sick cow to die, Burger told me to get bent in a lighthouse, and I attacked every single swimmer I found in the water on the way to Cianwood. There's a fighting type gym here, the pharmacy sucks, and Isuin battled me over Suicune or something, so I sent his pretty boy ass to hell. The gym leader was under a waterfall, and if I didn't know any better, I would have guessed he was a water type gym. The gym leader's name is Chuck, and yeah, he definitely looks like one. His wife gave me fly, so I did the sensible thing and swam back to Olivine. I took the time to evolve Togepi into Togetic without battling, so I had a flying type ready to go and climbed up the lighthouse. As I went up, it occurred to me that the only way to get to the top floor should the door be locked where Ampharos is sitting is by jumping out of a window and falling at least one story. At the top, I was told to go back to Cien Wood for meds, flew there, picked up some Fent, flew back, healed Ampharos, and this lady had the absolute nerve to fight me in the middle of a Pokemon Center. Jasmine has Steel-type Pokémon. Magnemite, slightly annoying. Steelix, pathetic. I now have the Mineral Badge. Checked out the map, got bumped by a man who gave me strength, caught a Matchup just to use it. It broke out of an Ultra Ball, by the way, but a normal Pokéball caught it just fine. Since when was I playing Pokémon Go? Wandering through Mount Mortar let me attack every Pokémon that entered my path, and I eventually found Suicune again, realizing I could've just surfed past the mountain and avoided it entirely. Mahogany Town. The leader's not here. Definitely not suspicious market. Team Rocket took $10 from me. I mugged the locals to get my money back and had to deal with the Red Gariados, wasting a hilarious amount of time and balls trying to catch it. 
Side note, did anyone else have some stupid urban legend where you could increase the odds of catching Pokemon by holding certain buttons at certain times? For me, it was down on the D-pad and the A button. I still do that for good luck, even now. I didn't catch the Gyarados. Lance, in his infinite brilliance, decided to use Hyper Beam on a normal person in an enclosed space. Turns out Team Rocket had an entire base underneath the pharmacy. The Persian statues over here summon two rocket grunts whenever you walk in front of them. This gave me the time to really appreciate the Team Rocket battle theme, which is an actual banger by the way, and farm XP and money. One of the grunts I talked to said they planted explosives in the floor, proving that Team Rocket is willing to gruesomely murder a child with landmines if it means they can steal some kid's Pikachu. After meeting up with Lance Deeper inside, the door to take this place down is voice activated, so I have to get the password from someone. Got one from one guy, got one from another. And this dude's ditto thought he could be him. Spoiler alert, he will never be him. Burger wasted even more of my time, and Rocket Executive Petrol really got put on this earth with that haircut. After having For Alligator stop his chest in, turns out we need his voice to open the doors. It's a good thing we have this conveniently placed Murkrow nearby to mimic his voice perfectly. Rocket Lady Ariana and some schmuck showed up to stop my fun, but Lance came to my side. This part was tricky as I wasn't sure how to treat this particular battle, but I decided that since I'm not the one controlling Lance's Pokemon, there's nothing I can do about what it does to the other team. Once Ariana and Co. were out of the way, we got to work removing the electrodes to the building to kill the radio signal. He gave me Whirlpool as a reward for a job well done, I healed up, and ran for the gym. This one is Ice-type, and talking about it is a waste of breath. Spam crunch, and move on. The next day, I forgot what the hell I'm supposed to do, and found out once I listened to the radio. Team Rocket has taken up residence in Goldenrod, so this is clearly a sign that I need to go play some more Voltorb Flip for some reason. Once inside Radio Disney, I was out of uniform and had to go get one in the tunnel underneath town. With fresh drip in hand, I went inside only for Burger to expose me like the moron he is and shove me into a battle. I was actually kind of regretting naming him that by this point, and by the time I wiped his team, he said he was going to go bother Lance. Buena said that today's password was help, which genuinely made me laugh, and I had to make my way to the fifth floor to find the director. After fighting and climbing my way up there, turns out that Pretzel or whatever his name was was waiting for me the whole time. After taking the time to remind him I'm him, he told me the real director was locked in a basement. I also got a phone call that would not leave me alone. Huey, we are in the middle of a crisis, leave me alone. The puzzle room in the basement just has some ordinary burglars down here for some reason, and after putting in the right door combo and beating up the last of the grunts, the real director gave me his special key, and I took a shortcut back up to the mall. After stocking up on healing items and Pokeballs, I started thinking that Team Rocket would genuinely do better at being a criminal organization if they expanded their Pokemon variety beyond what they normally use. Proton was another idiot that got in my way and isn't worth discussing. Ariana showed up for the second time, unable to fathom the fact that she lost. The last guy up here, Archer, was actually the hardest battle by far. Most of his Pokemon were pushing 40. Ooh. With his mons out of the way, the director gave me a cool looking feather so I can get ho -Oh when the time comes. Sadly, I got ahead of myself and went to Ecritique like a moron thinking I could go there now. I wasted a lot of time climbing up the tower, only to be disappointed at the top. I have to go to Blackthorn. The last gym here is obviously dragon based, the floor puzzles were actually kinda neat, and the gym took no effort once again. Everything here was on par with the last guy working for Team Rocket. One poor bastard bragged about me only having a 1% chance of winning. That dude learned something that day. Claire was my last target. Her Gyarados and two Dragonairs were done quickly with Ice Fang. Her last Pokemon, Kingdra, scared the hell out of me when it used Hyper Beam. I thought it was good until it started to spam Smoke Screen, but it soon went down as well. Unfortunately, Claire is an anagram for the word bitch because she refused to give me the badge and told me to go in the caves behind the gym, presumably in an attempt to get me killed. I taught for Alligator Whirlpool for the time being because I wanted to get it over with. I got a free gift card from the old man of the cave, and the gym leader continued to be a sore loser before giving me the badge after they stopped crying. I now had the Elite Four to deal with. Except I didn't. Elm wanted me to pick up the Master Ball and told me there was something waiting for me in Ecritique. My memory was correct in that I now had to battle each of the Kimono Girls and their Eevees. You'd be shocked to know that I remember losing the first time I battled them so many years ago. These days it wasn't so bad, mostly because I have a Gator on steroids. If anything, Jolteon was the only one to give me any real trouble. With that out of the way, I bought 100 Pokeballs because I thought it would be funny, and it's not like I can't afford not to by now, and waddled my way back up the tower a second time. At the top, Ho-Oh finally decided to show itself to me right as the afternoon turned into night. 
I really did not want to waste the Master Ball, but there was no way I was leaving without Ho-Oh. Chucking every single Pokeball I had on hand was my plan here, because I wanted to save the ball for something really worthless like a Rattata or something and make the obvious joke about using it on something I truly wanted. Unfortunately, Pokemon that battle too long have a tendency to run out of PP. This applies to wild Pokemon too. When a Pokemon starts using Struggle, that's a bad sign. Not wanting to risk it, I used the Master Ball to catch Ho-Oh for the sake of saying I did. I threw myself back to Newbark and started my trek towards Victory Road. I picked up a Seeking for the sake of not wasting another HM on Feraligator, and used a Rare Candy to bring him up to level 62. Hey look, it's the Elite Four! I dropped off all my other Pokémon to ensure a fair fight and went inside. First guy up was Psychic-type Trainer Will. One crunch on each, and that was it. Koga, Kanto's old Poison Gym leader, had some new tricks. His team wasn't as manageable. I got flashbacks to Muck spamming Minimize since I used to do the exact same thing in Pokémon X. His Venomoth and Crobat weren't that bad. Bruno's fighting types gave me a hard time, but he wasn't that hard to take out. Karen and her dark types, oddly enough, were a bit of a curveball. Her Umbreon was the hardest to get rid of, and it was her first Pokémon. Luckily, the rest of her team went down in one shot. Yes, I know I'm treating the Elite Four like a footnote, but trust me, there's a reason. Lance was the only one left to deal with. His Gyarados caused me a lot of trouble by pushing towards needing to heal very frequently. His first Dragonite wasn't that much of a threat. Hyper Beam didn't nearly do as much damage as I expected it to, and his second Dragonite was pretty much the same. His Aerodactyl slapped me with Thunderfang, but I returned the favor with Surf. His third Dragonite was a non-issue. Please see my previous statement about Team Rocket in regards to Team Variety. His team closed off with a Charizard, one kick in the teeth with Hydro Cannon, and the battle was over. Professor Oak and some pink-haired lady were trying to waste my time. He led me into the Batcave, stole my credit card info, I got in the Hall of Fame, and the credits rolled. I've been... stagnant on video work, to say the least, and this video certainly did not help matters. In my head I was thinking, this is something I know I'm gonna have fun with. It's Pokemon. It's easier than Serious Sam. I don't care if it does well or not. I want to put something out that I know is not gonna make me tear my hair out. The thing is, it ended up being too simple. What do you call a challenge run that has no challenge? Is it still a challenge run? Like I said, I didn't feel right calling the Vegas door thing a challenge run because it was just a playthrough at heart. Every door just happened to be a dice roll on where you ended up. Here, there was a challenge, but the game turned out to feel like a normal playthrough. I went into this thinking, okay, I beat the base game, make the video, call it a night, and then I can get to playing Fallout London or whatever, and my memory clearly failed me regarding this game. Because I don't remember this game being non-stop steamrolls one after the other. Maybe it's my fault for not replaying the game for years. Maybe it's my EV training that ultimately made the game trivial. I had a Pokémon in the 50s just as other trainers were starting to get into the 30s. One of Lance's Dragonites in the Rocket HQ was level 40. So what do I do now? I want to leave this game feeling something resembling accomplishment, and running through the base game left me with nothing. Well, Kanto is still to the east, and... There was one fight I spent a good while trying to beat for a long time before finally managing to do so and never playing the game again. I think I need to throw him off Mount Silver a second time. After waking up in my hometown, Elm gave me a boat ticket so I could flee the country. I briefly encountered Raikou and flew to Olivine so Oak could update my Pokédex and I could board the boat. I immediately got caught in some bullcrap where I have to find some stupid kid running around the boat. I reacted accordingly by mugging every single person on the ship for cash. In the bottom level, there's supposed to be a shift change, but the guy who needs to take the shift is missing. I found him sleeping in one of the cabins, and he tried to kill me after I woke him up. Exploring the engine room led me to the kid bothering the captain, who wanted to play hide-and-seek. The kid, not the captain. He has better things to do. After making landfall in Vermilion City, I wasted no time running into the gym, only to forget that this is the annoying gym with the switches you have to find back to back. The Pokémon here are pushing a bit past 40, and despite using electric types, weren't that hard to deal with. Surge in particular was not anything to sneeze at, but he had a few issues. His Raichu went down with a single Hydro Cannon. His first electrode took a bit of time, but the second one was worse and he paralyzed me too. Electivire is a cool third evolution for Electabuzz. This has nothing to do with the battle at all, I just like Electivire. Though in my personal opinion, they should have given him a Magnezone instead of Magneton. 
Serge tried to hype himself up only to lose immediately, leaving me with the Thunder Badge. Fun fact I didn't know until this playthrough, if you try to start a double battle with less than two Pokémon that aren't fainted, the trainers will tell you to get more Pokémon and come back later. After burning off a revive so I can get some cash, I traveled north to Saffron for the gym up there. At this point I'm doing my best to get through the gyms because I, I genuinely did not want to play the game anymore. I wanted it to be over. Sabrina's Alakazam put up a good fight, but her other Pokémon aren't even worth mentioning in the slightest. After taking her soul, I pulled up to Cerulean City, went straight for the gym, but nobody was home. After battling everyone near the place formerly known as Nugget Bridge, I thought it was kind of funny how all the trainers are high level, but the wild Pokémon aren't. The Kanto Power Plant has since been renovated since the last time I was here, but it's missing a piece to function with the thief being back somewhere in the city. The man responsible was a rocket grunt who hid inside the gym. A local man told me he ran towards the cape, and I found him hiding between some happy couple. After absolutely thrashing his sad excuse for a team, he told me where the part was in exchange for telling him Team Rocket was done for. Returned to the peace, flew back to the city, ruined Misty's date, and got busy clearing out the gym. Misty herself I wouldn't call the biggest headache. Golduck went down in two crunches, Quagsire went down with two Ice Fangs, Lapras kept slowing me down with Sing, and rather than waste items, I ran out the clock taking the time to heal when needed. Starby was the most annoying out of all of them. Ice Beam spam drove me nuts as I kept getting frozen, but one single crunch was all I needed to take it down. With the Cascade Badge in my pocket, I used Repels and Rock Tunnel to keep myself sane, ran into this laughing lunatic on Route 10, landed in Lavender Town, and battled fishermen further south before I stared into the eyes of one for way too long. The beatings continued due west as I found some dumbass with a level 65 Magikarp. The leveling among trainers in this area was weirdly inconsistent, with a bunch of them varying wildly. Suicune was here, another ditto tried to impersonate me and got turned into an example, and I went to Fuchsia City's gym for the next badge. It's full of poison types, and Koga's daughter Janine is keeping that tradition intact. Her Pokémon provided no real challenge besides her Venomoth spamming Double Team. After taking her badge, I took stock on the badges before realizing I played through nearly the entire game without ever getting my hands on the bicycle. Once I fed my crippling addiction to Voltorb Flip, Her alligator was at level 80 by this point, and I was trying to figure out where I was supposed to go next. I'm being serious when I say I genuinely forgot where I was supposed to go to continue the game. I soon found myself back in Cerulean to get busy catching Suicune. After messing up the red Gyarados, I was not going to leave without at least one special Pokémon caught in a basic ball you could find at the dollar store. I spammed damn near every single Pokéball I had until the sun came up, and I somehow managed to successfully catch Suicune in a standard Pokéball against all odds. I always wanted to catch a Legendary in something that wasn't an Ultra or Great Ball. I briefly flew back to Johto to get the one HM I neglected to grab, flew to Lavender Town to get the Kanto Radio Module, paid my respects at the cemetery, went shopping, woke Snorlax up, failed to catch it for laughs, scrambled my way through the cave that may or may not be full of Diglett, ended up in Viridian City, and the gym leader is not here because why the f*** would they? Went south to Pallet Town, read the professor's private emails, and ended up at what's left of Cinnabar Island. Blue is here, but he won't even look at me unless I have the other Kanto badges, which means I have to find out where Blaine is hiding. The man, known for fire, has relocated to the Seafoam Islands, an area known for ice. I will not question his decisions, as he is the gym leader, not me. And I realized I was in for the fight of my life when Blaine revealed he finally bought a hat. Evidently, this ate into his gym budget because he only has three Pokémon. None of them are worth talking about, but I have the Volcano Badge now. The bugs of Viridian Forest exist, and I made Brock into gravel when I finally got to Pewter City, despite the fact that he had a Kabutops which caught me off guard. I left with the Boulder Badge in my hands and told Blue to get the f back to Viridian. My man really gutted a DDR cabinet in his gym and called it a puzzle. There's arrow tiles everywhere on this damn floor, and it's your job to find the right path. This gym has no coherence. You fight with what you have, and Blue didn't put up that much of one anyway. I seemingly blacked out again in the middle of fighting, but woke up early enough to finish the battle and shut the game off. I seem to be sleeping a lot during games lately. After Professor Oak told me to go climb a mountain and die, I flew to Indigo to heal before going back to Celadon. I had 500 stacks burning a hole the size of a basketball in my pocket, and I needed to stock up on anything and everything. Once at Mount Silver, I began to work my way up the mountain, taking special care not to waste too much time as Feraligatr was level 85, going on 86, using a cleanse tag to make traversing a tiny bit easier. Once inside the mountain proper, I got to work. Mount Silver is basically a series of elevations you have to find your right path through with tons of grass full of Pokémon to waste your time. Finding the right path early on is a matter of trial and error, but the same can be said for any multipath area in this game. 
Some of these paths are long and windy, so you can rip a few Pokemon apart for easy XP. When you start seeing snow, you're almost at the end. I found some loose candy in the grass, and soon found myself on top of the mountain. I made sure for Alligator was race ready by giving him a quick claw after saving the game, and approached Red, prepared to send him running back home. Only for the man to make me look like a chump. I realized I was f***ing with a capital F when the first thing he pulled out was a level 88 Pikachu, an electric type that is two levels higher than for Alligator, on top of it hailing, allowed one single Volt Tackle to send my boy straight to God, same day delivery. Stalling for time was the only thing I could really do while trying to heal for Alligator. Since Pikachu was much faster and the Quick Claw refused to kick in, he went down in one hit on most occasions. After finally landing a Hydro Cannon, his next Pokémon was Venusaur. Of course it was a grass type that was next, and of course the one sludge bomb it used landed a crit. There was no way I was reviving my cannon fodder to do this, so I tried to get as far as possible with one Pokemon being able to do anything. Landing two Ice Fangs was enough to finish the job and make him bring out Blastoise. Focus Blast did a scary amount of damage, but it wasn't enough. I wasted no time using a Hyper Potion and used Crunch whenever possible. The Hail thankfully was able to take it out. The final Pokemon he threw out at me was Snorlax. Hydro Cannon didn't do much to start, and it started throwing Shadow Ball at me, lowering special defense in the process. After Fur Alligator went down one more time, I realized I had run out of revives. The battle was over on a technicality. I let him whittle down what was left of my team into nothing, gave him my lunch money, and left to the Pokemon Center at the foot of the mountain. In my current state, if I want any hope of beating Red, I need to train for Alligator as much as reasonably possible. After dropping 30 grand on revives and putting my HM slaves away for safekeeping, I walked through the doors of the Elite Four. Again, and again, and again, and again, for nearly two hours. Constantly battling them and getting for Alligator's level up as much as I felt was necessary. Winning or losing did not matter, so long as for Alligator got the much needed experience. By the time I decided enough was enough, for Alligator was at level 95. For anyone wondering why I didn't go to level 100, this is because I was doing it for two hours straight and I was starting to get bored. I wasted only a little bit of time going through the mountain and approached Red for the second time. Quick Claw's RNG powers were on my side this time as Crunch nearly destroyed his Pikachu, but left me with paralysis. One Thunderbolt was all that was needed to do me in. Even while seven levels above my opponent, electricity can still destroy water types with ease. After sacrificing my first meat shield, his Venusaur did not handle Ice Fang very well, but it returned to the favor with Giga Drain. Meat Shield 2 took a Sludge Bomb while the second Ice Fang did him in. I threw down a Hyper Potion for the sake of safety while his Blastoise missed their attack. The two were pretty damn close in terms of overall strength as this was the hardest Pokemon to deal with, even while they were continuously spamming Focus Blast. I gave for Alligator a pick-me-up to boost its attack and gave it the edge it needed to get rid of his Blastoise for good. In a twist, he sent out Lapras. One blizzard was enough to freeze us, but it was nothing a full restore couldn't handle. It then landed on a crit to knock him out once more. Lapras, being an ice type, is also unaffected by the hail, so I can't even hope for the minimal damage it causes. I took the time to top off for Alligator's health while sending Oddish to meet his maker. My crunch was countered with Psychic multiple times only for Lapras to finally go down. Snorlax was the sign of the home stretch. Shadow Ball somehow wasn't an issue this time. I threw an Ice Fang and they landed a crit with one of their moves because this game hates me. My Hail Mary Hydro Cannon didn't work as expected, and Giga Impact left them at a light breeze away from failure. This fat bastard gave me a hard time, but despite everything it threw at me, Snorlax finally fell and his last Pokemon was a simple Charizard. I healed for Alligator to full health and sent him out for the final time. Even though this Charizard made him flinch with Air Slash, one Hydro Cannon was all that was needed to finish the fight. Red had absolutely no words for me. He vanished from this world as the game saved and the credits rolled for the final time, and I beat Pokemon Heart Gold, attacking with only the starter Pokemon.